Good evening. The uh, March 25th meeting of the Evans City Council will come to order. Would the clerk please take the roll? Council Member, oh. Council Member Kelly. She's here. Council Member Harris. Present. Council Member Wynn. She will not be here tonight. Council Member Newsma. Here. Council Member Burns confirmed that he will be here around 615. Council Member Sufferden. Here. Council Member Ravel. Here. Council Member Reed. Present. And Council Member Heracaris is uh, participate, uh, participating remotely for a family emergency. Are you here? Yes. Thank you. And Mayor Biss. Uh, here. Uh, we have a quorum present and are ready now to do our work for the evening. The first item on the agenda is my public announcements and proclamations, of which there are none. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the city manager's public announcements. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Clerk Mendoza. I wanted to provide an update on the Wesley apartment buildings issue. As a reminder, at a meeting on February 2nd with Evanston Housing Coalition, HODC, city staff, and Councilmember Burns to discuss the rapidly worsening conditions of the stairs and platforms, it was agreed that the safety of the residents could not be ensured and that they needed to be relocated. After that determination, we immediately prepared to meet in person with the residents to inform them of the grave safety concerns and how the city would provide assistance. That meeting occurred on February 13th at Fleetwood Jordan Community Center. Our staff members included the, our outreach team, human services specialists, victim advocates, as well as external partners. That same group of staff and partners also met with the Wesley residents last Wednesday night at Fleetwood Jordan Community Center for about three hours, and Mayor Biss joined as well. The following services and support have been offered to the residents. Housing search assistance to help tenants assist to assess their housing options and locate an appropriate apartment dwelling unit to rent. Rent assistance for the application fee, security deposit, and a 12-month rent subsidy to lease an apartment. Monthly rent assistance will be based on the difference between the tenant's current rent at their Wesley apartment and the monthly rent for a new apartment, and the tenant's current financial circumstances will be taken into account. Rent assistance will be paid directly to the housing provider through a rent assistance agreement with the city and its subrecipient. Rents will be based on the small area fall fair market rents for the zip code in which the unit is located. Rent assistance may be extended based on tenants' needs to maintain their housing. Short-term lodging, temporary housing, and extended stay hotel for safety and well-being of tenants until they sign a lease and move into an apartment. The length of stay will vary based on each tenant's circumstances and may extend to several months based on need. A food stipend will be provided. The city's payment for temporary housing and extended stay hotel is contingent on a hotel accommodation agreement and waiver between the city and the tenant. Financial assistance to cover food and other expenses for family members and friends who provide temporary housing to Wesley apartment tenants until they sign a lease and move into a new apartment. Packing and moving services for furniture and other household possessions. Storage unit rental for furniture and other possessions for tenants residing in an extended stay hotel or temporarily with friends and family until they sign a lease and move into an apartment. Director Flax provided an update at the Housing and Community Development Committee, HCDC meeting last Tuesday. I provided a written update to the Equity Empowerment Commission that met last Thursday. We plan to meet again with the Wesley residents in the coming week and continue to work with individuals on their specific needs. About a month ago, we created a public webpage, cityofevanston.org slash Wesley to provide information and frequently asked questions. The city remains committed to supporting our residents now and in the long term. Directors Flax, Ogbo, and Thompson are here to assist anyone who may have questions or need assistance. Thank you. Councilmember Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is tough. Um, I, I, I want to say, one, I think that... <clears throat> Our city staff and Councilmember Burns and Mayor Biss and everyone who's involved in this, I think, almost deserves an award for that package in some way. I think that is extremely gracious, I'll say, um, particularly given that my understanding is that the city has um, was on schedule with our inspections. And the city has done our job. And, and I will say I have some concern that in an ideal world, 
this is well, the city would do this in every situation. We'd have the resources to do this. We'd have housing that the city owns that we could place people into. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I think this is a lot, maybe too much, um, particularly covering food. Um, I It doesn't seem like that was an issue. It may have been an issue before, but it doesn't seem like that's directly connected to this issue. And, you know, the moving and storage and I, I've had situations with tenants with residents in my ward that are similar to this and um, you know we didn't come anywhere near this and I'm just concerned that this sets a precedent that we may not be able to back up in the future um, and then layering on top of that folks are saying that we're not doing enough still and you know that I, I don't know so I'm, I'm I, I think we'd I think we need to continue to have conversations. I, I don't. I don't want to walk back anything that you know, Councilmember Burns or Mayor Biss or Manager Stowe or anyone else uh, you know agreed to with this group. But I do think we need to figure out a longer term plan um, for for this and, and make sure that we're not setting the wrong precedent. Um, particularly when the city, seemingly from what I've heard from staff and observed uh, has done everything we are supposed to do. And it's really on the, the housing provider who failed at their end of the bargain uh, to maintain the property, um, which is also a remind us we have a landlord licensing, a housing provider licensing referral that has been made that I think will be critical uh, for us moving forward to ensure that we are placing the burden where it should be, which is on irresponsible. And I don't want to, it's on uh, folks who have not been responsible housing provider. So thank you. The next item on the agenda is communications from the city clerk. Um, we have several um, email public comments, so bear with me. Um, one is from Michael um, Wunderlich saying, um, demanding a ceasefire. Um, another from James Gibbs, also about a ceasefire, um, a Gaza ceasefire resolution. Um, Catherine Bunton, um, also expressing the same, asking for a, a permanent ceasefire. Um, another comment from um, Malika Gardner, um, writing to express her concerns for the displaced residents at the Wesley properties. And um, I have forwarded her email asking the city to answer five questions that she has. Um, another from Scott Ogawa, but I believe he is here to speak in person. Um, another from William, William Carter about the meeting um, at Fleetwood Jordan regarding the Wesley apartments and expressing his appreciation and willingness of the city um, to meet with them on March 4th. Um, another email from Mayra Moreno um, expressing her concerns regarding being able to access um, ass um, assistance for undocumented um, Hispanic residents of Evanston. Another from Oliver Ruff. Um, asking for um, a ceasefire as well. And Kathy Rospenda, um, who is also um, writing about um, a ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza war. And another from Uh, Galen Ward Gard Gard Gardened, I know I butchered that last name, I apologize. Um, also writing um, for a ceasefire resolution uh, for the conflict in Gaza. Um, and all of those complete public comments are in your inboxes. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is public comment. This evening we have just over 30 individuals seeking to give comment and so everyone will be given, um, 
Right. Sorry, everyone will be given a minute and a half uh, to fit the 30 speakers into the 45 minutes. We'll begin, as always, with those who signed up on this physical sheet of paper, um, and then move on to those who signed up online. The first speaker is Kimberly Holmes Ross, who will be followed by Ndona Mubayai, and then Scott Ogawa. Good evening. I am Kimberly Holmes Ross from Evanston Cradle to Career, and I'm here tonight because we are in full support of the Guaranteed Income Program as it aligns strategically with our collective impact actions. Um, I'm here tonight online <laughs> and in person with our early childhood community partners, our advocates for action, as well as our advocates para la acción. So Stephanie will need some translation. All right, thank you. We are all in full support. The next speaker is Ndona Mubayai, who will be followed by Scott Ogawa and then Eric Passett. Good evening, I'm Indona Mubuyai, and I'm here as an advocate of Cradle to Career in support of the Guaranteed Income Program. And I would like to say that, uh, that with the increasing cost of food and housing, $500 will make a major difference in the lives of so many Evanstonians with children ages zero to five who are struggling to make ends meet. Dad has shown that the initial pilot program that the initial pilot program was successful. And I request that the city of Evanston seek to find a similar permanent solution for Evanston residents in the most vulnerable demographics going forward. Thank you. Uh, so we're, we've, we've sort of tightened things up. So we're gonna go rigidly with order, but you'll, you'll be third actually. So the next speaker is Scott Ogawa, who will be followed by Eric Passett, and then Rocio Mancera. Hi, I'm Scott Ogawa. I moved to Evanston in 2008, and I'm here to talk about fire trucks. And before you spend $2.3 million on a new ladder, I want you to, um, well, first I want to say I'm very great, um, great, uh, great gratitude towards the firefighters. I have a good friend whose son, whose life was saved by a fireman hauling him out of his apartment. And I know my family, you'd be willing to sacrifice everything for my family, and that means everything. But I still think there's too many trucks in Evanston to summarize, the costs are tremendous. If it costs 20 to 30 times more than a car, it's gonna cost 20 to 30 times more to drive. And my sense is it's driven about five times a day, is what the packet says. Um, it gets about three miles per gallon, which is about like 10 SUVs. I know Evanston's concerned about the environment. This is not good for the environment. They're the biggest gas guzzlers uh, in Evanston. The road maintenance, the axle weight on those trucks is beyond the legal limit for commercial vehicles, they've been in violation. And as I understand it, weight per axle is, goes like exponentially in terms of the damage. So there's every reason to think they're causing far and away the most damage to our roads. Um, and also while fire trucks are generally safe, there are only about 10 deaths per year in the US because of fire trucks. When they do get in accidents, those accidents are far more likely to be fatal relative to smaller cars. Um, so in brief, if, like any big vehicle, fire trucks are costly, they're dangerous, um, and Evanston pays this cost twice, both for the trucks and the damage. And I'm here because I'm hopeful because you did it with police. I think you can be reimagine the situation with, uh, with fire thank, trucks. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Eric Passett, who will be followed by Rocio Mancera, and then Carol Teske. Hi, I'm Eric Passett, and I'm a citizen of the Fourth Ward and owner of North Shore Apartments and Condos. I once... I, First, I want to say I'm, thank you for having um, law enforcement here. I was, was one of the first things I was going to bring up was my concern about last time I was here at the city council meeting. There were some pretty scary comments, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just glad you did that. I'm really thankful for that, that you guys have done that. Um, but that's not why I'm here. Um, you know, there's two, two subjects that are being brought up here for for um, funding, HS1, which talks about um, another 1.75 million for, you know, for the encampment. And then there's something that's not brought up tonight, but it's also being brought up is another million dollars to the um, connections for the homeless for the Margarita Inn, which they said last year they would never come back to the city for more money. They had enough funding. So my, my real issue with this whole funding this whole issue is, is where is the money for downtown Evanston? Where is the money for small businesses? I can't tell you how many, I've been to how many city council meetings? 
what, 100 in the last year, probably, something like that? And I haven't seen many at all talk about what are we going to do for small businesses? What are we going to do to revive downtown Evanston? I can tell you in other places there are a lot more revived than they are here. And I really wish we would concentrate on that as much as we concentrate on everything else. So thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Rocio Mancera, who will be followed by Carol Teske and then Dekel Fonda. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Rocío Mancera. Bueno, yo voy a comenzar que estoy aquí para abogar por el crédito garantizado que ha beneficiado a muchísimas familias. Es un gran programa piloto. Voy a dar tiempo para que traduzca a Stephanie. Hi, my name is Rocío Mancera. I am here to speak about guaranteed income. It's been a great pilot. Muchas personas se han beneficiado pagando eh, colegiaturas universitarias, eh, programas después académicos, deportes. A lot of people have benefited by helping pay for their college tuition, sports, um, deportes, colegio, ¿qué más? Eh, eh, carrera, pagos de la universidad. Um, and university payments. Es un gran, así que por favor reconsidérenlo y es, es un gran piloto. También tengo otra eh, que decirles que eh, eh, de, para, para las gentes que tienen escaping, um, it's a great um, pilot, and I want you to please reconsider it. And I also have a comment about landscapers. Siento que no han sido justos. Este, por favor, reconsideren las cosas, ya que Evanston requiere de mucho. Tiene muchas casas muy grandes y es un trabajo muy arduo y duro. Um, I want you to. I believe you have not been just towards the landscapers um, here in Evanston. Um, the houses are very large, and it's very strenuous work. Eh, también me concierne mucho, Evanston tiene una ayuda que es para gentes de que son de bajos, bajos ingresos, pero hay una limitación con esa persona que está a cargo de ese, de ese puesto. Um, I am also very concerned about a program that you have to provide assistance. Um, there is a person in charge of uh, giving assistance um, to in that program that's not um, just. Eh, no es transparente y no te ayuda. She is not transparent and she doesn't help you. Desafortunadamente es como tener la ayuda y decirte aquí está, pero no es para ti. It's unfortunately like saying the help is here, um, but it's not for you. Es como si ustedes la pidieran y les preguntan si se acuerdan de una de una canción específica cuando tenían seis años. Es un requerimiento para darte la ayuda. It's like if you were to apply yourselves for this assistance and they told you to remember a song that you knew when you were six and in order to provide for um, be able to qualify for that assistance. Entonces creo que deben de reconsiderar y ver su personal que tienen aquí adentro de, de la ciudad, si realmente quieren ayudar o solamente están está allí para que para que esté todo el tiempo, pero no te ayudan. Um, so you should reconsider the personnel or staff that you have in your city um, to see if these people are this person is there to really help you or they're just there to be there. Volviendo a los jardineros rápidamente, yo pienso, si usan la cortadora de pasto que tiene gasolina y no quieres usar una sopladora que tiene gasolina, yo creo que el medio ambiente no estará feliz. Um, and, and she's saying, for talking about going back to landscapers, if you're using the lawnmower and you're using the leaf blower, um, in the same essence, they both require gas and the environment would not be happy anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Clerk Mendoza, as well. Uh, the next speaker is Carol Teske, who will be followed by Dekel Fonda, and then Adriana Gomez. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. I've never made a public comment at a city council meeting before, but I feel moved to do so tonight because of the discussion you all are going to have regarding agenda item SP2, approval of the city's um, second round of guaranteed income program. I'm executive director of the Child Care Network of Evanston. Um, it's, we are an organization that has been supporting families with children under age five for 53 years in our community, especially those who have been excluded from opportunities in the past. For the last seven years, Child Care Network of Evanston has partnered with the McGaw YMCA to bring Head Start education and wraparound services and supports to families in our community. These classrooms are located in the Family Focus Building in the Fifth Ward. As you know, there has been a wave of guaranteed income pilots across the country in the last several years, and these pilots 
have shown that unconditional cash has a range of important benefits, including improved physical and mental health, income security, and stability. But why the focus on families with children under age five? Most importantly, there is a strong body of evidence showing that investing in early childhood has the greatest impact on both long-term and short-term well-being throughout a child's life. A guaranteed monthly payment that a family can count on will help relieve some of the stress that these young families face every day. Financial stress is higher for families with young children because of the inherent needs of them. A growing child needs a new set of clothing every few months, formula costs between $1,200 and $2,000 a year, and the average cost of diapers during the first year of life can reach $2,500. And that doesn't count the cost of diapering um, thank, supplies. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Dekal Fonda, who will be followed by Adriana Gomez and then Rebecca Mendoza. I will read my statement in the interest of time. Last Thursday night in a CBS News special, lifelong Evanstonian and civil rights activist Bennett Johnson stood on principle to decline the honor of having a street named after him because the city honoring him has not yet even considered introducing a resolution for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. In that same program, Mayor Biss was quoted as saying, quote, council members prefer to avoid weighing in on issues outside the city's purview unless it unifies the community. With due respect to this council's history, I beg to differ. Weighing in on national and global issues is not at all unprecedented in Evanston City Council. Over the last two and a half decades, the City Council has done the following. Endorsed HR 40, the National Reparations Proposal, approved resolutions on the Kyoto Principles, protocols, local enforcement of federal immigration policy, nuclear weapons bans, and we became a sanctuary city. In 2003, Council passed a resolution calling for the, the repeal of the U.S. Patriot Act, in 2004, Council passed a resolution calling for the U.S. to withdraw troops from Iraq. In 2008, Council passed a resolution calling for the U.S. government to not invade Iran. I wish that Alderman Wynn was here because she and I were here during all of those, and I wanted to thank her for her vote in favor of all of those. So it is beyond my comprehension that at this point, and this is not to diminish the horror of October 7th, but now, five months into this humanitarian disaster where genocide is being live streamed, that there are not two or three of you on council willing to introduce a ceasefire resolution for debate, discussion, and ideally passage in our community. A hundred other progressive communities have already passed such resolutions. Evanston needs to do so. Thank you very Thank much. You. The next speaker is Adriana Gomez, who will be followed by Rebecca Mendoza. Adriana Gomez, Fifth Ward. This month has been hard on my father since you denied us the time to work with the equipment we have. He has considered selling the house, the trucks, and moving out of Evanston. Ensuring the business to be able to register with the city took additional time and money. The barriers that come before even being able to apply for any grant are unjust. I don't think the white majority of Evanston understands the severity that this has on us. I know some of my dad's colleagues were against the grants, but after the no to our ask, this problem only grew. I'm trying to help my dad work with the system so we don't lose the, how, the place I've called home for over 20 years. The least the city can do is approve more money to help us transition. My dad's personal quote for electric equipment for his company is more than $25,000. I have yet to hear anything about how we are going to ensure the proper disposal of batteries and future battery repairment costs and charging stations. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Rebecca Mendoza. Hello, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I wanna first of all start by um, acknowledging the land that we're all on and um, just express gratitude for Evanston and the amazing place that it is um, to live. I've been watching um, you know, several, uh, several meetings and I'm concerned about our community engagement. Um, it's costing us money uh, to constantly be reacting to situations in our city. 
Um, two examples of that most recently is this landscaper issue and then the, the situation on Wesley. I want to speak on the landscaper issue because I think we're smarter than this. I think that we are able to do impact studies on what the primarily uh, the primary businesses that would be impacted by this ordinance. Um, and we didn't do that. And so there, this is not the only example of the exclusion of the Latino Spanish speaking community. We have an or, over 40 page health equity study that only has a paragraph on the Latino community that has been here since 1950. So usually when things are hard to do, you don't just give up, you try a little bit harder. Um, I also think it's a little disingenuous that we keep on talking about this $25,000 grant that didn't come as a result of this ordinance. It just so happened to be present and it's for all of the businesses, not just the businesses that are impacted. And so um, I also question the real impact to the environment. A lot of these decisions are impacting marginalized communities, um, specifically our Latino community in this, um, in this situation. And so I just encourage you to make better use of our money, to work better with our community, and to really, you know, the landscaper, the, the leaf blower started as a noise ordinance. Um, we look really Thank silly um, to the community and to other people that are watching. And so we have to do better. Um, por favor, gracias. Thank you very much. That concludes the public comment from those who signed up on that yellow sheet of paper. We now move to those who signed up online to speak in person, beginning with Heather Sweeney, who will be followed by George Rounds, and then Jesse Rojo. Hi, I'm Heather Sweeney, resident of the Fourth Ward. I am also a descendant of Holocaust survivors, and I have relatives in Israel. And I'm also deeply concerned about Palestinian and Israeli death, and I ask that you pass a ceasefire resolution. The phrase silence is consent means to me that no response is a way of approving an action. I don't believe that this council approves of the killing and the imminent famine in, of the people in Gaza. So I hope you're ready to call for a ceasefire and register your horror at what the US is allowing. In school, we teach our children to not be bystanders and be upstanders. This is a time to be an upstander and break our silence as a community that we do not consent. I ask that you be guided, guided not by your fear, but by your values and call for a ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is George Rounds, who will be followed by Jesse Rojo and then Renee. Uh, if George Rounds is not present, uh, we'll move on then to Jesse Rojo, followed by Renee and then Paul Ferrand. Oh, it looks like Jesse is online. Uh, well, let's, given that he's been called on, let's go ahead, uh, Jesse. There we go, thank y'all. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, howdy, everybody. My name is Jesse Rojo. I uh, don't have my camera on. Not sure if I can have my camera on. I'll try again, though. Doesn't seem to work. Regardless, though, thank you all for having me. I'm the director of the Evanston Early Childhood Council, and I'm here to, uh, to speak in support of the Guaranteed Income Pilot Program. As the Evanston Early Childhood Council, we work to improve early childhood resources, programs, and overall uh, situations for families in Evanston. And I understand, though, that the way we can uh, best address early childhood problems is by addressing poverty itself. Poverty, in many ways, is the first barrier children are facing. And I want to clarify that it isn't simply living in poverty, but living a life defined by poverty. When you grow up or you're growing up with a lack of opportunities and a lack of hope, you're growing up not thinking you can become anything. And so you don't even try. And that is simply terrible. That's potential being crushed and so much being robbed from our communities. And so, again, as the Evanston Early Childhood Council, we are fully in support of the Guaranteed Income Program and continue it, hopefully expanding it and making sure that we can fight poverty in an effective way, which this program does. By putting money in the hands of those who most need it, we're not only helping them, but we're providing economic freedom that allows them to use that money. 
And that in turn helps small businesses and helps businesses throughout Evanston. So this program will not just Thank help you very much. get for it, but it will help our entire community. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Uh, returning to those who signed up online to speak in person, uh, we move forward with Renee, who will be followed by Paul Ferrand, and then Newland Smith. I'm here to express how colossally those in positions of power have been letting the people down. I read that my ward's city council member said that he personally wants a ceasefire, yet he continues to parrot Mayor Biss's talking points about why this city council keeps refusing to take up a ceasefire resolution. Note that the city council historically has seen fit to pass resolutions against killing when the people being killed weren't Palestinian. But when people being killed are Palestinian, you make clear that you don't believe Palestinians deserve to be advocated for. I've also been witnessing the way that those in power have disrespected the residents of 2014, 2018, and 2024 Wesley. Whenever those tenants have risen up to speak about their experience, city officials disregard them. At the same time, that you've refused to fix the stairs at the last truly affordable apartment buildings where folks with lesser incomes have paid their rents and built a community together, you unapologetically violated the Open Meetings Act so you can make a sweet backroom deal with your real estate broker. Despite community opposition, you voted to approve a lease agreement for city offices that benefits your real estate broker over the people you're elected to serve and we'll give your new landlord $8 million of our tax dollars if you don't use the whole unnecessarily long 15-year lease that you agreed to. And you're telling the tenants of the Wesley buildings to vacate their homes, and in exchange, you'll give them one year of subsidizing their rent wherever they can find a new apartment, even while acknowledging there are no other buildings in Evanston that charge the rents that those folks can afford. So Thank use you our very much. You've lost your way. All power to the people. Ceasefire now. Free Palestine. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Paul Ferrand, who will be followed by Newland Smith, and then Jason Foster. Um, I'm Paul Ferrand, part of the 8th Ward. Um, I'm in support. This is Naomi. And we are both in support of the Guaranteed Income Program and also for uh, the ceasefire resolution, uh, which seems like it's something that just is consistently being ignored. Um, as if it's not a huge deal, as if a genocide isn't occurring. Um, so I, I feel specifically people that are calling for a ceasefire that I know you want a ceasefire too, I know, um, are being ignored. And it's something that um, the, just keeps on getting um, passed over and over. So, and part of being an Evanston resident um, it makes me really sad and disappointed that this is something that the city council will not support. Um, also, there are over 100 U.S. municipalities who have passed ceasefire resolutions. Um, none of them had a complete census, um, but what they did have was moral leadership, which is something that I ask you all would have as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Newland Smith, who will be followed by Jason Foster and then Andrew Ginsberg. <clears throat> My name is Newland Smith. Uh, I've been a resident since February 1969. Mr. Mayor and members of the Emerson City Council, I rise as one of the close to 1,300 Emerson residents who have signed the resolution affirming Emerson's support for a ceasefire. Even though the UN Security Council early this morning called for a lasting ceasefire, our country abstained. The situation in Gaza is horrific. Over 70,000 Gazans injured, over 30,000 killed. Healthcare system is in tatters. Mass starvation is imminent. To read one resolve from the resolution, be it further resolved that the city of Everson calls for an immediate ceasefire and for the United States to ensure the unimpeded entry of much needed humanitarian aid into Gaza. The situation in Gaza calls for urgent action. Please bring this resolution forward for debate and vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Jason Foster, 
who will be followed by Andrew Ginsberg, and then Maha. I'm here today as an Evanston educator, parent, resident, and member of the Evanston Ceasefire to ask the city council to put a discussion uh, on a ceasefire resolution. Um, you can start with the uh, original draft, uh, expand on that, and, uh, and uh, move forward. Um, more than 100 other cities and towns have passed a similar ceasefire resolution, uh, listening to their constituents by doing so. As a father, I cannot fathom any more of my taxpayer dollars going to kill any more innocent babies and children, mothers or fathers, or entire family lineages. lineages. Please, please do what's right and listen to the people who have elected you. Thank you. Free Palestine. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Andrew Ginsburg, who will be followed by Maha. Hi, my name is Andrew Ginsburg. I'm a resident of the Ninth Ward. I'm reading a statement on behalf of Liana Wallace, who couldn't be here. Uh, before I do, I'd be remiss to not speak on behalf of the, or to support the Wesley tenants and the guaranteed income proposal. Um, over 100 U.S. municipalities have passed ceasefire resolutions. Much of the global north remains silent on the atrocities currently taking place in Palestine, while hundreds of children starve, mothers miscarry, and fathers continue to pull their children from the rubble. What does it mean when civil rights icons like Bennett Johnson refuse to have an honorary street named after them as a result of visceral discomfort with the fact that Evanston refuses to recognize the need for a ceasefire? Evanston is home to a beautiful diaspora of Muslim, Palestinian, and Jewish residents. What does it mean to be outraged by the events of October 7th and then be silent as the death toll in Gaza surpasses 25 times the Israeli death toll as of March? What does it mean to turn away from a genocide that is being live streamed? What does it mean as a Jewish people to look away when there are live videos of stumbling, starving Palestinian men being bombed to bits as they walk across an open field in Gaza? As a third generation Evanston resident and Jew, I am outraged. These nearly 1,300 signatures are not meaningless. They mean everything. If 1,300 voices are not enough to be heard in this community, then is this community worth living in? We need a ceasefire. Anything otherwise is a choice to be willingly ignorant of blatant facts and to signal that some voices in our community are worth more than others. Ceasefire now, free Palestine. And I have the signatures, so I'm gonna bring them forward. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Maha. My name is Maha and I live here in Evanston. I've been living here for many years. And I'm extremely, extremely just disappointed that the community I moved into because it was a progressive community, apparently on many issues except Palestine. This is unacceptable. We are in the midst of a genocide, the first genocide of you know, this, this century. Uh, and while you all are not caring about it and looking all smug, we are besides ourselves with grief. And our friends, our family members, do you not see the same images we see? Are we watching different news? Because every major news outlet is showing the unbelievably horrific pictures of children who are being killed, of doctors being executed, of a mother who was raped in front of her children and her husband, and the IDF soldier telling them if they look away, they will be shot. Look at me when I talk to you. You need to allow this to come forward. There are a lot of people who oppose what's going on. And when will you care? when it spills into this country, into, into Evanston's community, and then people are going to care? We need to Thank take you very the, much. We need, to, we need to do the right thing, no matter how difficult. Thank you very much. We now move to the online commenters, beginning with uh, Lilia Perky, who will be followed by Betty Cones, and then Brian Benson.
Looks like we're having some trouble uh, helping uh, Lilia Perky unmute, so we'll move ahead for now at least with Betty Cones, who will be followed by Brian Benson, and then Sarah Mountjoy Pepka. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I am here in support of the Guaranteed Income Program. As a longtime educator for early childhood education, I have seen numerous scenarios of families who have desperately been in need of supporting their families in terms of heating and electricity and food and clothing. And I myself have personally supported families in need out of my own pocket. I know that this um, guaranteed income program would financially be the support that families need to support their children. Adverse childhood experiences impact young children in many ways, physically, emotionally, mentally, socially, and they don't go away. It's a, they last forever, according to Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, author of The Deepest Well, who's, she's currently the Surgeon General for California. And these traumatic experiences build upon each other. I feel Thank you that it's much. our responsibility to ensure that families have can access the opportunities that they need for their young children. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Brian Benson, who will be followed by Sarah Mountjoy Pepka. Looks like uh, Brian Benson is not unmuting, and also that uh, Sarah Mountjoy Pepka is not in the Zoom. Is that correct, Luke? Hello. Oh, there we go. Hello, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. I would like to ask you to please bring forward the ceasefire resolution for a vote. I believe it is our duty to speak out against crimes against humanity, and I believe it is your duty as our elected officials to speak out against crimes and against humanity, please add the city of Evanston to the voices calling for an end to the violence. And I would remind you of the words of the Algerian representative to the UN that he made today. Please let the Palestinian people know that we did not entirely abandon you and feel your suffering. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Sarah Mountjoy Pepka. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Hi, Sarah Mountjoy Pepka, Eighth Ward. Um, I want to apologize to the 31,000 Palestinians who have died so far since this city council has refused to consider a ceasefire resolution. Over 100 cities have had the courage to do it. I think you folks are all protecting your careers and it is time to step up and make a vote on it. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now go back to Lilia Perky and see if um, we're able to unmute. All right, seeing that uh, we were not able to solve the technology issue there, uh, that concludes public comment for this evening. Uh, we now move on to special orders of business, the first of which is SP. We're going to follow our rules as we have been throughout. You're, anyone is welcome to send a comment in writing to the city clerk and distribute it 
All right, we move now on to special orders of business. Uh, is there? How can we convince move, uh, Evanston? Listen, SB how can we convince okay. Evanston? Council, Evanston, uh, that Palestinian children count, count, are just as important council as member our Reed. children. Thank How you. How can we? I move item SP1, update on Envision Evanston 2045. We care more about like this well, civil, like, council being member polite Reed moves that we, we discuss about, that we hear an update on Envision Evanston lives. 2045. Council member Newsom seconds. Come on. This is ridiculous. I think we have a presentation from staff on this topic. Is that correct, Director Flax? Until uh, when please, please step do we have to convince Evanston uh, that Palestinian men do not deserve please, to be dehumanized? Director Flax, please Palestinians are not terrorists, just like indigenous people are not savages. Black people are not thugs. Director Flax, please. Migrants are not animals. We care. This is really important, guys. We cannot allow I, I this rhetoric. We cannot it. allow the dehumanization, the rhetoric that we use to describe humans that are being slaughtered and starved, babies and mothers murdered by tens of thousands with our tax dollars. I am deeply D Director, concerned about I, the lack of compassion. I, I think no, listen, no, don't don't escort anyone out of the room. I just I just think it's important for basic fairness, that we follow our rules, that nobody what given special dispensation, and that we move and that we move forward uh, with our agenda. Uh, Director Flax. Good evening, Mayor Biss, um, members of the City Council, Council um, City Manager Stowe and um, City Clerk Mendoza. Um, I'm here to provide an update on Envision Evanston, uh, could we please have order in the, could, hold on, Director Flax, could, could we please have order in the chamber? Um, we, point of, uh, point of so order, we, uh, go, Council Member Reed, go ahead. Sorry, point of order, I, I, I really ask for order tonight. Tonight, we have, an, I understand your call for this, but we have important agenda items on. I have a proposal and I hope this council votes for it, to provide funding for children who are homeless in this community, something I personally have experienced. We need to do the business of the people of Evanston where we can have an impact. I su personally support the call for a ceasefire, but this body will have zero influence on it. And so I want to focus on the things that I know that within the boundaries, the few miles of Evanston that we can actually have an influence on. I'm supportive of figuring out a process to get a ceasefire a statement from the community supporting it, but I don't have the bandwidth to focus on that when I'm trying to make sure that we have kids in our community who aren't being forced out of our community and homeless, when we have people who are struggling to get housing, people who are struggling to pay for food. I'm focused on what I can have an impact on here in this city. If I ran for Congress, I'd focus on that. Sorry. Uh, uh, the and and I, I just want to... I just want to add that we we have to be able to do the work of the city and any time any time spent on any issue is time spent away from another issue and we have to do our best to balance all of those different considerations. One way to do that is to follow our rules, both our rules about how items are introduced and considered and also our rules about how an agenda is followed. And then to address an agenda with mutual respect for one another's priorities and interests and with focus on the issue before us. At this time, the issue before us is an update on Envision Evanston 2045. Director Flax, please continue. Thank you, Mayor Biss. Um, our agenda tonight is to, um, for anyone who isn't aware of um, what Envision Evanston 2045 is, to give them a brief explanation, take you through a project roadmap, our outreach and um, next steps. This is a once in a generation opportunity and there are two documents that are gonna be coming out of this planning um, effort. One is a new comprehensive plan. Our last one was done in 2000, it's kind of out of date. And new zoning code, our last update to our zoning code was in 1993. So we need to move 
ourselves into the future. And that's the purpose of um, Envision Evanston 2045, is to plan for the future, not for today, but for the next 20 years. We are in about halfway through phase one, which is the lived experience. This is getting from people here in Evanston what they see happening in Evanston, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. We've extended this by um, almost a month and we're kind of overlapping some of our phases because we have such robust engagement that we don't want to shut it down early. We really want to get, we want to hear from everybody. So phase one will end um, in April, at the end of April, but phase two, developing our vision, will start in April, overlapping, and um, go through July. And phase three, phase four, and phase five, you can see after that. We'll give you more details on those at upcoming meetings. I'm saying this is how the community is getting involved, not how they will be involved. We're getting great engagement. Um, and there are lots of ways people can be involved. Online, you can go online to envisionevanston2045.com and take our survey in either English or Spanish. We're having community sessions, both in person and virtual. We're asking people to host their own sessions on um, what, how, how living in Evanston is for them right now for that um, input um, by meetings in a box. And we also have city um, hall office hours. You can find out about all of these at our website, envisionevanston2045.com. There we go. Well, where are we? This is actually where we are as of um, last week, middle of last week. Um, we are really getting wonderful engagement. We had 740 responses, but now um, on uh, last Wednesday, we're now at over 900. Our goal is to get at least 2,000. That's what Evanston Thrives got, so we'll see if we can beat that even. Um, we have um, 15 meetings in a box scheduled. Um, two have been held. We've already had meetings on, well, last week is a big week for meetings. We had meetings on uh, the 20th, the 21st, and the 23rd, and the 24th. Um, so we had a lot of good community engagement there. Um, we are partnering with um, Cradle to Career to get out in the community, both and get surveys um, completed and also um, get more meetings in a box. And what are we doing to get keep everyone moving? Um, we have um, a community meeting at Fleetwood Jordan tomorrow evening. We have a joint 2nd, 5th, and 8th ward meeting on the 28th. We have a joint 6th and 7th ward meeting on um, April 4th. Uh, another community meeting at Levy Center on um, the 3rd of April. And another virtual community meeting on 4-4. And a first ward meeting on 4-10. I think I got most of those anyway. So we have a lot of different ways that people can and I hope will get involved. And we will be coming back every month to give you an update. Any questions? Councilmember Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Director Flax. Uh, I was pleased to host an engagement session yesterday focusing on environmental folks. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the observations that I made and was uh, reflected to me in some comments from some of the participants was the lack of diversity in that room. Uh, and I kind of bumped on the numbers of, uh, of um, respondents to the survey, uh, to the Spanish version of the survey. So if you could speak a little bit to what we're doing to engage a wide swath of Evanston mm -hmm. uh, people from, from all corners of town? Well, we are working with Cradle to Career, as I said, and they're getting out in the community. We're looking for other groups that we can communicate with and get to go and engage other groups that are at this point responding at a lower response rate than we would like to see. That's one of the things we're doing. We're assessing who we're not reaching and changing our tactics to try to get to them, and we are doing that. Um, I think you'll see that. Again, it's one of the meetings in a box techniques is to actually get to um, people who can even engage people in different languages, Spanish, perhaps Haitian, other languages that we simply are not going to get as much information without them speaking 
among themselves, but with a trusted person leading a group. Are we doing anything to utilize the infrastructure that we put in place for participatory budgeting? Who did a very robust kind of meet people where they are engagement? We are, um, and we are also using some of the techniques that were very important to get people to the larger community meetings as well, offering childcare, food, things like that, making it possible for people to take the time to come to those meetings. Great. And then after this kind of initial round of engagement, what can we expect in uh, a few months down the road? Well, once we, we will come back to council with the results of what we're getting in each one of our phases as we move into the next phase. So you'll be hearing from us what what are we hearing from our residents as we're before we've we're coming back and with the with the vision you, you need to hear the input before then so that you can then assess if we're coming out to the right place will there be structured public engagement sessions later on in this process yes oh i'm sorry absolutely there're going to be public engagement in the developing our vision and pursuing our vision phases yes absolutely. thank you thank you Councilmember Reed, followed by Harris. Thank you. I just have uh, one question. One, I appreciate um, the um, learning from processes like PB and, and using um, some of the, as I said, the learning that we gained from that process. But, um, and I appreciate, appreciate that we are extending out the public engagement period. I think that's critically important. This weekend, I held in a virtual open office and had a resident, a couple residents have questions about this. And one of the main questions is um, those folks actually engaged in the PB process and were happy with the fact that with PB, there's the community engagement. And then, you know, obviously the community voted on projects and those projects are being implemented now. So there's a clear line of my engagement matters in this way. And if I engage, there will be a clear, um, uh, there will be change. And I, I, what I explained to them is that we're also engaging in a, a zoning update. Um, and so this process will uh, inform that. But beyond the zoning update that we're going to engage in, what else, how is this not going to be another plan that just, we, we, we do this and it ends up on a shelf and doesn't actually inform um, uh, decisions necessarily that the council makes um, moving forward. So what gives this teeth? And if there isn't something that gives it teeth, what can we do to give it teeth? Well, one of the things that's different from our past comprehensive plans is this is more than just land use. We're engaging people from throughout our city staff to really talk about how a comprehensive plan can affect different aspects of living in Evanston. We are using data from the Evanston ePlan to look at what changes we need to, what, what needs we need to address, how we can change um, the inequities between different parts of our city. All of this has to be brought in. Um, we will have a much more robust um, transportation element um, we just got our new transportation um, uh, coordinator um, started yesterday, uh, Monday, um, and um, that's another important issue that never really was addressed um, to the same level as we expect to address it in this comprehensive plan. So it really is far more comprehensive on how we look at all parts of the city and all parts of how people interact with and benefit from the built environment, everything from you know transportation to parks to housing to um, you know every aspect of their lives. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, essentially what I'm hearing is that there isn't something that gives it, I mean, I, I love the explanation, but we, essentially we don't have anything that gives it teeth. It's really up to this body to uh, look at the plan and take action from it. And so, you know, it's, the plan is, oh, sorry. The zoning will give teeth to what can be yeah, developed, certainly, though. Certainly. And that is that is a very important but, part of it. But outside of the zoning changes, I mean, there are a whole host of things that I'm hearing are going to be in this plan from CARP to transportation that aren't, that may have some interplay. Well, certainly will have some interplay with the zoning code, but not necessarily all encapsulated in, in zoning code updates. 
And so I, I do think, although it's cut, the comprehensive plan will be coming at the end of our term, so some of us may not be here the next term, um, but I do think it incumbent upon this council and the future council to move swiftly um, and intentionally with engaging with the proposals and the ideas that come out of this comprehensive zoning, I'm sorry, comprehensive planning process. Um, because if we don't, we are going to lose more trust um, in our, from our residents. And I think, you know, if we're asking folks to engage in this process and spend hours at these meetings, there should be, um, you know, something, some fruit that is, is born from it, uh, from the engagement. And so I, I really encourage us to, to take up uh, the recommendations swiftly. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Harris. Thank you so much. Um, I think you answered most of my question. I know when we met, I talked about we needed to go to people and not just count on people coming to us in, in disadvantaged communities. And I'm hearing you say that you all are working on that. We mm -hmm. aggregated and disaggregated communities that we needed to go to to make sure they were part of this bigger scope of things. So we are doing that. We're touching base. Right. Okay. We are looking at um, our demographics of our responses, both to the survey and also to just who we see coming to meetings and, and looking for who we're missing and figuring out how we're gonna to get to them. All right. Is that, Council Member, are you still? No. Nope. Okay. Um, okay, at this time, no one else is asking to speak. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks for all the work on this. I'll just, thank you. as by way of a commercial, say that I had um, on Friday, I held a meeting in a box um, at my house. Uh, it was for the purposes of making a condensed video so you all will get to see part of it. Um, but we did the whole agenda. And I have to tell you, it was great. I mean, by far, by an extremely wide margin, the hardest part was getting my house clean enough to be willing to have people inside of it, uh, which I don't recommend, actually. But um, it was, I was a little nervous going in that it would be kind of like a little stilted or uncomfortable, but it was a very natural, uh, engaged, rich conversation with a bunch of people who love this town who wanted to share their thoughts about how to make it better. Um, and so if, if folks are on the fence about hosting something like that, I would recommend it. It was, it was really an a experience that I found personally interesting and enriching and hopefully will provide some useful feedback for the team as well. I asked some of my staff what they were seeing that made them excited. And one of the things was that people were really thinking beyond today. They really felt that they were hearing from people about what the future should look like, which is really what we need to be doing. And we're grateful for that. Thank you very much. This time, no one is asking to speak for a first crack. So we go back to second cracks uh, to Councilmember Newsom with four minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Director Flax, to that kind of forward looking uh, intent, what are we doing to bring in young people to this conversation? Um, yeah. High school and college outreach and um, also in some cases where you're getting families, you can actually get the, the children to talk to. So all of those different things. If it all works out, my son who's in student government in the seventh grade will be bringing this to his, uh, his little club. So Maybe we can have meeting in a box with some of the teachers there too. Yeah. It's amazing how that type of thing can work. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, would the clerk, clerk please add Councilmember Burns to the roll and Councilmember Burns? Um, <clears throat> last time we discussed this, I mentioned um, wanting to see outreach goals. Uh, different from PB, I, I don't think this is an issue where <clears throat> young people in different groups in Evanston are going to necessarily seek it out on their own um, or honestly even be willing to stay. Even if they get involved in one meeting, do they go show up to two? Do they show up to more than that? Um, but I, I think if we say for different groups, like we want at a minimum to reach this percentage, right? Whether it's people speaking this language or people from, you know, these countries or, you know, folks who are marginalized in, in any any type of way, let's just say we want to reach 
this many, this percentage, or however you want to measure it, and set that as a goal. So that's what I meant, like something to hold us accountable. And uh, especially on this issue, because, again, I, I don't think this is something that people really interact with as much. And so I think we're going to have to make an extra effort to make sure that um, uh, the information we get is representative of, of all of Evanston. And that's all. Thank you. Um, still no one is asking, or again, no one's asking to speak for the first time. So we go back to Council Member Harris with four and a half minutes left. Got to be brief. Um, so are we reaching out to our faculty at universities, colleges, and ETHS, our civics classes, to say, hey, you know, um, especially when dealing with students and in college, having it incentivized of extra credit, learning possibilities, and then that also brings people just greater into the community. So Northwestern, Oakton Community College, Oakton College, sorry, no more community. Oakton College, um, ETHS, they have really good civics programs. Um, yesterday we had a meeting for the League of Women's Voters and they have some interest. So just making sure we're not waiting for these groups to reach us, but that we're really reaching out to them. We are. There's a whole separate um, outreach to organizations um, within the community at all different levels, the dealing with all different people. And if, if I could actually just interject there, maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, but in working with the team on that, they're developing kind of a master list of organizations for that outreach that I think if we do the painful work of keeping that up to date, will be a useful outreach tool for this organization well beyond this one issue. And and are we doing that or is that cradle to career or combination? It's us doing the outreach. Okay, excellent. Okay, and, and as the mayor said, that's a great opportunity to get in with these different bodies of people who don't come to these meetings that aren't ver verbal and sign up, so, okay. Continuing with second opportunities, Council Member Reed with two minutes left. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanna add, based on comments that I heard, uh, one to highlight, one of the key I think learnings from PB is that we provided stipends for the delegates. And I remember, I know I had some early conversations. I don't remember if that particular, um, I know you mentioned transportation and food and all of that, but do we have stipends for folks who are? Yes, we are, we are going to be able to use that same technique because there are people who can't take time out of their life otherwise and won't. So yes. So how are we, what is the, how are, folks being selected for stipends, what is their, is there a title? Do they, what do they have to do in order to get the stipend? I don't have all the details myself. Okay. I can have one of my team get in touch with you. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and I think particularly we're having a second, fifth and eighth ward meeting, particularly if by then the staff can start to disseminate that information, I think particularly to our ward, I mean to every ward, but I think particularly mm -hmm. our wards, um, that would be helpful. Okay. This Thursday. Yeah, this Thursday. Okay. At this time, no one is asking uh, for uh, to make, f give further comment. So once again, thank you very much to the team. This brings us to item SP2. Is there a motion relative to item SP2? I will move item SP2, approval of $900,000 of the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, funding to implement the city's second round of guaranteed income. Second. Council Member Reed moves approval of $900,000 of ARPA funding to implement a next round of guaranteed income. Council Member Harris seconds. Council Member Reed. Thank you. Um, I've, I've, um, I'll start with this. I'm, I'm going to vote yes for this this evening. Um, I do have a few questions, and I've, I've kind of moved around on guaranteed income. I've had some concerns about it. I am someone who, and I recommend folks really look into modern monetary theory, MMT, read a book by Stephanie Kelton, get to understand it a bit. Um, I, I, and I'm not gonna go into a, a lesson about it now, but I, I do think that, um, you know, if, there are programs that I think might be more effective than this. I do think a guaranteed jobs program would would, would be uh, m potentially more effective. I think that, again, needs to come from the federal level. I do think there's plenty of stuff that we need 
done here in our city and we could, instead of just giving the money away, give people some work experience along with the money and an opportunity to, uh, as I said, to gain gain some work experience. But in the meantime, I do think that guaranteed income is certainly needs to be a part of the, the plan. Um, and I do think the research that is coming from this um, will be useful in the future. So that's why I can wrap my head around it. Um, the questions that I have uh, is specifically, is this round of funding available for undocumented folks? This. Good evening, Alison Leipziger, Policy Coordinator. It is not because um, this is exclusively funded by ARPA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, whereas last time we were able to use private dollars. Would ARPA restrict us from helping? That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Well, because we did we not fund the. Um, go ahead. The, sorry. the first round was funded of a mix of sources, including Northwestern money, and because that was. That was mon that money was earmarked for the undocumented population, and the fact that it's not public sector dollar has really changed the game in terms of what we were allowed to do with it. Okay, and who knows what happens in November? So I I understand. Um, and then uh, do we is this if, if this is restricted to um, one or two census tracts? One census tract. One census tract in the fifth ward, and. Why was that one census tract uh, selected? Uh, the eighth ward census tract also has uh, a fair bit of uh, complexity. The eighth ward has the largest African American population in the city, which, you know, just statistically we know that in Evanston that means a whole host of other um, issues that um, that community faces. So, can you explain? Why yeah, we I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Meyer, who uh, championed the E plan, because uh, that's that's really where this comes from. This yes. is a direct outreach of the E plan. Um, hi, council members, mayor and city manager Luke Stowe. I'm Kristen Meyer, management analyst for Health and Human Services. Um, council member Reed, thank you so much for your question. Um, and it's a good one. Um, the reality is that um, when you look year to year, the um, the census tract that comes in number one for child poverty can change slightly, but what we see um, is that that's due to sampling issues. And what what's more important is looking at the year-to-year -year, um, patterns. And what we find is um, very persistent um, economic hardship that is unique to census tract 8092. And so. Um, are you referring to which one of your census tracts are you referring to? 8103.01 or? I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. The, but, the, but one, it, it, the furthest the southwest or furthest south east. central? Yes. It's the furthest. I believe it's the furthest east census tract that goes into the ninth ward as well. Right. Um, so in 8102 right now, we have about a 22% poverty rate. Um, which is, it, which is high. Um, yeah. and we, but there is a pretty high margin of error on that percentage. What we saw in our 2018 data in the e-plan was, um, that there was an 8% poverty rate, um, in, for I'm that sorry, neighbor, what year? for, yes. In what year? What? Oh, 2018. Okay. Um, whereas when we look at census tract 8092, what we see is, consistently high poverty year to year. And what we also see is when we look at, um, you know, meeting household income, um, we also see that it's much lower and much more stagnant in Census Tract 8092 than it is in 8102. Thank you. And, but I also want to note that the uh, Census Tract 8102 in the 8th Ward stretches into the ninth Ward into an area that is, um, you know, primarily single family homes. I would, mm -hmm. you know, make some wild assumptions that but mostly moderate income uh evanstonians and i and i want to note that that poverty is really concentrated in the eighth ward um you know in the in, in a pretty dense area in the eighth ward and so I, I wish the census tract didn't stretch out into the ninth ward and i wish it was just it it matched our um political boundaries but it doesn't i think we get much more accurate information that way um 
And so I, 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 I want us to consider how diverse that census tract is. And if you think about the concentrated area, I would imagine those numbers obviously would be much, much higher. And so I, I would I would like to see this opened up to um, at, at least that census tract if there are not others that are right on the margins. And, and maybe can you tell me what the rationale, I mean, I, I partially heard it, which is there's obviously the high concentration, the consistent concentration of, of, of issues in that uh, particular census tract, but why else? Is there really a good reason that we couldn't open it up to a second census tract? Um, so what we see um, in the ePlan data and elsewhere is that um, we have just consistent um, economic disadvantage that comes from the legacy of redlining, um, from a lot of uh, historic and structural um, decision making on the, on the part of the city that uniquely disadvantages Census Tract 8092. Um, I would love to see this open up to every family with kids, kids under five. Um, the reason that we picked Census Tract 8092 is because this is so data driven in terms of looking at, um, again, consistent patterns, not just child poverty, but when we look at income, median household income, when we look at increasing rent burden, economic stagnation, it all points to um, a really consistent picture that we need to have particular emphasis on 8092. And what's um, really great about focusing on just that census tract is that unlike in the last iteration of guaranteed income where there was kind of a lottery process because there were more people um, than we had money for, this um, would not be a lottery program. It would be every um, family with children five and under 184% of poverty or less um, living in that census tract would qualify. Um, that is uh, compelling. I like that kind of research and data, I, I, but I, I, you know, folks in my ward are struggling too and could certainly use this kind of help. Um, go ahead. I just want to say that this is not intended to be the last time that we do guaranteed income. And it's it's not to say that people don't need help right now, um, but this seems like an exciting opportunity to focus on something directly from the E-Plan, where we, we saw Kristen go around the city for a year and say, like, this is what we've seen, this is what the data says, and everybody said, what can we do about it? So this seems really beautifully tied to that and an answer to that question. But this is just one moment in time. And um, you'll notice that there aren't additional funding partners in this like there were the last time. But that's because ECF and NU are dedicated to making this happen, hopefully in perpetuity um, for next round. And so um, it is not easy to say, just wait a year. But um, it is also to say that nobody's hoping that this is the last time we do this. Um, it's just that direct response to the E-plan. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, and just last thing here, wrapping up, I'm sure my time is coming to an end. Um, I, 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 I wanna highlight one of the public comments, uh, which is that the lack of, uh, uh, you know, kind of broken down data for the Hispanic community, my ward has, as well as the fifth ward, I have large uh, Latin X, Latine populations. And so um, I do think it is important uh, for us to hone in on that data as well. Um, and so I, I'm going to support this today, but uh, next year, I'd really like to see it open up to the eighth ward and potentially even, again, there's work that we need done here in the city. If there can be a, you know, for the folks who maybe are unemployed and have the the time, um, you know, if there can be a work component of it too to help folks get that experience, you know, have the dignity of work and increase productivity here in Evanston and help build a better city, um, I would also be supportive of uh, that as well. All right, thank you. Councilmember Harris, followed by Kelly, followed by Nusma, followed by Hedekaris. So, Councilmember Reed, you will be proud to know when this was introduced to me, I said, what did Councilmember Reed say? I have a, I have um, concerns myself that it was just one census tract, even though it does, just so you know, it does come a little into the second ward. 
But I advocated, did I not? A lot. Um, because what I do believe, while it is concentrated right here, if you if we do some work in your community now, there's the opportunity that in a year they won't need it because we've done this work preemptively. Um, I too support it, but really wanted it to be a much, not a much wider net, but um, that it did service. And, and I was clear, and I know Second Ward to tap me on the shoulder, but fifth, eighth, and then second war, because when we look at it, we know what it is, right? Even though I'm here to protect that. Um, so what I do worry about, again, is disproportionate to one community when I've always been in every statement I made while I sit in the seat of the second ward, I represent all of Evanston. So that bothers me when only one of our community, when, all, when the money's kind of coming from everywhere, um, so just a little bit of concern, and I shared that with Council Member Burns as well. Um, I try not to hide my concerns when it affects other people's areas. I, I don't want to walk into somebody's house and tell them how to clean. As you said, you had problems cleaning, trying to get people in. You got it done. You got it done. I believe you. Um, and then just the sustainability of it. I know we can't make those promises, but we sit here and say, well, we're going to try to get to people next year. Regardless of who's in the seat, they're going to look to them and say, they only heard next year. They didn't hear we're going to try, <laughs> and it's based off. So um, looking at a program that will be sustainable to help the community, um, I have more thoughts, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Councilmember Kelly, followed by Nusma, followed by Hedekaris. Great, thank you. So I'm very glad to see us moving forward with another round of the guaranteed income. Um, I, do, I also have some similar concerns. I feel like we have poverty all over Evanston, definitely concentrated in some areas more than others. Um, so I am somewhat, you know, I'm also somewhat concerned about that. Also, even, um, I guess I have questions. I would have asked them earlier had they come up earlier. Um, questions regarding the groupings. I understand why the undocumented this time is not included, but it seems to me we want to especially look at those who have the least access to grant money that's available. And I know seniors really are, you know, in, in a really rough situation, as are that 18 to 24 year old group that we served in the last one. So I feel like the families, obviously, that, but there, there are grant possibilities. So I have a question about that maybe first. Yeah, thanks. So w one, um, one consideration, and we also have um, Indira Perkins online as well. She um, is on the Health and Human Services team. She's the manager who helped um, implement this program. And one thing we talked about was that it made it really difficult to um, promote, have applications for, design, and then implement the project with three distinct demographics. It just, it one size did not fit all for those three, and it made program implementation really difficult. Um, so picking one demographic was really important just so that we could get it right and spend our time doing it right. And then the other thing is that um, I'll turn it back over to Kristen to talk about um, the impacts of childhood poverty, which are just astronomical. Um, as you heard very eloquently from um, a lot of our early childhood um, advocates, there is an incredibly strong body of evidence for why we need to support children in their earliest years. Um, so we have um, a lot of data saying that early childhood investment um, and family stabilization can pay dividends in the future. Um, there was a study that um, increasing annual income by only $1,000 um, increased math and reading scores. Um, when you increase that to $3,000 annually, you start to see lifelong changes where um, the, the percentage of adulthood earnings go up. We see higher SAT scores. Um, so we really know that economic investment and helping families get the resources they need helps people, um, you know, pay for childcare costs, pay for the rising costs of of their homes, and helps them um, stay in our community. And that this, you know, by investing in our youngest children, we are investing in 
the future of Evanston and, and the, the future adult population of AB 92. Thank you. So yeah, not disputing the need for um, to address poverty for early childhood. I guess I'm just asking if you can speak to grants that are available. I mean, is it not true that families with small children would have more access to funding and grants than seniors or 18 to 24 year olds who are um, in terms of access and funding? And my other question is, do we know with this amount, and given that you've you know targeted just a census tract, can we actually fund everybody in that with this? Amount? Yes. Um, so we looked at um, the ACS estimates from the U.S. Census, and based on the latest data, we can provide. Um, these monthly payments for every single family that fits within these guidelines of living in 8092, less than 185% of poverty, and having at least one child, five or under. So yes, it could cover everyone. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not an expert on grants for different demographics, but I will say just thinking about what would make the biggest impact just on the community that because there's such a huge impact for every dollar you spend on kids. That was the impetus. Okay. And then I guess my last question is, so for our last, um, the last round that we did, so we did it with Northwestern, and we also did, we, we hired, we paid people for research, right? That was part of the funding? P part of the funding. So the, most of the funding went to the gift cards for people for participating in the research. So every time you did a, um, you did a survey, you got $25. Every time you did an interview, you got 40 or something like that. Um, I, uh, a few moments ago, got a memo <laughs> from Northwestern. Um, one of the biggest things, and this is very preliminary, it wasn't even for distribution because they're still doing their one year, like it just ended, so they're still doing their one year follow-up. Improved mental health, greater food security, and better access to medical care, largely driven by the 18 to 24 year olds. So that's like the most concrete information we have so far. And then a bunch of anecdotal stuff about how, like, I had a job. It was terrible. This allowed me to get a better job. Um, I was able to pay for medication. My stress, you know, got way less because I was able to meet my basic needs and function like a human. Right. Yeah. Okay. It just seems like if we funded research, it would be great before proceeding on the next one. I fully, I, I buy all the past research and why we're doing it. it just seems like for our own local program, if yeah. we had research, it might be good to bring that research forward and say, yeah. based on this research, we're you know recommending the, um, another yeah. tranche. But. The other thing that our researchers are doing that's different from the kind of like, how did this impact you is to discern how... Um, they're trying to learn how these pilots turn into sustainable policy. And so that's kind of their next round and I, I, or what they're currently doing as well. So I think that's also tied up in, in how they're spending their time. Okay, thank you. Would it be, um, I mean, I want to move forward obviously with this too, but in terms of getting broader community buy-in and support from Evanston to, to hold it and see our research, our results, so we can say, see this work locally and, and then move forward. Is that something, I mean, I don't know how folks here feel on the dais, but... I don't think so. You don't think that that's a good <laughs> idea? Because, but. Honestly, because um, I I don't think we're going to be surprised at all. And so we're just holding it off so that we can know something that, you know, our preliminary, the preliminary memo that I have says exactly what I thought it was going to say. And our, our national data just is so clear on this that I, okay. I don't think. We're going to get new information. Okay. Is, is Can it, we get the results, though? Yes, from the oh, research? we certainly will. Can we yes. have those and, better and next? When, um, as soon as I get anything from the researchers that are that's ready for distribution, I'll we'll do an accept and place on file. I'll present it if you'd like. Okay, great. Thank you. Is it all right if I just uh, jump in here for a second, Council Member? Um, you know, um, I mean, first of all, I think uh, Allison is, um, you know, being a little more polite than maybe... I need to be in saying uh, we've waited for the research for a long time and held off, and we're just not sure about when we're going to get the final, you know, complete, bound, vetted. Here's all the details report, and it just feels like we've waited a long time already, hoping that. So that's been a uh, just a factor here. The the other thing to say though is that um, I recently did, and thank you, Kristen, for sharing this with me. I did recently read a really detailed meta-analysis of the uh, studies that have been done on this. And the 
the data on families with young children is really the most overwhelming. And so the, the question that I found my, so to back up, I had the same reaction as you, like, let's wait. And then I realized upon reflection, what might we learn from the research that will tell us not to move forward with the path that is the most proven out by all the other research that exists. So that if, if, the, if it comes back and says, this was fabulous, we still don't have reason to believe that it's even more fabulous than what all these other studies have shown is the, the most bang for your buck way to do it. And so that's why I ultimately said like, let's move forward because there's people who need the help right now. And we have really solid data from not just one or two, but now literally several dozen high quality studies from across the country. And they all tell us the same thing specifically about families with young kids. Uh, Council Member Nusma, followed by Hedekaris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Northwestern has gotten a couple shout outs for their involvement to get in this program off the ground. So I also wanted to acknowledge the role that our former colleague, uh, Council Member Fleming, played uh, with thanks to her. Um, I want to talk about the source of funding. Uh, so this is coming from ARPA. How much money does this leave in our ARPA account uh, that would be unallocated or unspoken for at this point? This leaves like before ARPA interest, 170,000 ish. And how much in interest ballpark? Not nothing. I can find it, hold on one second. It's in the ballpark of a half a billion. The interest. Okay, so we have ARPA interest plus the 173,000. We have less than a million, maybe 750,000 ballpark in ARPA yet to be allocated. Okay. Um, and ARPA money will take us through one year, one year from now. Then what? Northwestern and ECF are, are working with each other and us closely, but mostly with each other to figure out how to do this for real for a long time. Okay. And yeah, Northwestern's contribution, is that counting or, or coming from their community benefits package or is this separate? This is separate. Um, it's, I, I believe they've made a commitment and we could always use the Good Neighbor Fund if we wanted, but... It is not, there's no dedicated guaranteed income source in the community benefits agreement. Right. So an additional contribution from Northwestern yeah. over and above their commitments. And it may not be just that they cut a check. It's like they're trying to figure out how to help us do this for a long time. It could be they're raising money. It could be they're working with ECF to do something. It's much broader than just you need to cut us a check. Of course, we would take that. But yeah. <laughs> I, yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank That's you. my questions. Council Member Hedekaris. Hi there. Um, I want to be the second person to thank my predecessor, Cicely Fleming, for the work um, putting this project um, forward and uh, making it a reality. Um, I have one logistical question for staff. I know, um, you know, you all uh, mentioned that um, undocumented folks cannot receive benefits, but um, this would want some clarification if the children of undocumented parents um, who would be um, potential um, citizens, if they could receive uh, benefits. Um, from my understanding, uh, parents can apply for their children for, um, for aid for their children through Medicaid and SNAP, and um, I was wondering if that would be a possibility for families? My understanding is if they could do SNAP, they can probably do this, but I want to triple and quadruple check, so that is now on my list to find out for you. Great, I, I appreciate it, thanks. Clerk Mendoza. As a mixed status household myself, right, I had for some time a husband that could not qualify for things and I could. Parents can apply for SNAP or Medicaid for their children even if the parents are undocumented. 
so the citizen children can benefit from the programs that they're entitled to. So you have a lot of people up here on the dais who have actually used a lot of these programs that you could. I just have to make sure that ARPA money is okay with that, but I, I, I'm going to just make sure because what happens otherwise is that then the families, if we're wrong and ARPA doesn't allow it for whatever reason, then probably people are going to get a call and like have to give that money back. And I don't, I really don't want that. Mm -hmm. So just have to make sure that it's an allowable, if we can give it to the kids or, you know, we'll, we'll make sure, we'll just make sure that we're using the money how they allow us and we'll. Yeah. So children that apply for Medicaid and, or food assistance, SNAP, the benefits are for the children and not for the parents, but the parents are allowed to apply for those benefits for their children. I'm hopeful that's the answer we'll get to. Okay. Yeah. Councilmember Burns. Um, just wanted to thank um, uh, Allison Lepsinger and uh, Mayor Biss, and I know Evanston Community Foundation um, was a part of this as well. Um, this is important. Um, I wanted to give space for my colleagues, especially in the eighth and, and second wards to, um, to discuss the need across the city, but especially in their wards. I really hope we continue this. Uh, we're working on, we, we've been working on a while on a health equity proposal that will eventually, um, make it here for consideration. And, um, it was important to me to make sure that not only 8092 was included in, in that effort, but also that we expanded it beyond the, the 8092 for obvious reasons. Um, but I do think that there's power in, because the inequities have been concentrated in 8092, creating really overwhelming instability for many generations now. I do think it's powerful when you can concentrate those resources and those investments back in that area, um, this particular track. But, you know, the Fifth Ward um, has lost a lot. If you kind of track back over the last, you know, 50 years, much has been extracted out of the Fifth Ward, including its young people extracted from the community to, um, uh, to integrate our school system. And so to me, this is kind of a continued effort by the city um, and by the school district, frankly, if you look at the new fifth ward school uh, that will be there shortly uh, to invest back in the community, to add things back to the to the ward, and it deserves it. Uh, and so I'm proud that we're continuing to do that uh, important work. Um, Five hundred dollars may not seem like a lot to everyone, um, but you can lose a car over five hundred dollars. Uh, you can lose a job because you lose your car and now you can't get to work. Um, you can lose your housing over $500 for a lot of people in this community. And so while, again, it may not seem like a lot, it is a whole lot for a lot of families in this community. And um, I'm just, again, proud that, that, uh, that we're making this investment. And, but again, want to make sure we do what we can to make sure it's expanded um, to address all the need that we have in Evanston. But thank you, everybody, for this, doing this important work. Um, at this time, no one's asking to speak for a first time, so we go back to Councilmember Harris with two minutes and 50 seconds left. And I wholeheartedly agree. I lived in the Fifth Ward until I was 18. I went to King Lab. I, I've talked about that's where I grew up. That's where I got lumps in life and a lot of things. So quick question. Um, my calculator, because my mind wouldn't have answered this, says that that's about 150 families in the fifth ward. Um, do we know that we have 150 families based off what um, city clerk just mentioned? Does that number change? Seems like it might. And if tomorrow we have 160 families, how do we figure that out? and get my good side on that camera. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Council Member Harris. So um, what we do have are population estimates that um, tell us that, you know, in 2022, we had about 144 families, um, but, you know, it, it could vary um, a little bit. We do have some, some wiggle room there. Um, one thing that we don't know is 
how many of those families um, are on HUD support. Um, and we would not want those families to qualify just because we wouldn't want to put their um, housing at risk. Um, so, so there may be a smaller um, you know, group of families be because of that reason. Um, but so, so one thing that we can do is potentially increase monthly payments or um, you know, if we, if we have more money, we could potentially raise the, the threshold as well for, for who qualifies. Or go to the eighth ward. Or go to the eighth ward. <laughs> but what if we? But what if we're over that? You're saying, so just if we get over that, let's say HUD kicks out ten, but there's another ten because this was from the what census? 2020. 2022. Right. So things change. People yeah. move. People come and go. It is. It's an estimate. We think the. 900,000 will cover every single family if we're off. We'll see what our options are. I, I think there are entities in the city who would be able to help cover an extra two, three, four, five families. Um, that's my hope. Because the goal is to keep everybody in who's eligible. At this time, the only person asking to speak is Councilmember Reed. Uh, your time is up, so if you could keep this brief, yes, please. I'll be very quick. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 there's your questions earlier about um, including other age groups. I, I think we're, we're we've got an answer on that, but I will say that you know families do have uh, you know uh, access to SNAP for their children at the full rate uh, there without income constraints. There's, uh, I believe, the federal child tax income credit, I think, is coming back. I hope. Uh, I forget what the movement there was last, which is significant uh, and lifted, I think, 50% of our children out of poverty when that was enacted. Um, the one thing I do want to say on the data that we're getting, uh, because we... Um, it seems like, or it seems like some of the data wasn't concrete. There was a lot of, or I shouldn't say not concrete. It seems like there's a lot of, I think the word you used was anecdotal um, evidence. Uh, seemingly everything it seems. I think I heard you say that the one concrete piece of data that we had was that folks 18 to 24, one of the groups, uh, certainly had better health outcomes uh, or went to doctor's visits more. That's what I heard. And so do you want to first respond to that? I do. My, my real question is, I, if we're if we're having, are we having research, a research component with this round of funding? I, I wish that we did. And I wish that we looked at more detailed health outcomes, such as, you know, measures physical measures of stress such as blood pressure or weight or other uh, factors that we could show that there was an improvement by providing this money um, in uh, health outcomes for folks. And and did we get any of that data from the first round? Did I mishear you or miss? We're still waiting on the small, I don't know if you saw the um, application for the first round, but it's very long and very detailed, probably too much so. That data will be coming back to us as they complete their research. Their research on that stuff is not complete. So all of the nitty gritty stuff, that's coming to us. They gave me like a quick little memo that had that little blurb about the 18 to 24 year olds. It had some other stuff as well, but that was the one that stuck out to me. We don't have a research component this time because it's very expensive, and we'd rather put that money in people's pockets. And the state has dropped its requirement in order to have a guaranteed income program. So we'd rather just not spend our money that way. Okay. And then last thing I'll say here is uh, I, I just want <clears throat> add, to <clears throat> add my um, – I think Councilmember Newsom asked uh, the question about what happens next year. Um, I don't want to – be in a situation where we have families who are used to this funding, still need this funding in a year, and then the funding just disappears because that could have really, um, I think, detrimental impacts on those on those families. And so, 
I want us to also be aware that by voting for this today, I, hopefully we're voting for this, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think that's something to take into account. We don't, and, and who knows, maybe, I hope, I, I have belief that Evanston Community Foundation and Northwestern are going to be able to step up to the plate, um, but we just have to be aware that we're, you know, as we have our 2025 budget coming up, um, we are going to have to be prepared to potentially take it on completely um, if the if our partners don't uh, get it together, which I, I believe that they will. So I just want to keep that on our minds. Uh, that is it. Thank you. Uh, continuing with second cracks, Councilmember Kelly with three minutes left. Thank you. So I, I do support this. I just was a little confused by your response, Daniel, regarding the research. Are you saying that we we paid for it, but we aren't getting it, or we shouldn't expect it, or they're just slow. <laughs> I just wasn't quite clear on. Slow. Not that we're not going to get it. We will get it. It'll be very comprehensive. It'll be very detailed. It'll be more than we want to read, probably, but it's going to take a minute. That's all. Seeing no further discussion, would the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferden? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hrakaris? Aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the funding is approved. This, uh, no, we have to move to the next item. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, Councilmember Reed to make a motion on item SB3. I'll move item SB3. Discussion. Oh, just discussion. Okay. Discussion of need for the replacement of existing aerial ladder truck T22 for Second. fire department operations. Second. Councilmember Reed moves that we talk about fire trucks. Uh, Councilmember Harris seconds. Uh, Chief Pollock. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Clerk Mendoza, City Manager Stowe, and the members of council. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize for having to bring this news to you today, but uh, here we are. Um, and if, you, if I can indulge you with a, about a 10-minute presentation of kind of where we're at with our situation, and hopefully this will answer a lot of questions that you may have. And if it doesn't, I, I, hopefully I have the answers that you'll need. Um, so, hold on, let me... Okay, great. So um, if you look at this picture here, um, last year the Evanston Fire Department responded to 11,614 incidents. That means about 26,000 unit responses. 8,051 8, of those incidents were EMS, 3,563 were other types of incidents such as fires, hazardous, hazardous materials, special rescue, and things like that. Please take a look at that picture in that city that we, a bustling city that we have here. Um, you can go to the next one if you can. Oh. One more. No, nope. the other way. There you go. So I'm going to give you a couple definitions because uh, this is where people get confused in the fire world, and I'm not insulting anyone's intel intelligence, but here's where we're at. Um, we have fire engines that pump water. Those are the trucks that drive and pump water, and we have fire trucks. We have two types of trucks. We have a straight truck and we have a tower truck. The city of Evanston has two straight trucks. So we, this is our reserve truck. This is our tiller truck. The reason we have straight trucks is because the whole time at Evanston, we've never been able to get a tower truck due to our viaducts and due to the tight streets that we have in Evanston. Um, our proposal is since this truck right here, our reserve, which we'll get into, is having some issues is to get a first ever tower truck in the city of Evanston. You can go to the next one, thank you. What is a ladder truck and what does it do? Our ladder trucks are critical to our operations. Uh, vertical access from the outside up, um, rescue operations, uh, rescuing people from windows, um, uh, rescue operations when it comes to specialized rescue, uh, canal types of rescues, uh, TRT, uh, special rescues, high angle rescues, um, ventilation tactics. So when we catch a fire, we try to get to the roof as fast as we can to relieve the pressure in the house to let the smoke out so the firefighters can go inside and put the fire out. 
Um, overall, it's one of the most important vehicles that we have on the street. Um, so trucks in our world are super, super important. And uh, here's, you can go to the next one. In Evanston, we, we operate with two um, frontline trucks. Our first truck is up at station three, 1105 Central. That's at the very top. That is a 2015 100 foot tiller truck, straight truck. So it's a straight tip, there's no basket on it. And down at the south end, 702 Madison, we have truck 22, and that is a 2011 100 foot tiller truck. That's a 13 year old truck. If you can see truck 23 responded to 1700 calls in 23 and truck 22 responded to 1420 calls uh, compared to when they first went, went in service. Um, again, trucks, very important. Um, if you can go to the next one, please. So here's our current situation. We have a reserve straight truck 311. This reserve truck currently at this time is up in Wyiga, Wisconsin. It went up in Wyiga, Wisconsin in November of 23 for some major repairs to the torque box. What the torque box is, is that's what operates the, the heavy ladder. I should also mention that those trucks it's not just about the ladder, it's all the equipment that the trucks carry. It also carries a complement of ground ladders, a 40 foot ladder, two 35 foot ladders, a 28, a 24 attic ladder. So it not only has the hydraulic ladder that reaches 100 feet, it carries a whole complement of, I'm not trying to ignore you, I'm, just trying, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so it carries all kinds of uh, tools as well. So getting back to our reserve truck. Our reserve truck is up in Wyiga, Wisconsin. They went up there to have torque box repairs as they tore apart the vehicle. Um, they found some major uh, damage to frame rails. Frame rails are what the whole truck operates on. So they can't fix the torque box until the frame rails are corrected. Uh, those frame rails, um, when we bought this truck in 2021, we had mechanics go up, look at it. We went up and looked at it. Well, I, should, I should say went out and looked at it. We bought this from a dealer in Pennsylvania. And the, the rust, it's called frame jacking. The, the water gets inside the frame and rusts from the inside out. So it was something that was very hard to detect as we were up there. The only reason they found these, this damage is because they were able to tear the whole truck apart. So that's sitting up there right now apart. And we just, we received news from McQueen, which is our Pierce dealer, that it's gonna be about $240,000, plus or minus 10 or 20% to fix those frame rails to get that operating. Currently, our situation is we have um, our frontline tiller truck 23 is out of service at Interstate Power. We are borrowing a truck from Skokie at this time, which they've been gracious to let us use. And when, when they don't have one available, we ask Niles, and Niles is usually gracious to let us use one of their trucks as well. We believe in having two trucks in service at all times. Um, truck 22 is in service, looking to go out of service once truck 23 gets back, as it has to go out for some repairs. And um, <clears throat> that'll, that leaves us right now with our truck out of service up in Wyiga with just two frontline trucks. Can you go to the next one? So um, our reserve truck that is up in Wyiga is a 2006 Pierce rear mount, rear mount straight stick. Um, that replaced a reserve truck that was um, a 1990 Pierce and that went out of service in 2021. Um, it's important to note that our Evans, we believe in having three trucks in our town for a reserve at all times, that our foreign fire tax, which is a, a board that um, run by firefighters, the fire chief, um, uh, has donated money to these purchases in order for us to have these types of uh, vehicles on standby and in reserve. Um, in 1998, they donated $50,000 to, to, to a $263,000 purchase. And in 2021, they split the cost with the city for 82.5 for a total of $165,000 purchase. So it's, it's just important for us to have two trucks and we believe in it, the staff believes in it. The city has also helped us with this in keeping three trucks in, well, two trucks in service, having a third as a reserve. So our proposed plan at this point is um, we would like to get a purchase, we would like to purchase, which is just actually one year ahead of schedule. We were going to be coming to the, the council or the budget committee next year to purchase this truck. Now we're looking to get this one year ahead of schedule here. 
It is a $2.3 million tower truck. It is a mid-mount tower truck. Uh, it is an industry standard of four-year build time. Um, the current truck up in Wyiga, we're looking to either sell, trade, however we would do that, whatever that looks like, and place our tw truck 22, our 2011 truck as our reserve. If this was a four-year build time, that would put our truck 22 at about 18 years old, which we, we want to get 20 years out of these trucks. Um, most of the time, we want them to be in a reserve mode for the last five because they're more reliable and dependable. So this is kind of our plan. Um, you go to the next one. Okay, so the reason we want a mid-mount tower, like I said, this is the first time we've been afforded the opportunity to finally get a tower in our town um, due to viaducts, due to streets. This truck meets our needs. Um, it, it meets the height restrictions of 11.1 or less. It meets our EFD length of 43 or less. Um, it provides all of our uh, rescue high angle firefighting needs um, in a very quick fashion, which I'm gonna show you a video, a one minute video if you're okay with that. And um, it just provides uh, operational vers versatility to our fleet. So instead of just having two straight sticks, we'll now have a tower and we'll now have a, a straight stick, which we can do a whole lot with that. If you go to the next one. If you give me, if, if you're okay with this, it's a one minute video on what this truck can do. If it makes firefighters safer and more effective, we find a way to build it. The ascended 100-foot heavy-duty aerial tower is here. With more agile length, weight-optimized design, and easier positioning. Go safely with maximum drivability and visibility. Go boldly with shorter overall length and height. From the industry's most rapid setup with integrated ground pads to best in class below grade operation in scrub, the ascended 100 foot aerial tower maximizes agility and reach. Get the capacity to respond. With the flexibility to perform. No comparing. No complicating. Refuse to compromise with the unmatched, unrivaled, Pierce Ascended 100-foot heavy-duty aerial tower. We go to the next one. One more. Nope. Okay, so. Um, what I want you to remember is on a slide ago, I told you the industry standard to have a truck like this built is four years, which puts us in a really bad place with only having two full, two frontline trucks in service for four years. Um, we've been a Pierce uh, customer for since, since I've been here, 28 years. Um, Pierce is willing to help us out in several ways here with a lot of conversations through our fleet and facilities department, uh, the fire department, and what Pierce has done for us and what we've done for them, obviously. So the, the truck, the vehicle that's torn apart up in Wyiga, Wisconsin is over $52,000 in just labor itself. Um, McQueen, our Pierce dealer, and Pierce, they're willing to absorb that $50,000 cost, costing us nothing at this point. We had $108,000 budgeted for this project. They're willing to absorb that $50,000 cost and, and just kind of move forward. They're also willing to secure, and this is unprecedented, they're also willing to secure a 12 to 14 month build time. 
how they're going to do that is McQueen, our dealer, is purchasing or putting their line of credit on Pierce's demo slots. So Pierce builds a demo truck every so often so they could take to conferences, they could take to wherever to sell their trucks. Our dealer McQueen is willing to purchase or, or put credit on that spot so we could build that truck to our specifications to have a truck here within 12 to 14 months. Um, McQueen is also willing to provide us a, a 75 foot straight stick truck at a discounted manufacturing, uh, at a discounted price, about, it's, it's about $200 a day if we were to need it. The, and the standard is about $700 a day if we uh, were to get it anywhere else. Um, and then a, pre, a prepaid discount of eighty dollars to $100,000. Uh, I do want to say a few things. There was a public commenter about our um, operations and needing a truck and things like that. I, I'd love to hear more of his ideas and what he has to say. But when it comes to accidents, um, our department, we're really good. We have um, a promoted position. It's called an FAO, Fire Apparatus Operator, in 22 we had 12 accidents, four of them involved the truck and they were mirrors, um, four of them were uh, other people's fault. Um, and that's out of 26,000 unit responses. In 23, we had 16 accidents, much of the same, mostly mirrors. And uh, again, 26,000 unit responses. So our accidents, our accident numbers are, are, are pretty good. Um, so this is where we're at, this is plan A and this is, uh, the bad news and kind of where we're at. Uh, I'd like to just mention we are here just a year ahead of schedule because we were gonna do this for next year anyway. So love to hear your ideas and how you can help us out. Council Member Reed. Thank you. Um, I will start off, one, I had a, I didn't want to interrupt you, but you used an acronym TRT, what is that? Um, I'm gonna let our special operations uh, chief tell you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Council, Mayor, City Manager, Clerk Mendoza. My name is Matt Smith. I'm a Division Chief in the Fire Department here, responsible for all the professional development and also what we call special operations. The specific question, technical rescue team, is kind of a specialized rescue. It can be considered anything out of the routine type of calls. These tend to be the little bit more rare um, but high-risk type of incidents. So rope rescue, anything that would involve uh, trenching in the streets that you see a lot of throughout the town, anything that might be uh, a car into a building, uh, structural collapse of any kind, confined spaces that we see a lot throughout Northwestern in our city, ETHS and everything. Uh, so that entire umbrella can be considered technical rescue. Okay. And to that, I think this might also, I don't know, uh, how... How do we deal with the high rise? I mean, I don't think we've had a high rise fire and our high rise standards are pretty good. The fire is typically, but it, would this truck allow us, is a hundred feet enough? I don't think so. So what happens uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So our, our fire department considers anything greater than four stories a high rise. Okay? okay. And in our community, we have over 618 buildings that are considered high rise buildings. This does not include your two and a half stories that are on a hill on Ridge or Asbury or our, um, our larger houses on Florence Crane that's south of Emerson. Every one of these houses or, or, or structures, if we didn't have this type of ladder, we're throwing a ground ladder. So it's gonna take a full truck company of three uh, uh, staff mm -hmm. to get a ground ladder to that roof, to get to the roof or to get to a window. And it's one person at the window taking a person out. So. Um, the high rises, the 26 stories, the 18 story buildings that we have downtown, no, our 100 foot ladder is not going to reach that, but it can scrub and we use that as our, um, our it's a truck company that goes in for search and rescue. So what, what do we do, what does any fire department do in uh, the situation, you know, I have 415 Howard in my ward, which okay. is a fairly tall building, comparable to some of our downtown buildings. What do we do if there's a fire there and we need to get people on the you know, 14th floor? Sure. So um, that is a whole different fire response. That is, uh, it calls for a lot of people. We're bringing in multiple um, uh, communities to help us out. We're bringing in Chicago. 
we form teams at the bottom to, to and we, we designate stairways on stairways that people get out, stairways that we use for vents, stairways that we use for ex escape. We get, we, we form um, in the lobby. We, we send a whole lot of people to the floor below. If, if floor. I can interject here, just to really get to the point, there's, is there a, a fire truck that is designed to, to deal with those kinds of situations or is it, more the fire truck is going to be more for carrying our, our extrication tools, our special rescue equipment, using the using the ladder to the height we can use it. A, a high rise like 415 Howard is a completely different animal and it's a completely different tactic because we're going right really far up. So that's a whole nother thing. And then I, I this is uh, I know a sensitive situation for the department and for our community. There is a gentleman who. Uh, was a, a landscaper of sorts and was caught in a tree. Um, and I believe we needed to bring in one of these trucks from Skokie in order to assist, or is this not the kind of truck that would have helped with that situation? So um, we responded to that scene and um, we had a very good handle on what was going on. Um, according to other sources, the, they thought that a tower ladder would have um, been better there quicker and we had Skokie come in which took 12 minutes um, I want to stress that our members it was found that our members did everything no yeah that they could yeah, of course um, but a tower truck like this yes will absolutely help better that situation because you're on a platform with two to three members app actually able to work and you're not at the tip of a ladder yes. so yes that it would be very helpful to have that okay um, and then to close out um, Two questions, actually. One is about insurance for the truck that's in, I, I don't even want to try to say it, in Wisconsin. Why are we got? Why we got? Yeah. D uh, did we have in any kind of insurance plan? If we just bought it in 2021 and we're finding out that you lift up the thing and the, the frame is rotted, right. that feels like something that somebody should be responsible for, Other that, that is not the city of Evanston. Sure. I would let Sean come up if he would like to and talk about that. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, Sean Cholick, Manager of Facilities and Fleet Management. Um, so we reviewed the paperwork that we had, uh, which included the warranty information on that, and um, the frame rails are not covered as part of that warranty. Um, so there is basically nothing that we can, we can get back from the seller um, or the manufacturer. It's, it's just not covered at that point. With, with that in mind, I, I was a bit shocked when I saw that we even purchased a 2006 vehicle. It, it, would it have, is it maybe better practice in the future, particularly if something like that isn't covered and it maybe is a potentially somewhat common occurrence to just purchase newer vehicles? Sure. I mean, it's it, it, it was kind of a tough call to make. It was something that we, you know, we took a chance with. We were hoping that a uh, Purchasing a used vehicle like this would float us through a couple of years and get us, get, you know, get us into a, a, a good spot where we had the time to then inv invest um, in newer vehicles. Um, unfortunately, you know, like Chief Polyp said, a lot of times there's there's a lot of things that you can't see when you buy something, and um, you know, this this just happened to be one of those circumstances. And then is my time up? Okay. And then what is the cost of the? normal obviously this is 2.5 million but what is the cost of uh the normal ladder trucks maybe whoever the, yeah oh, they're so about it's not much less not much less no. okay okay um thank you uh my last question i think is for the chief and uh you you started to touch <clears throat> on this and uh scott agawa i believe uh raised some concerns um are there you know, one of the he raised a number about accidents. You addressed that, uh, so good on the fire department um, for for having uh, the the rate of accidents and the not the, the 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 not not having severe accidents as well or fatal accidents in recent history. One question is about fuel efficiency. I can imagine a big piece of machinery like that is not going to have great fuel efficiency. I don't know if his numbers were correct or not. Um, we but, double we double that we get about nine miles. We get nine miles. All right, um, but um, are, is there an electric version of these trucks? Is uh, that even 
Does Norway maybe have something that's electric? It seems like they're pretty far ahead in the game. Um, so we've been looking at other types of vehicles, just a fire engine, the one that pumps water. Right. Just for the engine, which costs us right now about seven eighty to eight hundred thousand. Right. An electric version of that is two point one million. And this is the larger vehicle that operates the ladder. We haven't I haven't to be honest, haven't even looked at that. I, I wouldn't right. even know what that is. And I and I don't even know if that's do they have electric trucks now? That's all just engines. Just engines. Okay. Okay. And and then how many because I was first for split second and we have the media here and I want to make sure so we have two of these ladder trucks but how many fire trucks do we have or fire I don't know if I'm using the right term but fire apparatus fire apparatuses do we have overall sure we have five stations all right. strategically located we have five engines one engine in each firehouse we have two trucks as I showed you one in the north right. one in the south and we have two ambulances that run one main one main ambulance out of station one one's out of two we're trying to get that third one up up at station yeah. three up and oh, running. Okay. We have the staffing. It's just a matter where we're dealing with some injuries at this time. So we would have three ambulances and a battalion chief. Can you remind me? Oh, sorry. Station three is that Custer. Oh, what is the Custer station? 702 Custer. I'm sorry. What, is, what station? 702 number? Madison. I'm sorry. 702 yeah. Madison, right on the right. Custer and Madison. Yes. What state? What number is that? Station two. Station two. And you do have an ambulance there? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. And we're trying to get, like I said, the third one up. And then we also have. Um, multiple reserve engines, I think three at this time, two reserve ambulances, a squad, which a squad goes out on the types of calls that uh, uh, Chief Smith explained to you, the special operations, hazmat, things like that. And we bring that, when we get a certain type of call, we jump a company to bring that vehicle to them. So, and, and if I could touch back on your other question, why wouldn't we just buy a newer third rig? Because these trucks are a lot, they're 2.1 million. And what I love to, the, our goal would ultimately be to, to take a truck out of frontline service after 15 and put it as a reserve mm -hmm. and get another hopefully 10 to eight years out of it. That would be great. It just, you know, it's, it's expensive. Okay, and then um, I think my time is up. No, okay, um, I, I'll, I'll close here. I, I, I don't know, what, what's next? So uh, this is just for discussion. What well, are you I was hoping you could tell me what would be next. Um, well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say I, I support um, purchasing this, uh, this truck. I, I do think, you know, the situation with the, I, I think there are a, a number of examples where this could be beneficial to protecting the life and safety of our residents. And, um, I think the $2.1 million investment is well worth it um, uh, for that reason alone and to make sure that we have this um, uh, truck in our possession to allow us to more quickly respond to those situations because every moment matters. Um, and if I'm or any of us are in a situation where this um, uh, bucket truck would help us, I think we'd all uh, see that as a worthy investment. So I I'm supportive of this. Um, I, 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 I'm supportive of this. Um, how, how would we pay yes, for this? this? How are we finance? Are we, would this be something we bond out for? Is this something we. So I'm going to let, um, I guess the city manager handle this one. And I, I think it'd be a conversation for the council. I'm not sure. Sure, on the finance. Part. Sure, and uh, Councilmember Reed, thank you for the questions. I think tonight we're looking for direction on whether we would like to move forward um, with this uh, proposal, um, and then also how to seek funding, whether it's general fund reserves or potentially bonding out. Um, we've had discussions with the finance team, so I'll let Hitesh um, um, add any comments if he'd like. And due to the, normally this is something we would normally take to finance and budget committee, but due to the urgency of the situation, um, we're coming here. Okay, I, I, I support this. I, I. I think if it's urgent, you know, uh, I would even support bonding out for something as long term as a 20, 25 year fire engine and my time is up. Uh, so I will uh, close there. But just for my own edification, truck has a ladder, mm -hmm. apparatus just engine, delivers water. Engine, engine water. I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember Newsma followed by Suffered and followed by Kelly. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A lot of my questions were already answered. Thank you to uh, Council Member Reed for his very uh, exhaustive list of questions. Uh, I do uh, want to allow you the opportunity to address another concern that was raised during public comment about the bigger trucks and or engines being deployed multiple times a day when it doesn't seem like we have that many fires. Sure. So uh, we have different levels of responses for different types of incidents. Uh, so for, uh, let's call it a detail, let's say a, a, a brush fire. We would send one engine that carries water, put out the fire. Each one of our vehicles, our fire apparatus, um, carries three people. Uh, there's a driver, there's a uh, captain, and then there's a firefighter. Every one of those um, people are um, trained as a paramedic. There's a few new people that we've hired now that are still going through paramedic school, but for the most part, every, every rig is an ALS, advanced life support, fire apparatus, or ambulance. So we have different levels of calls. So that would be a detail. Or we would go to an EMS call, which would, which would require an ambulance and an engine. The reason we send an engine is for um, staffing needs, for uh, uh, manpower to bring um, people down from you know, four stories with the different types of, like we have stair chairs that bring people downstairs, getting people to the cot extra assistance in the back of the ambulance so we could provide the best care possible to our, our residents. So that's why we follow with an engine and the ambulance on EMS calls. Um, now, so, so you all know in the past couple of years working with um, uh, our firefighters, working with the amazing command staff that I have, we have changed a lot of our, or two of our main responses on a, on a um, I'm sorry, on a uh, automatic fire alarm, we used to send one battalion chief, two engines and a truck. Um, after multiple discussions with our safety committee, our local, the command staff, we were able to take an engine off and really kind of see how that goes. So now it's one engine, one battalion, one truck. So that's 1,100 calls that we've taken an engine off of the, the street. Uh, we've also looked at our EMS responses um, for a medical assist or uh, a car accident where they've been sitting there for 10 minutes with the police and all of a sudden they decide they want to go to the hospital. Instead of sending both an engine and an ambulance, now we just send an engine with three paramedics. They'll determine if that person needs an ambulance to keep that ambulance in service for a more, uh, more um, critical call, a cardiac arrest, a stroke, diabetic emergency. So we are looking at ways to, to maneuver our responses to still better serve the public and, and, and really um, you know, take the wear and tear off of our vehicles, uh, actually keep our, our members you know, from continuously going on calls that they might not need to respond to and keeping them fresh. So we are looking at all kinds of different ways of, of doing these things, but our response is here. I don't wanna bore you with every single level of response, but uh, um, we are looking at these things and we, all, we will continue to look at these things as, as they progress. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm supportive of this purchase. Uh, looking forward to hearing from other folks about where exactly we find this money, but I think we should do it. Council Member Suffering, followed by Kelly. Okay, great. I just want to make sure I understand all the entities involved. Pierce is a manufacturer. McQueen is the dealer. Mm -hmm. The discounts and accommodations that we're getting are coming from McQueen, not Pierce, correct? Um, so, I don't know. Or is that... This is um, uh, uh, representative from McQueen, uh, John Kenna. Good evening, everyone. Hey, John. John Kenna. Uh, it's a little bit of both. Okay. The timeline for the, the new truck, which is normally a four-year build time, we were able to get that in 12 months, so one year. And then. And when you say we, you mean McQueen? M well, or, that's Pierce. Yeah, that's I mean, Pierce. help me understand. Is McQueen like a holy... Uh, we're just a dealer. Just so, a dealer. Yeah, okay. it'd be um, if you go to buy a, a Chevy truck or... You know, you go to the Chevy dealership, they're a dealership for that, but Chevy makes the okay, So you're the one helping us out here Correct. with everything on that slide. And Pierce, the manufacturer. Okay, gotcha. So Pierce helps you out. Pierce is helping us out right. by giving us a 12-year build slot. I'm sorry, 12-month build slot. But then McQueen is stepping up to take care of the costs on uh, the, the, the truck that's up there getting the torque box. Got it. So we're getting help from both the manufacturer and the dealer. Yes, sir. Got it. Okay. Um and then I, how we pay for this is an, an insignificant issue. Thanks, man. <laughs> like it's, this part's not your part. Uh, I appreciate you coming up. Um, and this is a question for Hitesh or Luke. Are there, before we reach for the credit card, 
or dip into reserves, are there offsets in our budget that we can look at plan purchases that can be held off or are we exclusively looking at bonding or reserves to pay for this? Uh, good evening, Mayor, the members of City Council. Yeah, we just came to know, so we didn't have much time to look in, and this is kind of, we are early in the 2024, so we don't know whether we would have any savings, potential savings in the year to upset for that. But yeah, apparently, like right now, two things comes to the mind. I mean, obviously, General Fund Reserve, which is like, uh, we are kind of, we are drying up fast uh, because we have kind of given so much money for the CIP projects. Um, obviously, um, kind of a little related thing that when the Finance and Budget Committee kind of approved the bond issue, and a few days after we heard from the Fed chair that that could be a three rate cuts later this year and starting in June. So um, I'm working with our financial advisor that yes, we'll issue the bond, but if we can time it a little later so that we don't miss out on say 100 basis point reduction in our interest rate. Um, and hopefully are yeah, trying to kind of issue, uh, wait until the, what do you call that, Fed's meeting in June. And if they rate cut and probably there could be a, some priced, you know, they could, do, we, we are looking for a concrete action from the Fed. And if it, that happens in June, we might have a lot better rate if we issue the bond after that, you know. Uh, right, now our cal uh, right now our calendar says that we will issue the bonds or we will sell the bonds in mid-May and close in the first week of June. Um, so yeah, that's the other thing. Um, so yeah, there are like, yes, we do have a line of credit, which I can use it. Um, but while we wait, I mean, the interest rates are high there. So to me, the option would be, yes, I would draw up on my general fund reserves right now, you know, and hopefully, um, we have the better environment in June, July, um, not the best, but at least if it's a, even a, a 50 basis, 200 basis point lower, it could be a substantial saving in our interest rate. Uh, one thing I don't know whether I, um, and Chief Paul, which came to my mind about one potential funding source, which even I don't know whether he has complete control, the foreign fire insurance fund. And I think we get roughly 200,000 every year. I was wondering if the insurance board is have kind of ready to have a kind of long-term commitment, you know, a little bit on just the one time. Um, if we get that, maybe 50% for some years. Uh, I mean, I'm just kind of throwing out one of the options. So yeah, we can look at those multiple options. Yeah, once the council says that, yes, we want to move forward in terms of operational needs. Okay, um, and this is an observation and maybe half a referral, but this is the third time in recent memory that urgency has been used as a reason to circumvent finance and budget. And I think if that's going to be taking, accepting at face value that urgency was legitimate in all these cases, maybe we need to have finance and budget be prepared to meet on shorter term notice, or we need to reconstitute how we do finance and budget uh, because we're having large purchases that we all acknowledge should it go through that committee being unable to do that because of the need to make decisions quickly. So that, that that's probably a future rules committee discussion, but um, just to make sure I understand your position, Natasha, you think that this is a worthy instance where we would dip into reserves and then backfill that later? I mean, even we could issue the bond too because it would have a life of almost 15 to 20 years, right? 20. Uh, so definitely, yeah. I mean, we hate to do that for anything for us five to seven years, but this would be a kind of, yeah, um, we have done this, um, I think, many years back with some purchase fire trucks with the bond issue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. You. So uh, real quick. Um, so as uh, Hitesh was talking about possibly June, the interest rates coming down and stuff like this, uh, I'm just a little concerned now if we have to go a different direction, we go a different direction. Just concerned about that with holding that 12 to 14 month slot. That's a that's a game changer for us just because if we get into the f waiting four years and, and if it can't happen, it can't happen. I get it. We'll have to figure out another plan. But um, if we wait four years, now our frontline truck's going to be at 18 years old. And then we're going to be in the same position when we're looking for a reserve truck. So the urgency is legitimate, but it's based on our need to get this build slot. It's based the on the need that we only have two trucks in operation and we're borrowing 
and other municipalities, and we would be doing that for the next four years. And this is industry standard. This is uh, whether we went to E1, whether we, none of the other industry, none of the, none of the other manufacturers can meet our height requirements or our, our length requirements. So Pierce is the, the manufacturer that can meet that. But it's industry standard is a four-year wait, and it just puts us in a, a tighter spot. If we wait four years, now our frontline vehicle is now at 18 years, and then we might run into the same issue when it comes to reserve status and reserve trucks. Um, he, uh, Hatesh also brought up the foreign fire tax. The foreign fire tax is a board that we've had for a very long time, and I cannot tell you how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they've paid for firefighting things that I've never had to bring to council. So. I would like to stay away from that because they do great work on buying air packs, buying gear, buying, um, they purchased and they've, they've um, made donations to reserve fire trucks and the, the amount of money that they spend and, and they really manage it well on things that we need that I do not have to come to the council for. I don't want to tighten those funds up for, and tie those up for the next however many years when, when they're buying legitimate things that we need at a constant basis. Okay. So just in summation, your recommendation as fire chief is get this done. And your recommendation as chief financial officer is use reserves to do it if that's what's necessary. I mean, yes, um, because the, even if we issue the bond in June, July, whenever, yes. I mean, I think you need what, 300,000 is the, just to book this? What's the immediate need for the what is truck? It depends on what direction we go. Okay. If you were to fix the reserve, it's going to be over four hundred thousand. Right. If you were to buy a new, it's going to be two point three. Million. Okay. So again, just to break it down to like a takeaway message, you're saying do this because we need to do it in your role as fire chief, and you're saying use reserves. Use reserves for now, just like we do the bond reserve, reimbursement resolution. Once we issue the bond, we can give it back to the judge. Okay, great. Thank you both. Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. So in order to hold the, to get this $2.3 million one, the 12 month build, what do we have to, can we pay down a certain percent? I mean, do, I mean, what's what's required in order to move forward with this financial monetarily? Honestly, I think right now McQueen would work with us any way we, we right, John? Yes. I mean, as opposed to uh, if we if we if you want to speak, please come to the podium. <laughs> Sorry about that. As it comes to a timeline for um, we've already purchased it, the the rig ourselves. We used our our uh, line of credit to purchase that slot, so we held that slot. Because um, I, I know it sounds crazy on three to four year build times, it's the way of the world now, I'm sorry about that, but we didn't want to miss this slot. So we've already purchased it. So it gave, it's giving us a little bit of a lead, or lead time to make a decision on what direction you guys want to go. Okay. I, I, I don't say it's open-ended, but it's- So I guess, you know, given that we hadn't budded, budgeted for this, it's a large expenditure, 2.3 million, but it seems there is an appetite to want to move forward on this two point, I think this, you know, one year build. What potentially would we have to allocate now? Yes. Um, what would be a minimum amount that we could potentially allocate now so that, um, you know, we're, so we don't have, I, I agree, I would like to have um, our finance and budget team look for offsets um, priority, you know, things that are much lower priority that maybe we could offset, but until then. As, as the truck sits right now, it's $2.3 million. If you guys were to come up with the money and prepay it, give us all of the 2.3, we're offering anywhere from an 80 to $100,000 discount, which brings the truck down to $2.2 .2 million. Understood. We can, uh, or you could just do a purchase order. And again, that's like purchase. And then you, at 12, in 12 months, you give us the $2.3 million for the rig. Okay, so in other words, down payment of just a purchase order, paying full in a year, correct? And you can, yeah, and if you guys wanted to do, you wanted to break it down in halves, so you can do that. There's many different ways to skin the cat, okay. so to speak. But in general, it's usually you prepay it, you get the larger discount because we're holding your money for a year, or right. you give us a purchase order and we were able to, you know, you guys just budget for for next year, twelve months for for twenty five. Okay, well, I think that's something that we should consider. I also agree that you know I don't know in terms of deciding which way we go on this. 
it, I agree that this should go to, we're just about to pass a resolution in finance and budget, you know, requiring that expenditures that are not budgeted for over a certain amount do go to finance and budget for recommendations. So that's a week from Tuesday, I believe, um, in terms of how we allocate that funding. I would suggest that we do that. Just point of order, um, if finance and budget is a week from Tuesday, that would be before our next council meeting. So there, I think either way there'd be time for it to at least go to finance and budget for discussion one time before it comes back to council at our next regular meeting. So actually finance and budget's the day after council. Oh, it's the day after, okay. Yeah. All right. This time, no. Oh. Oh God! Did you have a response? Yeah, one one All quick right, question. So, would would the desire be that we look into different options of breaking down the payments? Um, because well, when we bring if, it to city council for council approval, Kelly, do you mind if I jump in here with a, a follow up question? Because uh, so this is I guess for Hitesh. Um, so Hitesh, the um, it seems to me that at to at the interest rates that we're getting on our savings today, the prepay discount is just explicitly not worth it. I mean, the rate so, would go down, but I would agree to you. To the, I, I'm just saying, hold on. I'm just, at today's rate is not worth it. No, so the, the reason to prepay is essentially as a hedge against lowering returns on our investments. Right. Can you, and I understand it's really hard to know, but just can you say a word? Because obviously if it's six, one or uh, six, of one half dozen of the other financially, we'd rather pay next year than this year. Can you just say a word about your your best projection about what the, our, what we might expect to re get, earn on 2.3 million over the course of the next 12 right, to 14 so months? Right, so 2.3 million dollar and one, right? If you take a one person, it's $23,000 interest for one year. Right now I'm earning five and a half percent interest. Um, so it's right there. $115,000 or so, you know? Even if it goes down and say, and, and that's why I was calculating right now a minute ago that, okay, it could be an average 4%. So 23,000 times 4, 92,000. So in my mind, it doesn't make sense to make the entire prepay right now. Yeah, no, that helps. That helps a lot. I think that makes a big difference in terms of, you know, blowing our one two point three million over budget. We can order it. I think we all agree to it. We budget. It for payment for 25. But I, again, I would, and I guess we don't really have time for this to go to finance and budget, and maybe this needs to be fleshed out a little bit more, but that's what I would recommend. I have one more question. Um, in terms of um, like long-term financial planning and looking at the number of you know five engines, two trucks, two, three ambulances, then there's reserve truck and engine also. So do we have a you know 10 to 20 year, do we know ballpark within one to two years when we're gonna be needing, have we laid that out so we have an idea going forward for long term? So we did um, we did have a plan to you know laid out where we could pull the trigger with each one and have an idea of which year we would be doing it. Um, unfortunately, we went from build times being two years uh, prior to COVID to then becoming four years. So we need to sit down, we need to reevaluate and really figure out that roadmap of what year now we're looking at ordering them so that we can get them in the future, you know, four years in advance. So if that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great to get that laid out. So we have sort of a general idea and I realize we're not gonna be exact, but within a couple of years when we need to place these orders. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Burns. Um, I'm I'm trying to make sure I'm clear on. So the 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 truck where it says that I'm trying to find it now, but there were there was something about rails, the the rusted rails. You missed because there's a lot of there's T T22, and then there's yeah. I'm sorry, I, yeah, I can I can walk you like, through that. Another one. So I'm, what I'm trying to understand is the one that the the truck where we found 
where we discovered things that we didn't know initially. Is that the reason why, is that the truck we need to replace that we're discussing replacing today? No. Yeah, so that's our reserve truck. That's the truck that takes the place of our front lines when they go in for service. And that's the one that is um, deteriorated and, and not working for us at all. So we, we need to get... And that's why we're here today, though. I just want to make... Is because that was because discovered. Because of that, that it was truck, that's why we're here today. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yep. So then the Councilman Reed brought up insurance. Is 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 the deterioration not covered because... You because we purchased a used used truck. I know in in insurance with 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 vehicles, sometimes they won't even cover certain things if it's a used vehicle. So is it because of that, or is it just the that particular area just is never covered? And maybe that's a question for uh, um, uh, Mr. Cholik. Sure. Um, thank you, Council Member Burns. So yeah, in this particular case, um, because it is a used vehicle. Um, the manufacturer does not cover okay. co cover that in their warranty, does not cover the structural damage. Okay. And if it were new, though, the insurance would cover it, right? If it or was new warranty. and we we were the ones that had purchased it, um, we're the first purchaser. Or even if it was new work, because I know it, there's it's not as black and white sometimes. Sometimes like it's there's a cutoff point where it's like if it's younger than this, then they'll cover it. I, I'd have to go back and look at the specific language in the warranty, but I believe that it was um, no matter what from – transfer of ownership that, that okay. we, it would if you could if you could check on that I'd, sure. I'd be interested to know um chief when you start talking about the response and this this is less related to, you know it's related but it's more related to some of the emails we got earlier about um the types of vehicles that we're sending out on calls do we need another vehicle because it sounds like you, you said sometimes we're sending i can't remember if it was trucks or engines out just to move staff around it sounds like it is and not necessarily for any other purpose, maybe another purpose, maybe, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, it sounds like there's a, well, let me ask that question first. Is there a space within the engine or truck where you're saying someone could be with on a stretcher, like where somebody could be laid out and that's why it's there is because we can, if we run out of space in the ambulance, then they can go on the engine. Or I'm yeah. So um, currently operationally we're running, pretty efficient. So we have three members on each truck, three members on each engine, two members on each ambulance. Trying to get that third ambulance up and fully staffed more often at, at station three. Um, at this time, the only other vehicle we would need to get in operation is a, is a squad, but that's going to take staffing and I'll hit you up on that in a couple So this is a little bit different now. question. So this is, there was a claim that sometimes we're sending trucks or engines to calls that don't require them. That's not true. That's not true. No. We send, we send the proper vehicle to the call. And if, if that vehicle is at another incident or another, or let's say we have an automatic fire alarm. Let's say we have two automatic fire alarms going on at one time, both trucks, two engines, a battalion chief and a chief are an automatic fire alarm and we catch another fire alarm. We're going to send the closest engine and we're going to call Wilmette in here, depending on if it's a north end or if it's on the west end, we're going to call Skokie to bring their truck in. So we're always going to send the right equipment to the right type of for the right type of response. So we're not sending fire trucks to calls where there's no fire is what I'm saying. We we do. We send fire engines to EMS calls. We send fire engines. That's what I'm saying. So in those instances, I thought you said that... Um, Sometimes it's just to get staff there, so that it's just to get more people there on the call. Is that true? So they're assigned to those rigs, and those rigs have all the proper tools we need for whatever incident we go to. Okay, I see. So, so we, we're equip. not gonna, we don't ever want to get in the business of jumping from a fire engine into a a, a pickup truck. To that go. was my question. Yeah, like we is there another do that. vehicle for those in between calls that there's no fire, but we need to move equipment and people? Is there another vehicle that we're missing? No. Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you. At this time, no one is asking to speak for the first time. So we go back to council member Newsma with four and a half minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have some questions uh, probably best directed to the representative from McQueen. How soon do you need a commitment from the city? But I think the consensus, uh, seems to be that we want to do this, but we're just not quite sure how we're going to pay for it. How, how soon do you need a commitment and what form does that commitment need to take? Probably within a month, um, by next by next month, we'd okay. prefer to have it by May. Right. I mean, we've already secured the slot, so I would love to say you have time, but just like everything else, 
I think the more time goes on, we get a little bit more nervous because we've helped, we've put our yep. money out there to secure the slot so that we didn't incur but for now price it's, increases it's and stuff like that. Hours so, and you're willing to hold it for, let's say, a sir. month, and we don't risk losing it to will matter Naperville or no, sir. No. You know, no, it, is, it is slotted for you guys because of what happened with okay. the other vehicles and right. how we're trying to step up to. And you mentioned uh, the analogy to the Chevy dealer. If I go to buy a Chevy, the dealership can probably offer me a financing. Is that something that is typically done in your industry? Uh, that's that's what we're doing with the with the prepaid amount. I mean, we're you're giving us yes, you're paying us the amount, then we're paying Pierce the full amount, which gives us the discount of. 80 to 100 if you were to give us the entire amount. So instead of, again, 2.3, 2.2, you guys get the discount of that. And then, yes, we're just, you're writing us a check but and we're writing it to Pierce. Rather than us bonding for it, is there a way where you could set us up with financing and we're writing a separate check out of oh, whatever money to... Like a like the payment of a car. Yeah. I would have to get back to you. I, not. It's normally 99% of the time it's either one or the other. Here's the money. We're going to take it. So uh, that would be non-standard. Yeah, it would be non-standard. Yes. It's either okay. people prepay or they sign the contract and pay for the truck when the truck is delivered. Great. Thank you. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that this would have been coming to this is uh, for Chief Pollop. Uh, this is coming to us in a year earlier than you expected. But if it weren't for this kind of acute emergency, this purchase would still be coming to us next year. Yeah, we were going to start our conversations for budget season to uh, uh, right. plan so for this truck. If we do, you know, look to our reserves or the general fund, uh, you know, if we take that money out this year, we're drawing mm -hmm. down on the balance that we would have eventually dipped into anyway. So I just I'd like to make that point. So uh, it seems to me that the prudent course of action would be to you know summarize the. Uh, the general will of the council that we would like to buy this truck. We don't quite yet know where the money is going to come from and a referral to the finance and budget committee to uh, address that question would be appropriate. Is reading some body language. Does that sound uh, correct? All right. So I, I will make that motion to refer discussion of this item to uh, the finance and budget committee. Second. Council Member Newsman moves to refer uh, this item to the Finance and Budget Committee for uh, uh, further discussion. Council Member uh, Reed seconds. Uh, we can still delay the vote. There's a little yeah. bit more discussion. Council Member Burns uh, for a second crack with two minutes oh, left. I think I had my light on. I just saw him flip his light on and I've had my light on. Yeah, but you have no time left. So okay. it's, a, it's a whole different conversation. Yeah, my, my question was actually related to this. And this, I guess, is... Um, is more for Manager Stowe. So I think this issue in particular, I think is great for finance and budget. It's not it's not a sensitive, you know, real estate, you know, negotiation that we may not want to leak uh, before, you know, we have good numbers for the city. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, there's insurance, there's a fleet of vehicles that, that uh, uh, deteriorating over time. So I think this actually would have been a, a perfect issue for finance and budget. We can hold special, finance and budget committee meetings. And I think this group in particular that's on finance and budget would, uh, we, we, we would have had a quorum for something like this. And so I just want to encourage us next time to, to, to use those avenues. And again, this isn't to chief, it's, it's more, we could have met and we can meet before our next council meeting if we choose to. And I, I certainly would, I'm on finance and budget and um, would uh, would be happy to attend a special meeting about things like this. It, it's an you know it's an emergency. Sure. It's not going to happen all the time. We only meet once a month, so I think you know uh, expecting a group to to meet every once in a while when things like this come up, I sure. think is absolutely fine. Sure, Councilmember, it's just to answer your question. I did reach out last Thursday to the outgoing and incoming chairs of finance and budget to discuss this and the timing and so forth. Um, and the idea was to bring it tonight for discussion, knowing that there might be follow-up discussion on the April 9th Finance and Budget Committee meeting. Okay. That's all. Uh, at this time, no one is requesting to speak who's not out of time. Council Member Reed. Uh, Very uh, quick. What's that? Oh, I'll be well, why don't you say it in advance how quick, and then I'll tell you when that amount of time has elapsed. Because um, last time you said very quick, and then you used yeah, almost I'm, another five minutes. I, I won't go on for longer than a minute. 30 seconds, maybe. Okay, very quickly, um, with uh, one, one I wanted to respond, I, I think 
and maybe Hitesh can answer this or it's maybe just a, an axiom, but municipal bond rates are almost always going to be better. We're going to get a better interest rate than if we financed with a private finance. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So to your concern. Um, and then I would imagine that with your line of credit that you're paying interest on that and, or I don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah. And yes, so I'd imagine the sooner that we pay you, I don't know if that, maybe that's what the hundred thousand dollars is about, if not. Yes. More. I mean, we, we put our money up just to secure the spot and then. Thank you. And then with the demo vehicle, that's what you put a, that's what they put in to get the demo vehicle. Is that what I'm hearing? So, yes. Yeah, so, um, and does, Pierce, does, Pierce builds, they take a slot every so often so they can build a truck to take to conferences, take to events so they can sell their, their vehicle. So McQueen purchased their demo slot to meet our specs. So we will be able to build this to our specs. So, but how are, so are they going to take this vehicle around and show it off? No, no, first? no, no, no. They're, they're, they're just giving us that spot. So instead of it being a Pierce demo, it's going to be an Evanston truck. That, okay. Uh, and then, sorry, I hate to do this right in front of you. No, no, this is for you, Chief. This is for you. And But I'm sorry to do it right in front of you. Um, is there any... There's route. your minute. Yeah, okay. I'm going to close with this question. Is there any route to, you know, essentially cut out the middleman to, to go? Because I imagine, sorry, you're making a profit from this, and there may be some savings if we could go direct to manufacturer. Why is that not the standard here? Pierce uses dealers just like um, just like you can't buy a car from directly from Ford because we would be in this situation a lot. You'd have city councils going right to Pierce and not, ha not going through a, a, a dealer. But there are some many, I mean, Tesla doesn't have dealers that it's direct to manufacture. So there are, it, the model exists. Not, okay. not, in, not, in, not this. in this fire okay. apparatus situation. All right. Thank you very much. That ends my time. So continuing on second cracks, council member Kelly with three minutes left. So I just want to make sure that it's clear. I, you know, I think Mayor Biss pointed out that what we earn currently at, at 2.3 million in excess reserves wouldn't necessarily justify trying to move on this quickly and paying it right out to save 80,000. So I think the question that we'll be looking at a finance and budget is whether this is going to go into the 2025 budget or whether we, for whatever reasons, we feel we want to, you know, pay for it now. So, and if so, how? So I just want to make sure everyone understands that there's no real benefit right now to us paying this out and taking this out of our excess reserves, that we wouldn't, we would actually probably lose a little money um, given the interest or at least come close. So so we're, we're not, but we can go ahead with the purchase order and get this on that time frame that you need, which, which is the 12 month time frame. So just wanted to make sure that's clear. Thank you. Great. Uh, before we vote, I just have a couple comments and questions. Um, uh, so first of all, just, yeah, I want to echo that. My own view here uh, is I think we ought to buy this. I don't see any argument for paying now. Um, and I think the more we can do to build this cost into the 25 budget in a way that is not a kind of, uh, isn't a hit beyond what we'd ordinarily expect out of our uh, purchasing budget, I think is uh, very wise. Um, and I'm curious to hear what the finance and budget committee comes up with um, um, in terms of their thoughts about, about how best to pay for it. Um, I guess I'll just, I want to put you on the spot a little bit um, and I'll just be really transparent. I'm asking this question in part because I was, it was for me a little bit uncomfortable to see a private company's promotional video in a presentation with our city logo and the city manager's office around the bottom of it. How do we know we're getting the best possible deal here? Well, um, I, w I would revert that to what we can, what we need for that piece of equipment. So what we need is a truck that's lower than 11.1 in height restrictions, less than 11.1, a length less than uh, 44, it has to be 43, 44 feet. And we've been working with Pierce for a very long time and um, uh, the, the tiller truck, the straight, the straight truck that we would buy if we were to go back to a straight truck, that would be 2.1 million. So um, can I answer that? 
I don't know. It's the only manufacturer that makes this vehicle. So, but I'm saying, I guess my ask, question is, how do we know we can't get a better deal from them? Um, well, I'll have to work on that. And, and um, I apologize for the video. I just wanted to show you what this truck did, and uh, that's that's on me. No, I guess it's fine. I just you understand it sort of makes it, oh, it totally, makes us wonder I, like, wait, which team are we I on? I totally here? get that's, that, and yeah. I, that wasn't the intent of the video. It was of course, just to show of course. you what it does. I understand. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further discussion, would the clerk please take the roll? Again, the motion is to refer this to the Finance and Budget Committee. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferton? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hadakaris? Aye. Uh, with Eight voting in favor and none voting against. The motion carries and the item is so referred. Uh, this brings us now to the consent agenda. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent agenda? I would like to remove item HS1, um, A12, A13, A14. R1. I'd like to remove A7, please. So at this time, I have A7, A12, A13, A14, HS1, and R1. I will. Yep. A7, A12, A13, A14, HS1, and R1. I will move the consent agenda. Minus the items that were just listed. Second. Council member Reed moves passage of the consent agenda except for A7, A12, A13, A14, HS1, and R1. Uh, Council member Nusma seconds. Uh, would the clerk please take the roll? Council member Kelly? Aye. Council member Harris? Aye. Council member Nusma? Aye. Council member Burns? Aye. Council member Sufferton? Aye. Council member Ravel? Aye. Council member Reed? Aye. Council Member Hakaris. Aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the consent agenda with the six exceptions previously read is passed. Council Member Nusma, do you have a motion relative to item A7? Mr. Mayor, I will move item A7, the approval of a bulk purchase of electric leaf blowers, batteries, chargers, and equipment uh, in an amount not to exceed $80,000. Councilmember Newsman moves approval of uh, the bulk purchase of electric leaf blowers, et cetera. Councilmember Harris seconds. Is there any discussion? Oh, Councilmember Hedekaris, followed by Burns. Thank you. Um, all of you all should have a um, email in your um, inboxes with a proposed amendment. Um, just want to speak a little bit to the process and what's happened since the last meeting. Um, you know, first of all, I want to acknowledge kind of the extra stress and strain that this is, um, you know, had on on our small business owners and especially their family members who, in many times, are um, brought in to help um, translate and navigate um, our our systems. Um, staff has been um, particularly um, Kara Pratt and the sustainability staff have been um, working really hard to make sure that um, the landscape companies that we're in contact with are um, registered and um, applying for these grants. Um, we found that um, kind of the bottleneck of, um, of the process to, to become eligible is the registration. And so um, they've been working hard to help um, those folks um, navigate those systems and get registered. Um, what we're, what I'm hoping to do, um, I still have, you know, some concerns about, um, you know, I, I first of all I'd like to commend this, the sustainability staff for um, having a pretty low um, barrier for entry for applying for the Sustain Evanston grant. Um, that is not the holdup. Um, and but one of the things I'm a little bit worried about is, you know, the fact that this is a first come first serve um, grant process. I really am worried that um, while this bulk purchase will um, 
you know, help out a lot of our small business owners that we're going to have some people that maybe are lagging behind and I don't want them to get shut out of the process. So um, I move to authorize staff to transfer up to an additional $100,000 to the sustained Evanston fund from reserves to cover any future bulk leaf blower purchases or grant applications from the landscaping companies. And I'm hoping that that will give um, Kara and her staff some flexibility to um, make sure that we're helping all the small businesses that need help and also, um, you know, speed up the process because, um, you know, we're quickly entering spring um, cleanup season and, you know, based on our um, schedule for meeting, I don't want this, I don't, I, I am worried that we would run out of money and then have to come back to council and it would be a month out and we'd have, you know, these, these folks unable to work. So I'm hoping that my colleagues can um, support this. So council member, did you, uh, did you make that, uh, that motion just now? Yes, I did. All right. So council member moves to amend uh, this item is described in an email to city council sent at 5.38 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Council member Reed seconds. Uh, council member Burns followed by Kelly. Um, so I'm sorry. The, the amendment is to do what again? Because I missed that. The amendment the, adds another $100,000 uh, uh so 180 to the now? program, basically. So 180. The ask is 180 now. Correct. Okay. And um, the, the excess would come from uh, the reserves. Re would be sort of a transfer from reserves into Sustain Evanston. Okay. Um. The quote. So it says in the memo that we um, reached out to. It looks like three different companies to get a quote. And was that quote? Did we get some? Was that quote based on? Uh, the order that I see here, it says 24 charges, 16 backpacks, and so on and so forth. And if so, now that we're going to split those, that purchase up between the three different companies, or was it, will it be more? Did we get some type of discount, you know, um, by going through, uh, by proposing to go, uh, to get it all from one company? Good evening. I'm Kara Pratt, the city's sustainability and resilience manager. You see in your packet a memo that describes the process that staff has undertaken in order to try to solve a lot of these issues. We have heard that we will receive a bulk pricing discount at a fairly low threshold. And so regardless of the added leaf blowers that we were to acquire based on council member Hidakaris' motion, I don't anticipate getting an even lower price. From what I've learned reaching out to those three companies, it's after a certain amount, then this is the discounted bulk price. It's not like there's several layers of discount. And so I guess my question is, is the lower amount even lower than 24 charges, 16 backpacks, et cetera? You see what I mean? Because if we went to them and said, we want you to quote us, give us, provide us a quote for 24 chargers, 16 backpacks, 24 electric leaf blowers, et cetera, and in the same memo, though, it says now that we have that information, we're going to go back to them and, and we're going to split that up amongst all the three uh, companies, which will reduce the order for each one. So I'm saying, but when they provided the quote, they thought, oh, we're going to we're going to get the they may have thought we were going to get the whole order and now they won't. So will, will there be any price adjustment or the quotes we have are? No, there won't be a price adjustment. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's a few moves. It's a little, you know, it's a little tricky. So I just want to make sure I'm being yeah. clear. I'm trying to be as clear as I can. The but threshold to get to bulk pricing is well below the number of equipment that that's included need. in the memo. Okay. Perfect. Um, I did have some concern, even saying all that, I did have some concerns about the good thing about going to different companies is it sounds like we'll have some options now. Cause I was concerned about that too. I know if I'm, you know, a business owner, I want to, 
I want to have some some choice between different companies. So this allows for that, which is good. Um, does this also include mobile charging stations or no? Just what we see here and they will come up with that on their own or how should we think about the the charging stations either at the um, headquarters or the mobile ones that we've talked about that are in the vehicle? The bulk purchase before you is just for leaf blowers, batteries, the backpack kit, and the charger. Okay. All of the other supplementary equipment we're handling through the traditional Sustain Evanston grant, which does not come to city council for approval because those are all under 25000 So certain landscaping companies have reached out with other requests, electric, lawnmowers, trimmers, and other supplementary charging equipment, but that's not coming before council because that's handled internally. Okay. Um that's all for now. I may have a few questions, other questions, but I'm still trying to put those together. Thank you. Council member Kelly, followed by Newsma, followed by Ravel. Thank you. So um yeah, I'll support this. I guess I also still have questions because I've heard a number of small business landscapers um, express concern about the registration. So can someone just tell me what's involved in registering in order to be eligible to tap into these grants? So I think if we don't resolve that, that piece needs to be resolved along with maybe outreach. Good evening, Sarah Flax, Community Development Director. Um, currently, um, landscapers are registered um, through the building division. It's um, not for, it, it's for when they're doing flat work or other installations is actually what we register them for, but the same process is being used to register them for um, what they're doing now, which is the landscaping uh, maintenance. Um, it's not a complicated process, I don't think. it. Um, there is a form stack form they fill out um, online and email in. Do you know why? I, and I don't know if there are people here who can speak to it because it, clearly there's been a lot of expression in Spanish mostly about why this has been. I think we have to check to see. I don't think it's in Spanish. We should probably check to make sure it gets translated. Okay, so that would be one piece. Um, I, I think Clerk Mendoza has a reply to this, if that would be helpful. Yeah, Councilman. I've registered quite a few co um, companies in the last two weeks uh, since our last council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main problems is that the application is not in Spanish. So that is taking people, they have to come like to my office to get that assistance if they don't have a child or a, or someone who can help at home. So now we're leaving the work to register landscaping companies to the children of a lot of these companies. Um, another super complicated part is that if the company has not previously been a registered entity, they have to become a registered entity in order to um, be able to get um, liability insurance in order to register as a landscaping contractor in the city of Evanston. Um, we require uh, COIs with the city of Evanston additionally insured um, when we register companies. So now it's taking not only the timeline in order to get your entity registered, but then also potentially needing to get your EIN number or using your own social security number, but then also needing to get a COI with the city of Evanston additionally insured. And then once that process is done in our community development department, processes that application with they've been um, Huron has been super helpful in this process and she is amazing at what she does so I hope that your team can congratulate her for all of the sensitive just very kind um, service that she's been providing to our landscapers um, then they have to come in and make the payment most people have to make the payment in person because they don't know how to do it online um, some people have been successfully been able to get their children to help them it is a long process. Like it's taken, um, actually, today we we started um, helping a company two weeks ago, and today they were able to finally get everything through, and um, we were able to send everything to Kara, and Kara has been also provided that like 
very hands-on support. A lot of people don't know how to use the internet, um, don't have access to a computer. And then on top of that, there are many questions that you have to answer on the application. Um, not just, are you a landscaping contractor, but there's additional questions in that form. Thank you. One of the things that we can do is, um, I'll be happy to work, have my team work with Kara and you. We will get a translated one uh, version of the form, but I also think we may be able to have people come and apply at the permit desk um, where they can just turn stuff in and then get the paperwork done, and then we can maybe work something like that out as a group. Okay. Thank you. I mean, it just sounds like for $3,000, what we're asking folks to go through, Oh, I'm sorry. For um, well, I know for the for the twenty five thousand. I'm not talking about the twenty five thousand dollar, but the, isn't it three thousand? The grants for no point of information. Didn't we that we discontinued that? Right, we're not doing that anymore. So it's, I think it's just to twenty five thousand now. Yeah, this is only for twenty five thousand. Okay, in terms of, I don't mean only. Uh, no, not. I, I mean it's. I mean it's limited to the twenty five thousand, not for just grants to purchase a new, an electric leaf blower. I don't know what those cost. But. In the years twenty twenty two and twenty twenty three, the economic development division of the city manager's office offered up to three thousand dollars of the entrepreneurship grant, specifically for landscaping companies for leaf blowers. I believe only five applied and received up to $5,000 or up to $3,000. Since then, the Sustain Evanston grant was identified as being more applicable for this type of purchase, and that is up to $25,000 for any climate action and resilience plan related project for any business based in Evanston. Thank you. So, I mean, it seems like we're trying to address the issue of equity in our small businesses, landscape businesses, predominantly Spanish speaking. Probably, I don't, I don't know what the average cost is for um, an electric leaf blower. Is there a ballpark? Is it around three thousand? Is that no? Twenty nine hundred dollars is an entire kit. So that's a leaf blower, two batteries, a backpack carrying system, and a charger. Okay. Each leaf blower costs about $600. The batteries are the more expensive component. Because that's what I'd like to see. I mean, I feel like from what I'm hearing to address the community concerns is easy access to that money to change out the gas-powered leaf blowers easily without, you know, a huge amount of red tape. If there's any way, I mean, it seems to me, as opposed to just the, not just, I mean, limited to this $25,000 grant that's open to all businesses, you know, having some sort of, Easy, easily, easy accessed way to um, to replace the gas powered leaf blowers for you know three thousand, six thousand. It seems to me that that's what we should be looking to do to really streamline that. The request before you is exactly that, Councilmember okay. Kelly. It's okay. a staff identified way to um, cut the line for this grant, and it's a bulk purchase group buy that again staff developed in order to be solutions oriented and try to solve this problem. So the request before you is exactly that, because if this was handled traditionally through the Sustain Evanston program, the entirety of your sustainability staff, your city clerk, much of community development would 100% of their time be working on right. this. But what Stephanie just described just sounded um, really lengthy, correct? I mean, like, that needs, besides just being in Spanish, that we need to look at, review that process. Would you agree, Stephanie? Yes, and I mean, we currently don't have anyone at the permits desk, too, that speaks Spanish, um, which makes the issue a lot harder. So, and... <laughs> Did she need a job? Didn't say you were not in so I, I can provide a little bit of clarification that as Director Flax and Clerk Mendoza mentioned, we have a contractor registration process, we have a home-based business license process, and then you have the Sustain Evanston grant application process. Perhaps our Corporation Council could explain why it's important that 
businesses that operate in Evanston are registered and why that process is important? Thank you, Kara. Uh, Honorable Mayor, members of City Council, Alex Ruggie, Interim Corporation Council. Uh, so all of our businesses need to be registered. Um, it's just a process that is required by city code. Uh, by registering the businesses, we ensure that they are um, licensed uh, as businesses in the state of Illinois, which is required. Um, and so it's just a, a legality that they have to go through. Unfortunately, one of the requirements for the Sustain Evanston is that the businesses are Evanston-based, and that's the way that uh, the businesses are able to show that they are an Evanston-based business as well. Um, and then, as Kara pointed out, or perhaps it was Clark Mendoza, um, in order to get the liability insurance, you have to be a registered with the state of Illinois as a um, either like an LLC or a S Corp or however they're incorporated. Um, but in order to do that, then that's how they get liability insurance. Um, that's how they get workers' compensation insurance for their employees, et cetera. So um, that's that's why that step is required for the city of Evanston. And what does it mean to be Evanston-based? I mean, what's required to show that you're Evanston-based? So for the landscaping community, staff has gotten creative with this definition understanding that often it's dependent upon where trucks are parked, not only where the owner of the business lives. And so we've been as flexible and creative with that as possible while still respecting the spirit of the program. So it's so working at Evanston doesn't mean they're Evanston-based. They have to show that their trucks are regularly parked in Evanston? So for this program, we have accepted evidence that their trucks overnight park in Evanston. We have home-based businesses of folks who live in Evanston. And then under one circumstance, we allowed a PO box that is in Evanston to be applicable for this grant because of the way that it was explained to staff. And is there any chance just like if you have contracts in Evanston, that wouldn't be enough to be like if you have, you know, a certain percent of work that you're doing in Evanston um, without having to show that your trucks are parked in Evanston overnight? I'm just wondering if there's another because I think probably Evanston's, as we know, very expensive to live. Then I'm imagining many of our small business landscapers are not necessarily parking trucks overnight or live in Evanston, but maybe much of their business is in Evanston. I'm just wondering if there's any other any other possible flexibility around Evanston based. I don't know if that's has been an issue, but I would guess it might be. Just if we had a, a meeting at Robert Crown, it was an issue for one person. Um, it hasn't been an issue for any of the other companies that I've dealt with personally, and a lot of these companies are really small companies like the son and the father doing landscaping work in Evanston and like this is their primarily source of income like this isn't 20 30 people like a large crew I think like one of the largest ones was 15 had 15 people that were employed and primarily Evanston based too and Evanston based and employees Evanston residents Thank you. Councilmember Newsma, followed by Ravel, followed by Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, several points I want to make. Uh, first point is the bulk purchase is saving us about 20% uh, based on the numbers that uh, Kara Pratt shared with me earlier. So uh, I think we are really spending, you know, Evanston taxpayer dollars wisely here by going about this uh, or by doing the bulk purchase model. Uh, one of the things that uh, allows that to happen is we've standardized on one particular model though. So I just want to clarify, you know, Council Member Burns uh, uh, suggested earlier that by splitting this purchase amongst three different companies, we would allow perhaps three different models to be purchased, but that's not the case. Based on a conversation or some conversations uh, that staff had with uh, landscapers, there is an agreement that the uh, the manufacturer is steel or still S T I H L, uh, and so we're standardizing on that. We can get a bulk price. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The reason that the cost is split among three different 
suppliers is because each one of them has a small supply of this equipment. And so this is in order to respond to the landscaper's concern of urgency on this matter. So staff has taken that very seriously and gotten creative to be able to maximize the amount of available equipment as soon as possible by splitting the cost among three suppliers. Thank you. Second uh, question I have is how are these going to be distributed? And once the, uh, the landscaper has done all the appropriate paperwork, is this going to be a trade-in thing? Do they need to bring a, a gas power blower and they bring one and they bring a bad one and they get a good one? Or is it one per company? Is it one per employee? Like what kind of parameters are in place to uh, make sure we're, we're distributing these fairly and appropriately? Staff is still working out some of those details. The numbers in the memo are reflective of, as Clerk Mendoza mentioned, a meeting that we had last week, Monday, and all of the applications or communications that have come in in response to this issue. So it, it does include um, Senor Alvaro Gomez's request to the city mm -hmm. related to leaf blowers, and it includes most of the other folks that you've heard from who have asked for city support so I would for leaf want there to be some mechanism in place where we're not just if somebody comes to mm -hmm. the city and requests 15 leaf blowers that they can walk away with 15 leaf blowers like i want to make sure these are being fairly distributed um so it sounds like some you're still working on that so it is still considered a sustain evanston grant so there's still a contract between the city and the landscaping company that is signed and based on also feedback, we are including information about lithium battery recycling and having a commitment to responsibly handling those batteries. Then another similar concern I have is how can we make sure that the small companies aren't getting boxed out by the larger companies? Yep, that, that sounds like a concern that's beyond government control. Okay, so, but we can address that by making sure the small companies have uh, yeah, have a, a, a well-paved and well-lit and smooth runway to get into this program. Yes, um, Clerk Mendoza and city staff has done everything in our power to help and not only respond to requests of help, but proactively reach out to people and remind them right. and almost badger them that they you know, need to submit their paperwork and we're here to help and please come to our offices and here's our phone number here's my, like, text me, WhatsApp me. I'm in a WhatsApp group. I get calls all the time, texts all the time. We're like really, really, really helping with this. Is robust enough that, you know, we are reaching the folks that we need to, uh, that we're concerned about here. I can never confidently say that we're reaching everyone we need to reach. But we're doing a better job than we were a year ago. Yes. Right. Then my last question is this. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that spending 80000 Dollars is probably not going to get us enough equipment. Spending one hundred eighty thousand is that going to get us the right amount? Like, where did the where does that number come from? You know, is this a needs based or are we just kind of estimating that uh, that should be sufficient? The eighty thousand dollars requested is a reflection of the amount of feedback I could get before the deadline that this packet was due. We still do have an existing Sustain Evanston grant program that could handle case-by-case -case grants, but you're not getting the reduced price because it wouldn't be a part of the bulk purchase. Right. Based but on Councilmember Hedakadisi's request, I do imagine that that amount of funding would be used in its entirety by the Evanston landscaping community. Also based on the work that Clerk Mendoza has done, there are more and more landscaping companies registered every day. And Councilmember Hedakadisi, if you're still online, does that, uh, would you agree with that? I think so. I mean, the two of us were at the initial meeting with the landscapers and there was probably about 40 businesses. And I, I can't remember the exact number of businesses that showed up at Crown um, last week, but um, I, you know, I my, my main concern in the, the reason for doubling the number was to give staff the flexibility if we do run out um, to not have to come back to us. Um, I could imagine that there might be some leftover 
Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if in a month from now, um, you know, while, you know, Kara is, uh, you know, fulfilling these grants that we run out and we still have some people on the, you know, on the outside looking in. And at that point, we'd have to address it again. But I, I think that um, hopefully this number will, will get us to where we need to be. Right. And so your motion is to approve up to an additional $100,000 if needed. Yeah. If needed. Yeah. Great. And this, and this money would come from reserves? Yes. Right. The money that had not been previously allocated to uh, sustain Evanston, to sustainability or anything in anybody's department. It's just reserve money. Yep. That's, okay. Thank you. That's uh, my questions have been answered. Uh, Council Member Ravel, followed by Reed, followed by Harris. Uh, well, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to go to this last point that Council Member Newsom is discussing and wondering whether, rather than drawing from our reserves, um, at some point in the very near future, I believe we're getting some money from Northwestern that's earmarked for our climate. Our climate work, our CARP work, and I'm wondering whether that wouldn't be a more appropriate source for this additional funding. What, wonder, what, wonder what my colleagues think. I'll, I'll weigh in here, and I would like to spend uh, CARP money, uh, really paying close attention to the dollar per ton of carbon ratio. Um, which would be an argument against spending that money on leaf blowers. Yeah. What are you saying? I'll wait until it's my turn. Okay. Um, I guess I, I worry about, I mean, every, every time we turn around, we want to, we have proposals to take money from reserves. So I'm, I'm more inclined to um, say we should um, take some of it, take this money from our climate, our CARB fund. And, and we could calculate, you know, savings from, we know, we know that gas powered leaf blowers emit bad stuff. So anyway, that's, that's where our, my preference is. Council member Reed followed by Harris. Um, I'm mostly speaking to the larger items. So if, I, I don't know if council member Harris is speaking specifically to the hundred thousand dollars, I'm ready to vote on that if, but, and then want to speak to the larger item. Thank you. Um, Councilor Harris. Thank you. Um, so uh, I guess I was a little conf confused. So the additional 100000 is coming out of reserves and not the Sustain Evanston program? Yes, that was the proposal of Councilmember Hannah Cuddy's. Right, okay. Which would leave you with the 250 minus the 80. Correct. Though there's also $250,000 from economic development that goes to Sustain Evanston, though to date we're now over $300,000 already allocated for that program. Okay. Okay. So that was my question. So since it's reserved, my question really is mute because, mute because um, I was going to say, did you have $100,000 allocated for other things for us to come in and say, but it doesn't matter. Back to council. Thank you. I will, oops, sorry. Um, at this time, no one who wants to speak to the amendment is requesting to speak for the first time. So we go back for a second opportunity to Council Member Hattikadis with two minutes left. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, go ahead. He can go, but actually, I'm going to speak to this uh, item. I, All right, I hold on. Then let's one. go. Council Member Reed first, then. Yeah, I, I decided, you know, some people's votes, if you don't vote for this, then. Um, so here, I'll say this. One, um, I, I, I get it with the, uh, with the need for translating the document. I think that's critically important. I've been the kid in a Spanish household who's had to do that, that translation uh, service, so I understand it. But I also want to uh, note that, you know, I'm the chair of the Reparation Subcommittee on Economic Development, and we've had experts come in and uh, share their, um, you know, from the county and from the state, uh, issues that the black community has had with access and grants. And there's one woman who really laid it out for us and was straightforward with it and said, look, the, speaking of the, about the black community, we have too many businesses that aren't registered, that don't have insurance, that 
don't have their EINs. And this stuff is important and it's mandatory and it's for the reasons that Corporation Council uh, listed. And it's for a whole host of other reasons. It's to make sure that if somebody causes damage to somebody's property or, you know, or, or if there is someone who gets, you know, injured or hurt, that we know who we can hold accountable. So I do think the registration is important. Um, I want to note that um, we have translation services, to my knowledge. I know that we used to where at any office they could pick up the phone and call the translation services and then have the service do a live translation. That's my understanding. So I understand that we don't have someone who speaks Spanish directly in the at the permit desk, but we do have the service available to be able to 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 translate with folks, to my knowledge. Um, also, I, I really do. I, I appreciate that staff is looking to be flexible with this funding. I think we need to really reserve this funding for Evanston based businesses, not someone who gets a P.O. box in Evanston. You know, it, you know, our job as the Evanston City Council is not to protect the interests of every single person in Cook County and in the in the region. We need to protect Evanston businesses. We need to make sure that folks who live in Evanston have the resources they need to continue to live in Evanston. Um, and, you know, if if some businesses that are based in Chicago or Skokie just can't operate here anymore and the slack is picked up by Evanston based businesses, I don't see that as a bad thing. I, I, I do think that is a, a good thing. Um, and then also to Councilmember Newsom's point about one, I, I support Councilmember Ravel's uh, question, uh, as request to have it come from uh, the the NU CARP funding. I think it's five hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Okay, so I, I certainly support that, and we should be getting that money tomorrow, right? Yesterday, a couple months ago. Um, so the money should be there. I, I I do agree, you know, that you know generally we should look at you know the getting the most bang for our buck there. But I do think equity as it being one of our council goals, um, that we should weigh that in. And this is a, an equity issue um, as well. And if we're not, if we're so, if, if we are to say that this doesn't rise to the level of the city needing to contribute funding for this, or it's not worthy of our CARP spending because the bang for the buck, then why is this one of the first policies that we're engaging in around climate action if it's not that you know um, effective is from a carbon um, emission standpoint. Um, so I, I support the hundred thousand dollar request. I, I hope that we hone in on this and make sure there's only Evanston based businesses and we're a bit tighter. We have we need to translate with uh, the form, uh, but we also need to hold folks accountable to getting registered, following the rules, and and um, you know playing by the same uh, rules that that everyone else has to. I haven't heard anything that was too onerous yet. I mean, the insurance and all that stuff seems like standard practice. I understand that it takes some time to to get there, but um, I, I think it's necessary. And realistically, folks should have been registered um, likely years ago. So thank you. Council Member Yeah, Yeah, Chair, I don't know if this is a question for you or Sarah or Luke or whoever, but residents made it clear that they want the quiet, and whether it's quiet or pollution, they want compliant landscaping equipment used. Businesses made it clear it's very expensive and they want to stay in business. What's the cheapest way to get those overlapping goals met? Because if we're going to spend money on enforcement anyway, it's just cheaper to buy people equipment and figure out a way to do it. So how do we, I don't think residents care as long as it's quiet or not polluting. I don't think businesses necessarily want to be non-compliant. They've expressed that there's a financial reason why it's difficult for them. And then we're looking at hiring people to do increased enforcement, which seems like a super inefficient way to approach this problem. How do we just get compliant equipment in the hands of landscape businesses that are doing business in Evanston, whether they're Evanston based or not? Because they're Evanston based for the time that they are in Evanston blowing with whatever equipment they're blowing with. The cheapest and best way to solve this problem is the solution that I provided to you in your packet. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, this time no one is asking to speak for a first time, so we go back for a second crack, starting with Council Member Hedekaris with two minutes left. Okay, I, I just wanted to add one quick thing, um, just along the discussion about registered um, businesses. Um, you know, so when we were talking with a lot of the longtime um, business owners, you know, they've operated in Evanston for years and years. Um, some of them were under the impression that they were already registered based on the amount of taxes they've been paying, specifically their wheel tax on their commercial vehicles. They're like, well, you, you tax us for our vehicles. How do you not know that we're operating a business? So there's a big, a big piece of, of education that we have to do here to like kind of um, demystify what um, all the you know fees and licensing means, um, and so you know that's you know just one one example, and you know one thing that's kind of um, you know one thing I've I've seen online is you know people um, characterizing the run registered businesses as like scoff laws or um, illegitimate because they're not registered. I mean, these are just folks that want to work and they've been doing this for years and, you know, they did not know all these hoops that they had to um, jump through. And I think, you know, going forward, we're going to be in a much better place, but um, I just wanted to speak to that just for a bit. Councilmember Burns with two and a half minutes left. Um, first point I want to make is, is, um, we we should have application. We shouldn't have any issue having applications in any language of our choice at this point. I mean, there's tons of tools, and I know um, many of them, especially before AI, weren't as as great. But now with AI, and I've tested this a lot of different language on native speakers. It's like it's perfect. So, and it's that seems like a better way to to do this as opposed to um, staff taking up. I mean, we can. Staff could be there to support, but I just I want everybody to know that technology has advanced to the point where we should at least be able to provide as a first pass an application in whatever language uh, our any resident needs, not just on this issue, but any other issue. And then, of course, still uh, provide staff support. So, again, that's not a criticism of any decision that was made. That's just saying the technology is there and it works um, to. Um, I, I just want to be clear, by Evanston-based business, we're going by the guidelines we've already established for what an Evanston-based business is, and I don't think that's clear. We already, it's, it's you have to be in, in Evanston for at least a year, right? Is that what we're going by, or do we create a new kind of guideline for that? Because from an economic development standpoint, from, you know, that's the way we, that's what we consider an Evanston enterprise or Evanston-based business. So... Typically, with other sustained Evanston applicants that have a physical commercial presence in Evanston, we do require sufficiently or significantly more paperwork related to proving how long they've been in Evanston and how long they plan to be in Evanston related to leases and history of operation. Because this is a unique case and it's often home-based businesses, we're not, that is a piece of red tape that we have removed in this process. That being said, we are still making sure that these businesses are Evanston based. Yeah, cuz I want to be clear that that you can have a home based business, right? So that that in and of itself shouldn't be a barrier. A lot of people work from home and um you know, but now that I know that I, I just want to make sure that you know, I don't know if we need to take a vote of that, but I, I want to make sure that these are Evanston based businesses. That is really important to me for reasons that Councilman Reed said if if, if another business cannot compete here, but Evanston-based businesses can. I see that as a good thing. And whether the year guidelines that we use for economic development purposes works or not, I'll let kind of staff decide. But I do think it's important to have guidelines and to enforce them. Um, so that's one. Uh, also just want to thank Kara, because so Kara, you saw the email that I sent to you. Um, there was, I believe there was, yeah. And I was trying to figure out, like, do we need to meet? This is essentially what I wanted to meet about, because when we ended the discussion at our last meeting, we didn't really we didn't get here. And even at that point, I knew, all right, well, we're short. Right. There's some money that we need to 
dedicate towards this. And so I'm happy that that you've worked with uh, um, the uh, the businesses as well as Councilmember Hedekatis, uh, Clerk Mendoza on, on kind of coming up with what what we see here. Um, and I, and I also want to add because you care, I've, I've brought this up a few times, and and hopefully I actually don't have to continue to do this. The the one thing that I, I continue to say as we implement climate action and resilience, our climate action resiliency plan is subsidy programs. Subsidy, 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 subsidy. I'm going to say it a million times. We should not be planning this after the fact. And that's and the reason why I keep bringing up subsidy is because, again, the last person that was in your seat, and I believe I know you agree with this as well, already said, spelled out that what we need to implement this is help help with technical support and subsidies. And that's why I keep saying that over and over again. We should not be creating subsidy programs for these things after the fact. So please, let's get ahead of this next time because I, I just want to make it clear. That's what I mean by that. It's, it's not just the carbon impact, Councilmember Newsma, to your point. We shouldn't just be looking at how much you know carbon we're removing or um, diverting, right? The impact is also on small businesses. And those are the folks that I'm, I've always been concerned about because there's a cost to this, not just a cost to our environment, but a cost to small businesses, which we know are kind of struggling to make do. And that's why I would love to see this uh, kind of baked into the proposals that, that come to us next time. I don't know if there's anything quite like this that'll happen. I'm, I'm sure there will be, but please let's get the subsidy programs into the worked into the programs uh, so that we're not, that we're not uh, doing it after the fact. Uh, but but also just want to thank you for being responsive to to not only what the community has asked for but things that discussions we've had up here. I appreciate this and and look forward to supporting it. Uh, Clerk Mendoza, I just wanted to speak to the equity aspect of your comments earlier, Councilmember Reed. We do have a language line, but there's nothing in the city of Evanston that requires our staff to use it, or there's no training that allows our staff to be culturally competent or to inform them on how to help someone who may not have English as their first language. So there has to be accountability from who that accountability comes from, I don't know. But the only reason why my office has, has been having to help residents of this community to do this is because they can, they can come to my office and get the support that they deserve. These are people that have been living in our community for 20, 30 years. These are not people that just moved here yesterday. And so where's the accountability for language access in our community? Okay. Continuing with second cracks, Council Member Ravel with four minutes left. Um, well, I'd like to ask Council Member Heracaris whether he would accept a friendly amendment to his amendment to um, specify that this $100,000 $100, would come from our CARP fund, our, our about to be majorly replenished CARP fund. Yeah, I was actually had my hand raised. I was going to make my own friendly amendment to change it to the CARP fund. But yeah, I, I will totally accept that. Second. So uh, Council Member Ravel makes a Substitute motion, is that no, right? No, no, no. I think it's a friendly amendment. We've done that yeah, before. If, yeah, if Council Member Heracaris agrees, then that's, that is the amendment. Oh, just it just becomes that. Yeah, I think. Without objection. Wild. Okay. So uh, Council Member Ravel makes a friendly amendment. Uh, so to uh, effectively replace the funding source. Uh, Described in Council Member Hedekatis' amendment uh, so that it is no longer uh, reserves, but rather the CARP implementation fund. Council Member Reed seconds. Uh, is there any discussion on the um, this new amendment? Now we would just be it's, voting on the amendment. All right. Okay. So, so then, just to make sure I understand, is it, the vote now would amend the underlying thing with this, correct? Okay. So would the clerk please take the roll oh. on this new amendment? No, it's this. It's the same old amendment that Councilmember Hedekatis made at the beginning, just tweaked. Yeah, no, understood. Oh, okay. But So, so, so the, the question is, are we ready to vote on the 
uh, are we basically finished with all this discussion about the amendment, which maybe we are. There's a couple folks in line. Looks like Councilmember Hedekatis is no longer in line because he was in line to do what just happened. Is anyone else in line to speak to the amendment? Seeing none, will the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Suffordan? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedekatis? Aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the item is amended as just described. Council member suffered in with three minutes and 50 seconds left. Okay, just real quick, because I don't want this coming back all the time. How do we put a bow on this? Tie penalties and enforcement to the property owner rather than the landscaping company. Get compliant equipment in the hands of companies doing business in Evanston and save money on enforcement, which is just going to be a silly whack-a-mole game. It's never going to work. Can we can we come up with something in the next few months that'll do that and put this to bed forever? Absolutely. Ike Ogwo, Director of Health and Human Services uh, Department. Uh, in terms of the property owner, um, we have in the past fined and even brought to administrative adjudication property owners who violated the, the ordinance. And it is something that we will be increasing significantly uh, this this time around, uh, not to only educate our landscapers, but to continue to educate our uh, property owners. And any time there's a violation, so to speak, we always make sure that we enlighten our property owners by sending them a notice about, about the ordinance. Uh, but it is something that we will continue to improve on. It is something that we are going to significantly work on to make sure that they are continuing to be educated uh, about the ordinance. I appreciate that. I just want, is there a more efficient way to do it? Have anyone who has landscaping done for hire to sign an affidavit that they will be the responsible party for compliance by their landscape company, something like that, because enforcement's not going to work. We've talked about the unfortunate interactions it creates between residents and landscape companies. That is like a potential social liability for all of us. Is there some way, also taking into account the problems that have been described by the landscapers, that the equipment is less efficient, right, or less desirable right now than gas powered equipment. So they're not getting a great deal if they get this, I mean, maybe the technology will get better, but like can the, the real beneficiaries will be Evanston taxpaying residents who are the ones who said they don't want the noise and pollution of gas powered leaf blowers. There's something that we can come up with. I mean, there are a, a number of strategies, as you mentioned, an affidavit signed by the landscapers. This is something uh, that we embarked on. An affidavit signed by the property owner. I, we got to tie this to the property owner. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a similar situation where compliant companies are being undercut by non-compliant companies and enforcement isn't catching up. Right. I mean, the information that we, we drive across is for our property owners to continue to use registered uh, landscapers. Um, and what we've done in a couple of years, which I think can be instrumental here, is also have the landscapers provide some type of affidavit that they will continue to comply with, with the ordinance. We did this about two, two years ago. Uh, we did get a number of landscapers who it was a pledge so to speak it was a pledge where they pledged that they will continue to abide by the elements of the ordinance it is something that we can revisit uh, but i think going going forward we will significantly continue to enlighten the property owners regarding this 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 ordinance um, and it's something that we, we've done, but I think we, we can definitely do something. Okay. Have we gone beyond a pledge and required a bond? Or, I mean, let's just, let's, let's be the heroes here and get this thing done and be done with it forever. Because there's all sorts of problems with this. Enforcement's not going to work. And it's not, I mean, it's not your fault it's not going to work. It just isn't going to work. The only thing that's going to work is having it set up so that landscapers doing business in Evanston have access to subsidized equipment that will be compliant. Right. And, and, and that's a proposal that has been brought forward to city council to, to approve. I think by handing them the apparatus, the gadgets that they need will make this successful uh, to, to a degree. Uh, what if it's going to be 100%? I, I'm not sure, but I, I think it can definitely 
make make a difference by providing them the gadgets that they need okay. for, for for this type of work. And of course, in, enforcement. And there have been a number of strategies that we've employed. It is quite a new new program. We've had people from other jurisdictions asking us how we have been able to implement the activities we have in order to enforce it. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think we've made some significant okay. strides. Is there anybody else who has a better idea that we can use? Well, I mean, we've modified our enforcement. Um, so the administrative adjudication process requires submission of a photo or video to verify that the violation occurred. Uh, there's a jurisdiction in, in Washington where they have to submit, was it two, three affidavits to administrative adjudication uh, for that particular case to be vetted. That's not what we're requiring here. Our modification is just complete an affidavit which will be submitted, then that will be submitted, which will be submitted to us, then in turn it will go to the administrative adjudication and, that, and the hearing officer will then vet the case to see if that individual warrants a ticket or not. So that's one of the items that we have implemented. And I mean, so far so good. I would say um, in the past, I say the past month, the number of complaints that we've received have dwindled in comparison to last year. One particular month, we got up to 500 complaints. Month It has been dwindled over the month. So there has been some success in that regard. I okay. Say. I mean, the real measure is if violations are what is dwindling, right? If people don't bother with the complaint process or people don't bother becoming compliant, like we haven't achieved an objective, which from the people I heard from who, again, like I was shocked, but I was told this is their number one priority when this term started. They just want silence. And some care more about the pollution piece, but I think truthfully, like silence is the issue. Right. So. I think it's incumbent upon us to do whatever we can to give the people who live here the diminished noise that they're requesting. Right. And so I just want I, I just want to say that like we got to come up with something that puts the onus not on the companies, right. but on the property owners, because that's the only bedrock. This is the house way that we're going to be able to enforce this. Otherwise, we're just chasing trucks around and it's not going to work and it has potential for adverse interactions. Absolutely. I mean, point of information, that's just a motion. I mean, that, I, I just, I don't want that's the public to think special that order of business, potentially whatever it is, I don't want the public to think that's so out of reach. Like, that's just one person up there saying, yeah, let's do that. Or refer. And I'm okay to do it. But I just, sometimes we take longer than need be, I think, on just small. Cool. Shit, so. yeah. <laughs> we take longer than need be because everyone up here talks ever. I'm saying, please solve the problem. Solve their problem, solve the resident's problem, come back with something. You're the director. You have to deal with the enforcement. The enforcement is not working and it's not efficient. The reason it takes forever is because everyone talks so long. Let's just solve a problem and then move on to a new thing, man. So, for example, you could say right now, I would like to make a motion. So, so let, let's let's both maintain order. In other words, the person with the floor speaks and also decorum. In other words, speak appropriately. Councilor Reception, are you done? Are we going to solve a problem or are we just going to talk forever and then complain about how long we talk? I'm saying, Ike, solve the problem. Help me understand how I can help you. Look at what other communities do. Send me an email. Let's talk about it. It'll be a motion. I can't say wave a magic wand and solve the problem. I'm saying let's, let's try to solve the problem that they've addressed, that people who were here before complaining about noise asked us to solve. Let's actually solve a problem. Make a motion. You like, got the floor. help me help you solve a problem. Do you need a, a deadline? Can we work on it? What I'm saying is let's not talk about leaf blowers every third meeting. Let's solve the problem. The clerk brought up problems with communication. That's part of it. It is a huge problem. Can we resolve to solve the total problem, not just individual aspects of it at every meeting? It seems like it's inefficient. Well, I think that the reason why we are having this conversation is due to our enforcement activities. Based on the number of tickets that were issued is how our landscapers were able to galvanize. Um, and that's was at the human services meeting that we provided an update regarding how we have been enforcing. So even though enforcement doesn't appear to be that significant, I think we've actually made some strides. There are a number of strategies that we've employed, communication, postcards, even patrolling areas of high non-compliance rates. We've done all, the, all these things. And 
they've been proven to be successful to a degree. We continue to tweak, continue to edit our activities to make sure that it's amply and enforced. And by providing the proposal of today uh, of giving gadgets to our landscapers, that's one part of it to, so to solve this, this issue. Um, there aren't a lot of communities who are enforcing it the way that we are, we're enforcing it. Some, like I mentioned, require affidavit upon affidavit for a case to, to be vetted. All we're asking now is for an affidavit to be submitted, then I will go to administrative adjudication, and the landscape or the property owner, based on the outcomes from the hearing officer, will be fined or give, given a warning. So we have employed a, a number of strategies, and we continue to seek for other angles that we can pursue in order to continue to, to enforce this. Right. And we also have to keep, keep, keep in mind that's only one staff member who's doing all of this, doing the patrol, doing the, the writing of the tickets, education, you, you name it. And one of the proposals is also to get another staff member to aid in this effort to make sure that we are covering most angles of enforcement. Right. Like what I'm saying is help us help you and that staff member work less hard to achieve a better result. And I'm not saying that you've been opposed to that, but that's that's what needs to happen. Otherwise, we're going to have landscapers here every now and then. We're going to have residents here every now and then. And we're never going to solve this problem. That's what we're here to do, solve a problem. It's a solvable problem. Right. And and we, we are trying our ample best. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I don't doubt your efforts. I just want to make them more efficient and make it easier for you so you can move on to more important things. Uh, Council Member Reed with 40 seconds left. Thank you. Um, I, will, I will move that uh, we have a special order of business at our June meeting to uh, to work on enforcement updates. What else are we missing? Enforcement updates. Which June meeting? Uh, the second meeting in June. Is that enough time for you? I mean, there is, it's, or July. You August, all are the ones who care. have the workload. You tell us. When can you present something that will solve their problem, solve the resident's problem, well, have a credible number we can put on it, and then we can talk about funding sources? Well, a, a June meeting is, is fine with me. And as okay. I indicated, the complaints have dwindled from, from November. I mean, that this month, we probably have less than 20 complaints that we've responded to. So- Okay, June gives you enough time? Yeah, that's okay. more, more than enough time. Perfect. Okay, and it, is there anything else that we're missing? Enforcement updates. I'd like to look at the the updates around the city and golf courses. I'd like to open that up. But what else are we missing here, Clerk Mendoza? I, mean, I would suggest it's not essential that the exact language of the. No, motion. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just categories, just big picture ideas. Enforcement updates, Clerk Mendoza. Are we missing something else? Language at the city manager. I think that needs to be on you. I don't think we need an ordinance around that. We have the tools. I think you just need to make sure staff understands to use it. Um, okay. So then that is my motion. Is there oh. a second? Second. Councilmember Reed moves that the second uh, regular city council meeting in June 2024 have a special order of business to uh, include an update on enforcement of the leaf blower issue. Uh, questions about uh, outstanding exceptions to the leaf blower ordinance, uh, language access, and any other leaf blower updates needed. Council Member and, Suffered and point in of order, I want to be clear, not just like a discussion. I'm looking for an ordinance to be put in front of us um, that we can take our time on, but I want language in front of us, not just a loose discussion that maybe gets held off for another couple months, uh, to Council Member Suffered's point of just dealing with this. All right, so Council Member Reed's motion is for there to be, for that agenda item to be accompanied by draft language of an ordinance. Uh, I mean, it, there might be, be amendments to our current ordinance. Right, that will, right, 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 exactly. that will be responsive to whatever as yet unclear items will surface as the um, conversation is taking shape. Council Member Suffered in seconds. Will the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns is not here. Councilmember Suffered? Aye. 
Council Member Ravel. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Hedakaris. Aye. With seven voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the special order of business has been created for the second June meeting of 2024. Okay, if I can use my last, maybe hope 10, 20 seconds, whatever I have. 15. Um, 15 seconds, all right. I, I have an issue with what's before us. I, I really want staff, council votes on ordinances and resolutions. We don't vote on memorandums and there is no resolution in front of us and there's a key amendment that I want to make but how can I make it when we're just, there's, there's nothing before us. There's just a memo. There's no resolution. Um, and so one, I don't know how we're even, A7. for A7. I, when I looked in the packet, there's no resolution. It's just a memo. Yeah, because, yeah but it, because it's a purchase. But purchases are, council authorizes items, whether it's expenditure of money through resolutions. It, corporation, I mean, come on. How do we, if, what is council? I mean, I think on? everyone's right here. Uh, staff is correctly describing our practice you're correctly describing our practice as insane. So I think going forward, we should probably do it differently. Um, I agree, voting on a memo has is, is made me uncomfortable since day one. It's sort of midway through my list of things to worry about. Um, okay. But I agree, it's a, it's, a, it's a messed up way to do things. Yeah, yeah, oh, but so, because here's what I wanna do. I, I wanna make sure that we are clearly restricting these, the, the expenditures that we're gonna make. One, I don't even know what now what Councilmember Hedekatis amended to make it 180,000 and what we amended to make it the, but beyond that, I, I want to make sure that Evanston-based businesses are the only ones receiving. Th that's already in the code. Is, no, because we let somebody with the PO box. That, that's about the determination of Evanston-based businesses. Go ahead, Ms. Pratt. I can discuss the P.O. Box matter in more detail, though I, I do hope that City Council trusts staff in making a decision like that. There was an issue of theft of checks in an existing Evanston address, so they're at an Evanston P.O. Box. So I but hope that that is significant evidence that they're an Evanston-based business. Furthermore, if you would like more evidence about how we operate with Sustain Evanston, all of our information is online. Our program agreement, which is vetted by Corporation Council is online that has all of these restrictions. So please do trust staff that we are doing this correctly. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm not, it, I feel like, whatever. I'm, I'm not not trusting staff. I'm just, based on what I heard, there's a P.O. box. And based on what some of my colleagues have said is that, uh, and so I know I'm beyond my time, but that uh, businesses that operate, just operate in the city of Evanston or just park their trucks in the city of Evanston would qualify, whereas you know, if you, yes, if you rent a space and you're parking your truck at the space and you're registered in Evanston with the city and the state and whoever, then yes, you're an Evanston-based business. But if you're just, you live in Skokie, your, your home base is in Skokie, and you just drive your trucks into Evanston and cut people's lawns and then leave, you're not an Evanston-based business. And just because you have a P.O. box here, to, unless that's officially where your business is registered, you're not an Evanston-based business. I think we need to tighten it up. We need to tighten it up for folks who are paying property taxes, folks who are paying rent, and contributing to our committee. Okay, I'm done. Uh, the final speaker with a minute and 45 seconds left is Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. So I agree. I hope we can wrap up this um, these, this ongoing discussion about the leaf blowers. And I would have to say, can we modify our enforcement so we're only issuing violations? I think that would help to the property owners. Um, and I think we should look at a business that so we're no longer issuing because I to the um, – the landscapers, I think that does create a really um, messy, awkward social situation in our city. Um, and I think immobile, or rather mobile businesses are very different than static immobile businesses. So like when we give, you know, I don't know, Sean Coley a million dollars for his VW, but he lives in Skokie, I think we have to look at businesses that are mobile differently. So maybe it is a PO box, but maybe there's some other way we decide, you know, to Tom's point a little bit, how can we get them the electric powered leaf blower more easily? I don't necessarily agree for mobile services that they have to live in Evanston. I think it's a very different, you know, they have a business. And if their business is predominantly in Evanston or we decide a certain percent of their business is in Evanston, to me that should be considered Evanston-based just like most of the other businesses in Evanston where the property owners don't live here. So, um, and then finally, I don't know if we can look back at, I'm sorry? The business is here. So are these businesses, they just move around though. They're, right. they're lamp, anyway. So, um, and then lastly, I don't know if we can revisit parking services. At one point, that conversation was open to look at enforcement using 
um, Parkinson before they went into negotiations. I know for contract negotiations, that was a consideration, but then we just moved to hiring this one person to look at during the se seasonal times, they would prioritize, you know, when out and about, since there's so many of them out and about, prioritize issuing tickets um, regarding leaf blowers over, say, a parking ticket. Just it'd be nice if we could look into that. That would, without adding cost, um, increase the possibility of greater enforcement. Just plenty of information under your definition, Amazon would be an Evanston-based business because they drive trucks here. Okay, if the majority of their business, I don't think it is in Evanston. Um, so. uh, the city manager, I think, has a quick comment. Just very briefly, I just want to thank Manager Pratt, her team, Clerk Mendoza, other members of community development for their hard work um, to get us to a better place. We do have, uh, we will take care of the form. The form issue was brought up tonight, making sure there's a Spanish version of that form. Um, and thank you, Clerk Mendoza, for your comments about um, language line and access and services. I will work with directors and managers this week to ensure that they are ensuring that their staff are leveraging those services. So thank you. Will the clerk please take the roll? A7. Uh, this is on A7 as amended by Council Member uh, Ravella Caras. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Harris? Yes. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferden? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Heracaris? Aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against the motion carries in A7, uh, so the approval is approved as amended, which now uh, will not exceed $180,000, the additional $100,000 in increment will uh, come from the uh, CARP Implementation Fund. We now have a fun interlude. Uh, happy intermission, everybody. Uh, we uh, passed the, um, the uh, consent agenda in error because two additional items should have been removed. Items A16 and A17 should have been removed because they both... Um, are seeking suspension of the rules to allow for introduction and action to occur tonight. So the I horrifying remove, thing that a request is a, is a yeah. I will uh, move reconsideration of the consent agenda. Second. Council member Reed moves reconsideration of the consent agenda. Council member Harris seconds. The clerk please take the roll. Yep. Council member Kelly. Aye. Council member Harris. Aye. Council member Newsma. Aye. Council member Burns. Aye. Council member <clears throat> Sufferden. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hakaris? Aye. And then with, with eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the consent agenda is uh, reconsidered. Now, would someone. I will move uh, suspension of the rules for items uh, uh, A16 and A17. Do we need to remove those? Re no, we can consent? just suspend the rules too. and pass yeah, the whole thing. We'll have to do that too. But whatever order is fine. My, my plan was just suspend the rules, pass the whole thing again. Oh, I see. No, no, no. The others, the others are liquor related, but they're not. They're not rule suspensions. So, t so typically, if someone is, if like a business is trying to apply for an application, so we don't create two weeks of extra red tape, we suspend that rule. But it's not like we suspend every liquor related rules for every liquor related things. The others are like, are like policy changes that I think are like any other ordinance that would get to. Let's and do sixteen and. No, those are separate. Those are still off the consent agenda. Correct. As they were before. Yeah. I just wanted to solve this problem as soon as it came to my attention. And quick question on this, uh, if I'm recognized. But I think I'll, uh, I'll let, move. No, let, let's, let's, hold, hold on. Let, you made a motion. Let's see if there's a second. Yeah. I, I move so to suspend the rules for item A16 and A17. All right, Council Member Reed moves suspension of the rules so that ordinances 39 0 24 and 40 0 24 may both be passed tonight for introduction and action. Uh, is your comment on that rule suspension vote? Yes. Yes, it is. Council Member Reed. Um, well, let's take a vote on it first and then I'll make a comment on the consent agenda. Uh, will the clerk please take the roll on the motion to suspend the rules? Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Harris? Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferden? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. And Councilmember Heracaris? Aye. 
With eight voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the rules are suspended. Now, Councilmember Reed, do you have a motion to make I, on the whole thing? Yes, I will move that we uh, move the consent agenda minus the items that we pulled earlier, um, which are at this point, it leaves A12, A13, A14, HS1, and R1 off the consent agenda. And A7. And A7. I mean, it was, yeah, we already yeah, voted on yeah. it, so it's kind of moot at this point. Well, it was amended, so I don't want to. Sure. And A7. Councilmember Reed moves approval of the consent agenda with the exception of items A7, A12, A13, A14, HS1, and R2, and with the proviso that items A16 and A17, ordinances 39-0-24 and 40-0-24, are both being uh, passed uh, as for final action on this consent agenda pursuant to the rule suspension that just occurred. Councilmember Harris seconds. Councilmember Reed. Thank you. Um, one... This has become standard practice with this council with liquor licenses to suspend the rules. Uh, I, I can't think of a single time in my six or seven years up here that we haven't suspended the rules for a liquor license. So maybe we just need to change the rules overall and just say that it's one and done. But caveat to that is I'm concerned that we may be potentially violating state law overall because I've read specifically for an ordinance in state law it requires two readings. So I don't know if we have the authority to even do this. And so I, I'm just putting in a request that legal look into that. I, I can find it. I read this a while ago and have never brought it up. But um, I, I do think we need to look into that rule as to whether we even can suspend and, and pass an ordinance with one reading. Um, and then two, if we can, then we need to just change that for liquor licenses because we always do it. So that's it. Would the clerk please take the roll on the newly augmented or the newly, um, the newly made honest consent agenda? Councilmember Kelly, Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Newsma, aye. Councilmember Burns, aye. Councilmember Sufferden, aye. Councilmember Ravel, aye. Councilmember Reed, aye. Councilmember Hadakaris, aye. With eight voting in favor and none voting against the motion carries, the consent agenda with the except, exception of items A7, A12, A13, A14, HS1, and R1 passes. Uh, again, reminding folks that items A16 and A17 pass for introduction and action both. Continuing now on item A12, Council Member Newsman, do you want to make a motion? Um, and if I can request, we can just move A12, 13, and 14 at... Mr. Mayor, I will uh, move items A12, 13, and 14, which are as follows, Ordinance 33024, amending city code section 346, classification and license fees, to add subsection L3 for a grocery store liquor license, and Ordinance 34024, amending section 346F3 of the city code to allow the sale of wine for off-premises consumption. And Ordinance 35024, amending city code section 346D to allow alcohol service to begin at 7 a.m. Councilmember Newsom moves introduction of ordinances 33, 34, and 35-0-24. Is there a second? second. Councilmember Reed seconds. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Reed. Thank you. Um, I'll start with item A12, Ordinance 33024. I checked with Corporation Council Ruggie on this earlier, and the definition of grocery store, um, as according to our code, is broad enough that a 7-Eleven convenience store would count as a grocery store um, under this, so long as it fits within the square footage requirements, or it seems like if 7-Eleven would fit, then another convenience store would also meet these criteria. I don't know if the definition of grocery store is either we're fine with this definition that's very, very loose and means that just about anybody that starts selling deodorant and oranges and bananas is um, a, a grocery store, or I think we need to tighten the definition a, a, a bit. So I personally am not a fan of that, or I, maybe I'm fine with it. I have a liquor store. I mean, I have a gas station that sells a lot of these items that wants a liquor license, and this would be a better option for them. But I also want to make sure that we're clear on what this means, and I don't want to see certain businesses denied and certain businesses approved uh, because our code is unclear. Uh, Councilor Ruggie? 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, just quickly, so with liquor licensing, um, when an applicant applies for a liquor license, the city looks at the primary use of their business. Uh, so if the primary um, purpose of their business is um, grocery retail, it would qualify as a grocer. Uh, so a 7-Eleven, a convenience store, they are primarily um, selling uh, grocery type items. So that would be um, the primary purpose of their business. This um, change in the liquor license, it, there was a gap in the square footage. So we had a liquor license for a grocery store from zero to 2,000 square feet, and then I think um, over 4,000. So this bridges that gap between the 2,000 and 4,000 square feet. Councilmember Newsmith, uh, Councilmember Ravel. So, <clears throat> So we're we're dealing with A12, A13, A14 all at once. Uh, correct. Okay. That was the motion that got Because I guess my I had a, I had a question and concern about A13, and the sale of wine for off premises consumption. That's I don't know. It sounds sounds strange. Well, I guess as the chair of the liquor board, I can speak to um, this. This is a this was a change that was proposed by um, Nina Barrett, the owner of Bookends and Beginnings. As you may recall, uh, this body voted to give, uh, well, I think actually to create this F3 license with Bookends and Beginnings in mind and then to grant it to Bookends and Beginnings. And so they have like a, I guess, sort of like a very small bar almost in the, in the lower level. Uh, the most of the utilization, I think, has been for things like readings and other events. Um, they have a particular product, which I think might be the only alcoholic product they sell, which is essentially a single serving little tiny wine bottle. Um, and what they're hoping to do is package it as a part of like a gift item. Um, you know, for instance, for Valentine's Day or for or for Mother's Day, where they were, where they initially proposed Valentine's Day when they approached us and now they're proposing Mother's Day. Um, uh, where, you know, there would be like a bag with a book or two that are maybe ho holiday appropriate and then a little bottle of wine. Um, I don't think there's any particular extenuating circumstance, either arguing for or against, but that, that's what they're talking about here. But conceivably, somebody could go to this bar in the in bookends and beginning buy it buy one of these little wine things start to drink it and then walk out of the store with the rest of it on un, un, drunken wander down the street i don't think that's ever legal i think that's against our open container laws that we've talked about up here at some length and not changed uh and i just i don't think that's um i mean i guess i should i should i don't think that's something that we ever would allow uh, that's correct, Mayor. That would not be allowed. So, based on open consum um, the open container, they could they would have to finish it if they open it. I think the purpose here is that it's they sell it and then it's removed off site to be consumed, you know, legally wherever they they would like, but mm -hmm. not to half consume and then just walk down the street with it. And conceivably, we'll have other uh, enterprises deciding to get this provision added to their, yeah. their, their store. This already happened. Mm, I don't no. know. I think this is the only, Point information. This, is, this is the only one that has I, this. Are you talking about, so somebody starts uh, drinking? No, 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 no. The, the idea that a whole, a whole lot of different kinds of enterprises are going to want to sell little wine goodies. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say there, there are restaurants now that, you don't have to finish the bottle. You can, they'll cork right. it, not completely even, bag it up and you right, can yeah. drive away with it. So yeah. I just wanted to make sure, sure yeah. that that's under, that's right. happening already. Yeah, no, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just picturing this little wine container that suddenly a lot of stores might want to sell these. I mean, well, maybe, I think, and maybe that's fine, I don't I, know. I think what you're saying is you don't want to turn restaurants with liquor licenses into liquor stores. Is that what you're saying? Or, or, book or stores. bookstores into wine, right, right. <laughs> into liquor stores. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I think they're the only holder of this particular license. So if the question is about creep, I think the natural creep would be into other licenses, not other license holders, because they don't exist. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry that we bundled these together. 
can we? Would you like me to unbutton? Unbu yes, please. Uh, or I'm sorry, the actual the maker of the motion was Councilmember Newsma. Second. So Council Member Newsom makes a substantive motion uh, passing or introducing uh, A12 and A14. Item ordinances 33 0 24 and 35 0 24. Second. Council Member Reed seconds. Is there any, there's some people in line, but I think they're probably in line to speak to A13. Is there anyone who wants to speak to the Council Member Newsom motion? Yes. Uh, Council Member uh, Reed. Yeah, I, I, I going back to the grocery store liquor license issue. Um, I, I still, I, I do think, is there a who's requesting this license? Is there someone that's pending that's waiting? Uh, this is Foxtrot that is uh, moving in. Um, I think to the Varsity Theater building. I want to say. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, as, 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 uh, the corporation council said, it, this is, uh, it's really just like a square foot. It, it diverges from the existing code only in the square feet, not in the, sure. the underlying definitions or anything like that. Right. And, and I'm not questioning that. Uh, that's clear. I just think even with the definition from zero to 2000 square feet, the, Definition of grocery store is a bit is too loose, um, in my opinion, um, and I don't think there's nothing in that definition of grocery store that would lead me to believe that the city really does have a strong claim to say that any business that is selling those items, there's no percentage. The code doesn't say that 50 percent of your business must be grocery items. It doesn't say that, you know. 50% of the square footage of your business should be dedicated to these grocery items. So it, it seems anybody who sells grocery items and is, meets the square footage requirement would be eligible to apply for either the zero to 2000 or the 2000 to 4000. And I think as a part of this, a part of the L3 license, I think we can make the correction for both the, I guess, L2 license is what it might be for the zero to whatever it is for the zero to 200. And for the, or 2000, I mean, and then uh, make the same correction for the 2000 and 4000. Um, I, I think just simply by adding that, you know, a, a percentage of your sales must be from those items or, or something else. Because how else would the staff, how is staff determining whether the use is grocery store? Well, it, it, I mean, we're opening it up here, and so we certainly have the ability to change relevant code. I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm asking somebody. Okay. Uh, <laughs> question isn't getting answered here. Yeah. Um, The question is, um, I don't know, what I'm suggesting is, and I, at this point I it slipped my mind, but what I'm suggesting is we need to amend the grocery store liquor. Oh, my, my question is, what, what is city staff relying on to determine to, to even have a legal ground to say that, um, you know, one business isn't a grocery store under this current definition, but one business is if we don't have any criteria within the definition of grocery store other than you sell these certain items, we don't say that um, the uh, that there's a limitation of you know fifty percent or whatever the case may be of either your square footage is dedicated to grocery or your overall sales. So what are we relying on if it's not in the code? I think what we're relying on is past precedent. Um, I think we would welcome a referral, though, to amend the code to change the grocery uh, definition. And I think that might be easier if we amend all three at the same time and it goes through the liquor board and then here. Okay. And and my uh, I, I hear that I don't think it needs a separate referral if we're talking about the L3 license and we need to fix something. I mean, it happens all the time. We're, we're talking about one piece of code and something else relevant inside the same 
um, section of code needs to be amended and we amend it um, to make the uh, underlying uh, referral make sense. And so I, I do think it's appropriate to um, amend that definition. And this is for introduction, so we have uh, some time, but I do think just a simple one line interjection of grocery in grocery store that sets some kind of parameters that we can rely on that tightens this language up a bit, whether it be a percentage of overall sales, a percentage of square, you know, the square footage dedicated to a certain use, to the grocery use. We do that with tobacco. We do that with other uh, items. So um, I would like to, so I'm going to, it's for introduction. So I want to make can, a motion. Can, can, can I just interject here? So, um, I, I'm, I'm just struggling to remember the discussion that occurred at the liquor board. I think that some of the grocery store licenses already have a square foot um, minimum, precisely as you're describing. So my my recommendation here. Point of it, this does not. It, my recommendation here uh, would be that if folks are comfortable with the direction of this, that they vote for introduction, and I'll go back to that discussion and understand why there's a distinction between the liquor, the, the different grocery license, and have uh, an answer prepared with, if appropriate, an amendment uh, when this comes back for action. I trust you, so, okay. Um, in that case, seeing no further discussion, would the clerk please take the Remember, we're voting on A12 and 14, but not 13 at this time. Is it ordinances, or this is the introduction of ordinances 33-0-24 and 35-0-24. Councilmember Kelly. Aye. Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Newsma. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Ravel. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Hedakaris. Aye. With seven voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the two ordinances are introduced. Councilmember uh, Newsom, do you have a motion on item A13? I will, yeah, remove item A13, ordinance 34024. Second. Councilmember Newsom moves introduction of ordinance 34 0 24. Councilmember Reed seconds. Uh, next in line on this issue was Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. So I just want to add this, you know, um, Bookends and Beginnings already has this F3 license, which is really only allows, they're an event space, right? Oftentimes have readings and other things. So this is a really nice, attractive little amenity that brings people, um, that can be, bring people into the store. It's, they can only, she can only sell, it's like less than eight ounce and it's sealed. So, and currently, if I'm not mistaken, if you buy and I've you know, had a bottle downstairs, you get one, I mean, you get, you get the little bottle, it's sealed. And there's nothing anyway that would, you know, really preclude you from walking out with a sealed bottle as is. I think she's just trying to be extra careful if she were put together a gift package and somebody wanted to put in a little, probably overpriced little bottle. Um, I mean, I don't think this is going to spread to other, I think other event spaces might want to apply for this. And it might be very appropriate for other venues in Evanston to also be granted this license and also to have that ability to say, you know, if you're putting something together, currently... I could take, I could buy that downstairs and not open it and put it in my purse and I wouldn't be doing anything illegal. So, I mean, I think she's just trying to be extra careful by dotting her I's and crossing her T's and just making this clear that if some, if she, if this ever came up where, you know, they were putting together gift baskets and of books and whatever else, that one of these little, very small um, bookends and beginnings bottles could be included. So I, I don't see it as being... I'm risky that all of a sudden everyone's going to sell these little, you know, like seven ounce or what is it, like really small little, you know, containers for they'd have to get a liquor sli liquor license and also pay for the liquor license. So, you know, I think this just makes sense to go ahead and, and allow this. Like I said, it's already basically allowed. So and I think it's a nice um, amenity that I think if we get, have other venues again like this in downtown, it would be appropriate to allow that in other places, not in a shoe store. They, I don't think they'd want to pay for a liquor license for something like this. Councilmember Reed. Thank you. Um, I have event spaces in my ward, and again, I don't know if those event spaces should turn into a 
de facto liquor stores. Who, who knows? Uh, and, and I want to note, it's not being extra careful. I, I'm not a drinker, but I've gone to places and I've had a non-alcoholic drink and tried to walk out with that. And they've said, hey, <laughs> you can't walk out of here with this alcoholic drink. It's a basic responsibility of the license holder to ensure that people don't take the drinks uh, off off site. And uh, many restaurants are very careful about making sure people don't walk out with drinks that they've been served in the restaurant, even if they're non-alcoholic, because some folks are overcautious. Um, and and so I, I, you know, and I have small event spaces. Who, you know, if if we're allowing this license, then what's to just stop them from stocking up with alcohol and saying we're in it? We're you know an event space. And we're, we're going to have a bunch of alcohol and you can come in and, and it just it creates essentially a, a, a new liquor store license yeah. that's uh, uh, very easy. And if I can, just one last thing. What, what is the definition of an event space under our um, liquor code or how do we define if something is an event space? I will what? ask that question and then I, if I can stop my time and allow counsel to look it up and then come back. But this is sealed. We're not talking about walking out with open bottles of anything from restaurants or anywhere, as, as Mayor Biz pointed out. That's not legal. And this is a very particular liquor license. It's so not same, a liquor store. Same so, thing with the so liquor. Let's, let's okay. move on with the, the discussion, and we'll go back to your answer sure. when it's ready. Councilmember Newsma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm going to support this. Um, gift bags with little mini wine bottles, that's great. Good for the business, good for downtown. I like it. I could see florists maybe adopting something like this. When you drop 100 bucks for your partner's uh, Valentine's Day roses, maybe you throw in a little bottle of wine. I think it'd be great. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, something that uh, our mayor and liquor commissioner has uh, called out. Our existing liquor code is kind of a massive jumble mess disaster. And uh, I don't propose we fix it tonight, but I want to flag that for something that we do want to fix at some point when the time is right. Uh, if I may respond. Good news. Uh, I have appointed a, an anal engineer to the Liquor Control Review Board. Um, and every time uh, we meet, he has um, flagged this issue as a problem. And after doing so numerous times, he has um, generously offered to take up what is really a big and unpleasant job of proposing a significant streamlining. He actually came to the last liquor board with a, a, a slide that compared the number of liquor licenses we have to other communities, both on a raw basis and a per capita basis. And um, the punchline is we have more than anybody if you look on a per capita basis, we're not that out of line, but if you look at just how many we have, it's we're unlike any other community. So um, I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. It is a big project, um, but someone is just, uh, as a active public service volunteer to help move us in that direction. Awesome. If a referral is required, I'd be happy to refer. We're not there yet. Uh, Director Reggie? Uh There is no specific definition of event in the liquor code. Okay. Um, if I may. And so Council Member Reed? How much time do I have left? Uh, two minutes. Okay. I won't need all of that. I, I, I'll just say that, you know, um, because there's no definition, and, and I want to be clear, I have businesses in my ward that are not, it's not this business, and I don't want folks to feel like we're racially profiling because if this had been, I fear, and we'll, I promise you when we pass this, we will have this test where it will be a black owned business that instead of little bottles of wine, maybe wants to do little bottles of Hennessy or something else. And if we're not going to take the same stance on this and approve the F3 liquor license for that event space, who wants to do something that's a little bit more culturally relevant then we better not approve this. I, I'm, I'm going to vote for this today, but we should have a consistent application of the law, of the rules, and it shouldn't just be for things that are culturally relevant to a majority of this body. Um, so that that's the thing. That's my concern about this. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, and we're setting a precedent, and it's not always going to look like this. And it, we better have the same outcome. Thank you. Will the clerk please take the roll? 
Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Harris? No. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Ravel? No. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Harakaris? Aye. With five voting in favor and two voting against, uh, the motion carries and ordinance 34-0-24 is introduced. Uh, does someone have a motion relative to item? Uh, I move item HS1. I'm the chair of human services. So I'll move item HS1, homeless encampment, uh, and request for funding of direct services. And I make that motion in the amount of um, $500,000. So this would be minus the money for connections for the homeless. Again. I just, I'm going to say that again. Oh, okay. To say it again, I am not moving the full dollar amount of $1.75 million. I'm only moving $500,000, which would be for District 65 and for our, our health department. Uh, I am not moving the funding for Connections for the Homeless, which is in the dollar amount of $1.2 million, I believe. Is the motion fails for lack of a second? I, I, I'll second it for discussion, but I'm not in favor. But I'll give you the opportunity to have a brief discussion. I don't Council know member I Reed moves uh, the allocation of $500,000 uh, from general fund reserves. So uh, $1.25 million less than described in the agenda and packet because of the intended removal of the funding for connections for the homeless. Council member Harris seconds. Council member Newsma followed by Reed. Oh, I made the motion so I get to go first. Council member Reed followed by Newsma followed by Harris. Thank you. Um, so I've been texting city manager Stowe pretty regularly, and it's not every time I see it, but it's most times I see it, the encampment on Howard Street has not gone away. I am receiving calls regularly, or fairly reg regularly enough um, from residents in both Evanston and Chicago. I'm getting folks who are saying, I called the 49th Ward office and they told me to call you uh, because this is Evanston. And folks, you know, I, just uh, a few days ago, I had an elderly woman call me who lives in Rogers Park um, who's directed to um, uh, me by the 49th Ward alderman, alder woman, alder person. Um, and um, the woman shared with me that she is afraid to get off on the Paulina side of the platform, of the platform which is closer to her house, um, because she fears that as an elderly woman, she could be um, a target for being mugged um, or, or, or something else, um, or having her purse snatches, specifically what she said. And I agree that it's not fair that we allow this to continue. Now, months ago, when we first put this proposal together, which was before the 2024 budget season, for, so for anyone who wants to hold this off until next year's budget, you already held it off originally, and we didn't get it into the 2024 budget. Um, this is something we need to deal with. I'm, I'm not moving forward with the connections request. I think there's more work to be done there, but certainly our health and human services department could use these resources. When we initially had this, we also had a commitment that may have been blown now for 30 slots in drug treatment that would have accompanied this that is probably not on the table now. So we missed out on that free service um, by holding off on this. And we're continuing to allow in the eighth ward, this isn't happening in anyone else's ward uh, for this to happen. So I, I, I truly believe that our health and human services department and really in conjunction with our, um, our, our, our parks and recreation department who runs the outreach team need this additional funding to be able to uh, address the situation in a multitude of ways, whether it be housing, whether it be providing resources, whether it be uh, cleanup services, security cameras, it, it leaves the, the floor open for us. Uh, to do a whole host of things uh, that we can't do today and that need to be done. And I know darn well that none of you would accept this in your ward. I, I, I've shared a, a number of pictures with uh, Manager Stowe, and, and this, is, this would not be acceptable anywhere else in Evanston. Lastly, 
Uh, there's the request uh, for District 65. We worked mm -hmm. with the social, um, I don't know, services department, whatever they are, the, the social workers in D65 who handle cases with homeless uh, children. I was one of those youth uh, in District 65 who did not have resources to be able to stay here. Having District 65, who is a strong partner with the city of Evanston, be able to take on specifically the work of children who are in our district uh, to make sure that they aren't homeless, that they aren't forced to leave our community, that they aren't forced to move to shelters on the south side of Chicago and other places that actually have dedicated resources to take folks in. We need to make sure that we are putting up the resources to stop that from happening. It is not conducive to that child's uh, edu to that child receiving a quality education. I know some folks may say, hey, there's McKinney-Vento and all of this other funding. I can tell you it is not enough. It does not help. I can say it from personal experience. This funding, as the district has uh, put forward in the proposal, which is in the memo, will be able to help um, a decent number of students. We know that the, um, uh, the number of uh, homeless students has increased in District 65 um, over the over the last uh, few years, particularly and, and even, I think, increased year over year from last year to this year. And so this funding is desperately needed. I, I, I This is five hundred thousand dollars. I'm supportive of this funding um, coming from our affordable housing fund, uh, from the affordable housing fund, particularly with the Northwestern money that is coming in. The eighth ward needs it. Um, our, our children need it. Uh, who are in District 65, and uh, this will allow us to take some of the burden off the health department, who has already worked very closely with the uh, with District 65 to house folks. And so this will make our own operations more efficient, uh, and as I said, take some of the burden off and make sure that the kids in our community who look like me, who look like many of us, um, are, 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 are able to have a stable school year um, and get their education. We know particularly in the elementary school years how critical uh, these services are thank you councilmember Nusma, followed by harris followed by burns Councilmember Nusma. thank you mr mayor um i, I want to acknowledge that uh not only our community but our country has a problem with homelessness and we have so far in evanston managed to uh to deal with this program without dipping too much if uh, at all into Evanston taxpayer funds. Uh, we have managed to leverage state, county, and federal money to help us uh, uh, deal with this problem. The problem is going to get worse, and uh, it demands a response, and it will at some point demand uh, an, an Evanston response and using Evanston money in a more robust way. I want to make sure that you know, not if, but when we get to that point, we are doing so in a thoughtful and kind of proactive strategic manner uh, in collaboration with all of the community stakeholders that are involved uh, in dealing with these issues. Uh, we have not uh, done nothing over the last uh, over the last few months and since this originally came to us last uh, uh, last summer, uh, just last meeting, we approved $800,000 from the participatory budgeting money for uh, for rental assistance. Uh, on a related note, we've you know, allocated $400,000 for the alternative response. Coming to us very shortly will be a recommendation from uh, HCDC to um, invest a uh, million dollars of federal money in uh, in Margarita Inn. So we are taking some strategic and thoughtful approaches here. I appreciate what uh, Council Member Reed taking the connections uh, 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 portion of this request out because there does need to be some more discussion with connections and other stakeholders. And you know, I was going to propose uh, that uh, before Council Member Reed uh, already took that out, I was going to propose tabling this whole discussion till September to allow some uh, 
time for discussion to happen and with some direction to staff to work with, uh, work with connections and other community partners and stakeholders to come back to us with a, a robust and, and well thought out plan. Uh, because this situation uh, is only gonna get worse and we need to be prepared to do it. Um, Council Member Reed, you're suggesting uh, we fund District 65 and Human Services. Um, I'm not sure if that addresses the problem on Howard Street, uh, but we have similar we have similar problems downtown. So I want to make sure that we are. Uh, proactively uh, and strategically thoughtfully addressing this problem, not just uh, reacting to a particular situation. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, withhold my approval until we have a, a more structured plan. A point of information, I, I just want to be clear that this, this conversation started in uh, June, July of last year and it will have been over a year. So where the hell has the discussion been over the last year? And I got people in my ward who are scared to use the train. Uh, Councilor Nisman, did you make that motion just now? Or you were just re referring to the fact that you had planned to? OK, uh, Council Member Harris followed by Burns. Thank you, um, Mayor. So. I understand. Uh, hold on one second. We're going to pause uh, for an uh, AV reason, and we'll be back shortly. All right, we'll resume. Uh, Councilmember Harris. Thank you so much. Um, so I understand and I see. Are you listening? Because I second, go and, yeah, sit down and see. Thank you, because I seconded it for you. I could have let it die. So I need your attention. Thank you. So I'm speaking from personal experience. My mother lives there, and I, my mother and I are very close, so I go over there all the time. If you remember correctly, I'm the person that called city manager Stowe and Maria and the police chief and stood at the corner and said, this is a problem. We've got to fix this. And we walked the block and we created a situation where we put the police tank. I don't know what's the proper name. And it cleared out. And we had to move that tank because of CTA operations and things like that. But it cleaned out. That area is not a homeless area, it's a drug area. The people are passed out, passing out. I've stood there, I take the train. So it's not a homeless issue. These people, most of these people have somewhere to be, that is where they, they don't wanna be there because they can't engage in the behavior that they have there. That's the crux of the issue. And I kind of remember the peer services that we had the opportunity to get service to these, I'll say residents. Can't make anybody want to get help until they want to get help. And that's part of the situation over there. Um, so I'm not comfortable without a plan. We are short on money. Our government scarily has become a social service agency of Evanston, not a, not a government. And we've got to figure that out because our residents need help, but the taxing body, we're, we're taxing them. District 65 is the biggest tax agency, and I don't understand. They need to reallocate. They need to figure that out. We need to sit at a table and do that collectively. But we cannot give the 17% that we get to the 44% 41, 40, whatever they get. We've got to figure this all out, and I don't think this is the answer. McKinney, McKinney Vento, um, a lot of people are not taking advantage of that. They're, they're claiming homeless, and they have a place to lay their head. So we really have to look at all of this, and it kind of goes back to 
though I don't think this population is would benefit from the 500 a month, as you mentioned, the kids. We just talked about the eighth ward. That's where I talked about getting some money there. But I don't think this is the population that is um, struggling with that. So I, I can't get behind this. And I have grave concern because, again, my mother lives there. I'm on the train on a regular basis. I'm worried about not only the residents in, around this, but the residents there. There, there's a, a serious problem, and it's not homelessness, in my estimation, and watching and sitting and and knowing some of the people. Unfortunately, I know some of them are my friends. So um, it isn't homelessness. It, it really isn't. Um, it, it's a little different than that. So I cannot get, but I was not going to get behind the 1.75, um, and even the 500,000 right now. I can't get behind, but. I think we do have to work something out. But I've I've been that I've said that for the past year, so I haven't changed and I won't. So thank you. Councilmember Burns. I had to text uh Chief Stewart because I didn't want uh people thinking we got a tank out here. And I know it was a harmless mistake, but I was like, Chief, give us give it's called an armored armored car. Armored car. I just because <laughs> the headline would have been you know, city, yeah, city purchased tank and it's rolling through the community. So I wanted to, but I know it was a harmless mistake. I just wanted to make sure we knew what it was called. Okay. So, um, yeah, my, my, my uh, comments are uh, similar to Council Member Harris. I think if, if I had a proposal in front of me that I b believe would address what's going on at Howard, then I would support it. And I still would support that. And I would encourage whether we table this or not to just come back and very specifically say, we would like these things for Howard. I'm not prepared to support anything for District 65 at this point, not prepared to support, honestly, anything even for the city until we have uh, a, 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 a conversation about how we want to go about this. A few meetings ago, or, or I don't know if it was a few minutes ago, but at some point, uh, Uri, who is our senior housing planner, I believe came before this body to say that we're working on a strategic housing plan. And I want us to remember these things so that we're not working in such a disjointed way. So they told us they're working on this. So let's fold this conversation into that discussion so that we can move forward with, with in a way that the community can follow and not be doing these things um, outside of that, that process that will include community in, input, et cetera. Um, but again, I want to be clear that I would absolutely support something that I felt would address this situation. I don't think that's, was before us, uh, and then, um, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll stop there. Good. Would the clerk please take if, the if, roll? If, if I may have a, just a privilege of one minute here. One minute. One minute, all right. And then the so, vote is gonna happen at the end of that minute. Certainly, I, I wanna clarify two things. One, homelessness is not always not having a place to stay. As a, child in District 65, I was homeless staying on the couch of, with my grandmother of a family friend. That's still homeless. Um, and so I, I want to highlight that. And two, um, with the encampment, so main thing before my minute runs out is I want to withdraw this and, and have it come back to a future meeting. I've asked for cameras. What I'm looking for for the Health and Human Services Department is to, I understand that it's a drug issue. I understand that some of those folks have housing. We need to be able to uh, have staff dedicated to understand that they have housing so we can follow uh, court orders to make sure that if we tell people to move around and they're there 24 hours a day. I've gone there late at night and they're still there early in the morning. They're still there. So whether they're homeless or not, they are there seemingly 24 hours a day. So with that said, I, I just want to table this um, to uh, two meetings from now, um, which would be our meeting in Thank you. April 29th? Is that okay? To the April 29th meeting. Um, so, Council Member Reed moves to table this item to the April 29th City Council meeting. Is there a second? Second. Council Member Burns seconds. Uh, will the clerk please take the roll? Oh. I'm can, What's that? Can I have unreadiness on that? Can you have what? Unreadiness before we. Unreadiness to vote? Well, I'm just trying to understand what are we going to accomplish doing something. 
be, yeah. in that time who's who's taking care of yeah. business. If if I can respond to that, so uh, the the idea is to for me to work with the Health and Human Services Department, which provides a lot of our homelessness assistance or housing assistance programs, to work with Parks and Rec, who um, has the outreach team and will be taking over the community responder model, and to work with our police department because I, I think with all three of those components. Uh, we can address the situation on Howard so folks feel comfortable using the train station. I think with the money just that I'm seeking for, I get it. I don't get it, but I under, I have to accept that folks don't want to help District 65. But I do think folks do want to address the situation on Howard Street, which is unique to anywhere else in Evanston. And I think we can do that with a few uh, with with a few interventions uh, at the $300,000 mark that uh, is being requested for human services that can make a real difference in the public safety and attractiveness of public transit in the city of Evanston and Howard Street. And, and, and also I'll note that part of this funding could come from uh, the TIF district, uh, potentially if we appropriately drew this area into the TIF district, not understanding that this was Evanston, but uh, part of it could come from TIF. So I think having that opportunity, I've had these conversations a year ago, I think they need to be refreshed. Um, having a couple weeks to do that would allow it. I, I just don't think a couple weeks is it. If we. Oh, sorry, good point. Is it... Oh, dang it. I was, re... I'm sorry, I was going to call on you, Councilmember Kelly, but. But uh, Councilmember Burns makes an accurate point. I messed up. None of this should be discussed. The Will the clerk please take the role in the motion to the table, which cannot be debated? No. Sorry. I'm well, looking either. Councilmember Kelly. Withdraw, you so, oh, I'm sorry. If I'm, if I may, did I make the motion to table? Yeah. Yes. I, I, I would. I mean, I want my colleagues to have. An, I withdraw the motion to table. I want my colleagues to have an opportunity to respond, and hopefully vote yes to table it to whatever date. Okay. Councilmember Kelly. Okay. So. Um, I would even be okay with allocating 1.7 or whatever, but I, I just want to make sure that we're doing this effectively and, and, you know, I need an expanded and detailed plan. And we did start working on this last year, right? I think, Chrissy, you were working with us with Oakton and looking at outreach workers. I don't, I think we should look at a broader plan. I can't support this right now because it, it's not fleshed out. I think we need measurables. How do we measure success? What are our targeted outcomes? There's just so much more involved. I do think this is something that we desperately do need to address. Um, I don't think this it's in this proposal right here, but so I don't know what the motion, what, what, you know, what to move forward. I, we absolutely do need to tackle this as a city. We need to decide how that looks. I learned through research that it should be in house. You know, you want to have outreach workers here so that we have flexibility so that they know the city so that they have repeated contact with same people so that, um, there's more oversight. So, you know, again, not even that quantity of money, I'd be willing to allocate that, but I need a plan that, like I said, where we're really looking at um, some, you know, expanded detailed plan with measurables, with targeted outcomes. And again, I'd like to see that in house. So I won't support this right now, but I would support somehow moving forward as a council, as a city with, uh, with a plan. Council member Burns with three minutes and 10 seconds left. Yeah, I, I think having, Spoken to Councilman Reed about this. I think if we hone this into a response to what is going on on Howard, uh, it is worth tabling this. And and if some good if if they come up with good ideas, I think we should support it. Again, I've talked to Councilman Reed. From what I heard, understand, I think he does have some good ideas. He's had some conversations with uh, with um, our police department, and I think they have a you know. Uh, might have some involvement in this. I think there's some concerns around budget. My point is, is that if given time, based on those conversations I've had with Councilman Reed, I think that he can hone it in to specifically address what's going on on Howard, which is, you know, an urgent matter that that I would love to be able to respond to. If again, we understand what the costs, specific costs are related to it, and we get more information about how specific interventions will address what's going on on Howard. Uh, and so I would encourage, I seconded this with that in mind, and I would uh, encourage my colleagues to, to support this in an effort to address the urgent matter that is going on on Howard. And it's not just about housing, Council Member Harris, to your point. There's some other things that I don't necessarily want to speak on today. I'll leave that to the you know professionals to do that. But it is not just about housing. There are some other things that I think if given the time, they can come up with something that looks different than what we have in front of us. 
Councilmember Newsman with a minute 50 left. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to make the point that this is not just a, a Howard uh, Street problem. Uh, when this first came up, we had some issues downtown. Uh, they haven't been terribly symptomatic uh, in the last few uh, months. I'll look at my colleagues uh, who also represent downtown. It's been quieter downtown, but we see other problems. I've got. I've, I've seen. Presumably, they're, they're, they're migrants or refugees panhandling at the corner of, uh, of Dempster and, and Ridge. Yeah, these kind of problems are citywide. They're not just a Howard Street problem, and they demand a citywide robust response. And that's what I want to make sure we are strategically doing, not just playing whack-a-mole, but taking a step back, working with community partners, working with our experts in the on city staff, looking at what's working and what's not working in other communities, and really strategically addressing this problem. So at this point, I will, I'll not make the motion, but it's in your email. Uh, what I think might be uh, worth doing is tabling this whole shebang till our second meeting in, in, uh, in September. Uh, with instructions to staff to work with community stakeholders and develop uh, and present to us at that time a more robust and thoughtful plan for all of these issues that we're talking about. And that would allow us to uh, you know, fully fund a robust response moving forward rather than reacting to just a particular situation in the moment, which could change by the time, uh, you know, by the time this comes back to us for full approval. So did you just say you're not so, making that motion? I, 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 let me read some body language here. I'm going to make that motion. I, I'm making that motion. I'll second. All right. So Council Member Anusma moves to table this item to uh, the second meeting of the second regular city council meeting of September 2024. Uh, the purpose being that that meeting can include a discussion that will feed into the 2025 budget process. Council Member Kelly seconds. I will not make the same mistake again. That motion is not debatable. Will the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Kelly. Council Member Harris. No. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Burns. No. Council Member Ravel. Aye. Council Member Reed. No. Council Member Heracaris. No. With three voting in favor and four voting against, the motion fails. Uh, Council Member Burns with two minutes left. I, I just want to, what makes, well, what I think makes this unique, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is this activity is blocking the entire sidewalk in some instances. We're talking about people that are camped out essentially in this area. I don't think that's happening anywhere else in the anywhere. city. And, and I'll leave that to Manager Stowe. Maybe you can help out with that. You may have a 360. If, an understanding of what's going on around the city, but I don't think that's happening anywhere else, where there's 12, 10 to twelve people on a regular basis. on a regular basis blocking the entire sidewalk, camped out, plugging things into outlets, but perhaps Selling potentially either. and, and, and ingesting that, this drugs. This is different. This is a unique situation. But uh, Manager Stowe, if you can help me with sure. That. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Burns, for the question, and I'll let Director Thompson add if she would like to. Um, I would describe this as more acute than other areas of the city. Um, I just want to clarify, since I was invoked earlier, that every time Councilmember Reed has texted me, literally within minutes, I am in contact with Director Thompson, Manager McRae, and we have outreach staff often within a few minutes or within an hour out there to address it. It's also uh, being visited, I think, twice a day now by our outreach team. And I think part of a lot of the issues that have been raised here in the last few minutes we're, we're literally launching the care team in June, and a lot of this is going to be uh, care team related. And yes, there are other additional resources from Health and Human Services. There's a police component to this as well, um, but it's going to be largely driven by our care team, which is launching in a matter of weeks. And we've already we already have a light footprint of that already. And I, I just want to add that um, this is no matter who's responding, whether it's police, whether it's uh, outreach team, whether it's community responders, we're dedicating quite a bit of resources to something that is reoccurring. And so it, it, it's not best practice, no matter who the responder is, for us to continue to send out outreach worker after outreach worker, police officer after police officer. And so I think in this particular situation, hearing from our city manager that it is acute and unique to any other area in Evanston, if there is a solution, and I believe Councilmember Reed, you know, along with working with staff, believes there is one, 
we should address it now is, is all I'm saying. And, and in terms of the broader issues of housing and homelessness, again, we already have a path and maybe it would help for director Flax to talk up, to remind us kind of what that uh, schedule looks like for the strategic housing plan. Um, Cause I think we should stay on that schedule, but in the meantime, address this acute situation and allow our colleague an opportunity at least maybe one one last time to come up with something that kind of narrowly addresses what is going on on Howard. So, uh, Director Flag, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about the just the timeline of the strategic housing plan. We got a document at one point that said it's going to be discussed on this date and introduced probably on this date. And Thank you. I don't have that document with me, but we are working on it and we'll be bringing to the Housing and Community Development Committee in several stages. Um, first discussion in the next month, but then coming back with um, more of an outline and more of a plan worked out in the uh, September and then with the goal of working through um, a plan that would actually come to uh, city council um, by the end of the year. Council Member Harris with a minute 20 left. I've almost forgotten what I wanted. Um, I think a collective effort is what's needed. I'm, I'm willing to be there with you to work with the different agencies. Um, but one of the things that we have to, a couple of things we have to recognize is that this is part of the entry into our city. And is that the message we want to give? And then we have young people that take the train that live in that area to go to school. And that becomes a hazard that is Evanston's hazard because it's on our side of the street. So I think those are the things that we have to look at. And I just wanted to make a correction. Oh, somebody said we don't want to help 65. It's not that. It has to be a concerted effort that we just can't throw money at the problem because we see that does not work. So I, I just want to be quoted. How about you just don't quote me, but thanks. Uh, so Councilmember Reed is the only person seeking recognition. Your time is up, so I'll, I'll allow you to make Three a motion. Seconds. Yes. But no commentary, please. All right. I'd like to move to table this to our, our May 28th meeting, which is the day after Memorial Day. Councilmember Reed moves to table this item to May 28th. Councilmember Burns seconds. I will again not make the same mistake twice. Would the clerk please take the roll? Councilmember Kelly. Aye. Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Wynn. Sorry. Councilmember Newsma. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Ravel. I'm confused. Aye. <laughs> this is motion to table until late May. Aye. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Racarez. Councilmember Heracaris. With six voting in favor and none voting against, the motion carries and the item is uh, tabled till late May 2024. Is there a motion relative to item R1? I'll move item R1, uh, ordinance 31024, amending title two of the city code concerning board, committee, and commission term limits. Second. I'm sorry. Councilmember Kelly, do you want to move this? Oh, sure. I apologize. I may. I'll move R1. Second. Councilmember Kelly moves the introduction of Ordinance 31 0 24. Councilmember Harris seconds. Councilmember Reed. Oh, I'm sorry. I flipped on my light thinking that the sponsor would already have their light on. Oh. Or if there's an no, assignment sure. no, that happy. was made. You'll made up. Take it off. Sure. I, um, this is just in response to when we have. Um, board commission or committee members who are interested in serving beyond a second term and apply and get appointed by the mayor and then get approved by council. So there are many layers um, that they still would have to go through that they would they could potentially you know serve beyond a second term um, in the event that their institutional knowledge and expertise is really valuable to any particular committee. Again, I think it's going to be a rarity where, when that will happen because it takes all those conditions, you know, interest in being a third term, the mayor agreeing to appoint them, and then council having to vote them in. So um, I see no harm. I see only a benefit 
and making that a possibility for those residents who are serving as volunteers who have deep expertise and institutional knowledge um, to make that a possibility. Council Member Reed followed by Harris followed by Ravel. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you, Council Member Kelly. I understand the desire there. I, I do think, you know, I have residents reaching out to me to join committees and there aren't vacancies or there aren't places for them to land. Um, there are, you know, a lot of folks who um, have been denied um, access to committees and, um, you know, I think we need to create more space for resident engagement, for new voices. I think that the current language has two consecutive terms. It's not to say that somebody couldn't take a term break and then come back. Um, and allow someone else to gain that institutional knowledge and, and gain, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm also not convinced that two terms is the, uh, you know, the magic number uh, because George Washington did it uh, uh, 200 some odd years ago. Um, you know, maybe it's three, maybe it's four, but, um, I, you know, I, I would be supportive of, you know, maybe increasing it to three consecutive terms, um, but just leaving it open-ended to me um, doesn't allow us, I don't think will allow us the greatest opportunity to add new voices uh, to, uh, to, to our boards, committees, and commissions, and of which we know that we already lack diversity. And I think instituting this, uh, and not just racial diversity, but all kinds of diversity, and I think implementing this um, will slow down our progress in achieving that diversity. Thank you. Councilmember Harris followed by Ravel. I was going to let Councilmember Ravel go first. I've had a lot of mic time tonight, so. Okay. Um, well, to uh, address Councilmember Reed's concerns, I mean, the mayor still will need to appoint the the person to a second term or a third term or whatever. And if, for example, there were a whole lot of people applying to be <clears throat> on a particular commission, um, the mayor might decide. That to not reappoint somebody, but rather to make room for a new person. That's point, not what my original. That's not what I really am signed up to say. Talk about point, but. point of information on that. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that we don't advertise a vacancy until there is going to be a vacancy. So if someone is reapplying, we wouldn't advertise that there's a vacancy on that commission. Oh, we wouldn't advertise, but people people can st still or, apply. Can apply even if there's not a vacancy. I don't know, I mean, yeah. So, um, so basically, as I understand the the um, what we're trying to do with R one is delete the language that talks about being term limited. So there are two additional sections that need to be deleted that were overlooked. So one is um, on page two fifty seven of the packet. It's number three at the top of the page, towards the top of the page. It says, commissioners shall not be eligible to serve more than two consecutive full terms. So, so anyway, I, I, would, I suggest that we delete that paragraph. And then there's a second one on page 262. Um, just a minute here. And I... Uh, I sent you, I sent an email, which I don't know if it got to everybody. Um, this is about the land use commission and the same issue that you. Right, yeah. yeah. So there's, um, there's another, another section that, yeah, under land use commission. Title two, chapter 19. Right, yeah. Membership. Council member Ravel moves to amend uh, ordinance 31-0-24 by uh, deleting uh, the two, streams of text just described, one relative to the Preservation Commission and one relative to the Land Use Commission. Is there a second? Second. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear who seconded it. Uh, Council Member Kelly seconds. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Is that? Yes. Okay. Um, is there any other light that's currently on specifically to address the amendment? In that case, uh, we'll uh, move on to Council Member Reed with three minutes and 20 seconds left. Yeah, uh, just on this amendment, uh, 
I, I, I'm fine with the Preservation Commission, although, although both of these commissions, Preservation Commission and Land Use Commission, I think, are two of our commissions, committees that I think need the most, uh, div you know, diversification of membership. Um, and so I, I, particularly for the Land Use Commission, would like to see the term limit stay in place um, because it's such a, uh, because of the history of the commission. I also think for the Preservation Commission that it makes sense too, but, um, you know, I'm happy to move along with that. But particularly, I, I would ask maybe for a friendly amendment to leave the land use commission term limits in place. It's a very unique um, commission that I, I think uh, would, would stand uh, to, to have some. And I think we already have members on that commission who've been there for more than two terms, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, that's beyond the point. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I I don't know, maybe ask for a friendly uh, amendment uh, to remove the land use commission portion. We're already in strike. Oops, sorry, thank you. We're already striking. There is no limit to commission, or commission members' terms. I mean, we're, I think it, there's other language that we're already putting in there that says there's no more, there's no term limit. That there is, we're adding. There, we're adding that there is no limit to term to commission members' terms. I mean, well, I'm, I, I'm just, I guess I mean, yeah. I, I would say it's ten forty-five at night. Yeah, We've argued about this exact issue twice before with the same outcome. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to make a motion other than the one that was just made, make it. Um, but otherwise, let's vote on the motion that's on the table. I will move to. Um, Substitute the um, Councilmember Ravel's motion to reinstate or to keep the um, Land Use Commission uh, membership. And you know, I think if we need to add language there to ensure that it's clear that that will still have a two term limit, uh, we can do that. But I think if we pass this with that limit in place. Is, uh, is there a second? Councilmember Reed moves to substitute uh, a motion for Councilmember Ravel's motion. Uh, that uh, only affects the desired change for the Preservation Commission, not the Land Use Commission. Councilmember Byrne seconds. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, Councilmember Burns. Uh, I'll be quick. So um, I agree. I, I, the, what concerns me about all of this is that it is already very difficult for us to find new folks that are willing willing to uh, um, participate in our BCCs. And I, and I do feel like this can potentially discourage us from figuring out how to do better at that. And, you know, I'm fine, I guess, with everything but land use, if that's where we're going. I still don't know how I'm going to vote on that. But I agree with him. I, I think for a whole host of reasons, we need to look at, we need to make sure that the Land Use Commission is representative of this full city, not just folks from one side of town, which I already think has happened. Um, um, and it, that's just incredibly important. And again, I just want to emphasize, we don't do a good job of this now. And so to put in something that doesn't incentivize us to continue to come up with good ideas, to out, do outreach and find new voices and new people to participate in our BCCs, I, I don't think is good policy right now. Um, so I'm willing to support this. And that's no, that's, again, not a criticism of Mayor Biss or the clerk's office. It's a really difficult thing to do. I'm even trying to find ways to, to do it in, in my role as chair of the NWDB committee. So it's really difficult. Nobody really has figured it out, you know, in Evanston. So not criticizing anybody. We all need to put our heads together to figure it out. I don't think this helps towards it. I think it could potentially discourage us from huddling up to figure it out. All right. Would, uh, Council Member Kelly, did you want to speak to this? So, all um, right. So Council Member Kelly with four minutes left. Okay. So, I think we still have a lot of vacancies, so they still aren't getting filled. And I don't think um, this the rare occasion where we have somebody who wants to serve beyond two terms and the mayor decides that it's in our best interest and appoints that person um, and then the council approves them, I don't think that in any way is going to um, necessarily, 
I think it, you could impact diversity the, the other way around too. You might have that person who's, you know, black or Latino serving who we want to serve a, a third or fourth term because they're so valuable. Now we can't. So I just I don't think that I think I agree with you. Like the land use commission, we should we can look at that and try to encourage um, broader. We should be encouraging more diversity on that commission. But I don't think this idea of somebody with deep expertise or someone who's really, um, you know. Um, has in, institutional knowledge or not institutional knowledge, but who's just you know a really fabulous member um, and would like to serve a third term. Again, we have that option to say no. The mayor has the option to say no. The council has the option to say no. I I, I just think we're gonna we have the potential of losing really what I, a put you know again it's rare it's maybe one a year maybe not even that. Um, somebody who we'd like to continue serving, that now we have to go out and leave a space empty. And by the way, we can still say vacant. When someone's terms are up, we should list it as vacant. And then if they apply, they apply. There's nothing, there's no reason we can't say vacancy, right? Point, when point of information, just to be clear, put... Oh. Point of information, if, they're, if they're in the seat, it's not vacant, their term would end at a certain date, X, right? After which... If they don't reapply, the seat would be vacant. Or if they're not reconfirmed, the seat would be vacant. Right? But we're not, you're not contemplating an automatic renewal. Absolutely. Right. Let's, I think that's a key point. Right. A point of information, because I, I think there's a really critical misunderstanding with my colleague in the first ward. This amendment is still going along with your plan, except for our land use commission which needs diversity so i think and i think i even heard you agree with that so i think i'm hearing you support the amendment um and allowing your 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 full all right so Councilmember kelly still has the floor so yes but that's the that's the state of affairs today i agree with you the with regard to the diversity of our land use commission might not be in a term and then there might be someone on there that ends up ser serving i'm just saying yes i agree with you in terms of the state of affairs as it is today but i think passing this rule, I mean, I'll support this in order to move this forward, you know, the Land Use Commission to maybe have an impact on it going forward over the next four to eight years. But I don't think that that rule in itself in any way, like I said, it could even undermine in some cases diversity. So, but I'll, I'll support it in order to potentially um, impact the nature of our makeup of our Land Use Commission. Uh, at this time, no one is requesting to speak for a first or second crack. So we go back to Council Member Reed with two minutes left. I'm good for now. Thank you. Will the clerk please take the roll on this substitute motion? Could you could you repeat? What yeah. So Council Member uh, Ravel made a motion to basically fix an error in the packet, and then Council Member Reed made a motion to replace that with a motion that like makes a new policy carve out for the Land Use Commission. So the motion before the body right now is the council member Reed version that fixes the error for the Preservation Commission but on purpose doesn't fix it for the Land Use Commission so that the Land Use Commission is treated differently. Will the clerk please take the roll? Council member Kelly. Aye. Council member Harris. Aye. Council member Newsma. Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Lavelle? No. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedakaris? Aye. With six voting in favor and one voting against the motion carries, and Ordinance 31 0 24 is amended. Councilmember Ravel? Uh, well, I just point out that you need to do some further amendments to the, the Land Use Commission section because it's got language in there that talks about. Um, that there's no limits. So I leave that up to Councilmember Reed. I'm sorry? Uh, there's. Councilmember Harris. Okay, next. I was going to say, I, I know I was in queue at some point. So. Um, and what was the two? I am not in favor of this because I feel like we don't. And when I talk about diversity, it's just people. It's our wards. Um, it's different mind think. I think we get people locked or people get locked into a position and really try to take over and not allow 
other people to be involved in discussions and they just think their way is the right way. Similar to what Council Member Burns stated that we have to do a better job. When I saw openings, it was my job as a council member to call people in my ward and say, hey, we got some openings. I think this, you would be really good at this. So we, as the council, have to do better in getting more people engaged. It's scary. I had to talk to people a couple of times. It is scary to be like, just go on to this committee and, and you'll do good work because what I keep hearing is, I get beat up for my thoughts. I see how they treat each other. I see how you all treat each other. I see how you talk to each other. I see how they talk to each other. We have to do better on that front, but getting new train of thought in there is never going to be a problem with me. Diversity among all the spectrums, our, our wards, color, religion, male, female, cisgender, all of that. So. I'm not in favor of this. I wanted to say that a long time before we got to amendments. Thank you. Councilor Rodisma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At the risk of prolonging this conversation, uh, question for you, I believe you have uh, an intern or a fellow kind of looking at our BCCs and making some recommendations as to how we might kind of revamp this entire package. If you could let us know what we might be uh, expecting at some point. Yeah, I mean, uh, she did uh, a lot of interesting work compared with other communities. Um, uh, it turned out to be a lot to bite off. So I don't know that the recommendations that she wound up coming up with are actually all that germane to this discussion. Um, you know, a lot of changes to our onboarding process, which was clearly deficient. Um, you know, she had some sort of uh, some more uh, interesting kind of unusual ideas that she had found in Oak Park about sort of how to handle the whole issue broadly. Um, but also, you know, the main observation was we've just got more of these than anybody else. Um, I, I mean, I, I'll just, I think this conversation is missing the boat pretty badly. Like I don't, I'm happy, whatever you guys want to do, I'll comply with happily. I don't think it matters that much, but I, I don't think um, I think if we think that getting this right is going to address the question of filling the vacancies with diverse, passionate, knowledgeable residents, we're totally barking up the wrong tree. Whatever the right answer is, it's not going to help that much with that problem. Yeah. I, 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 kinda, I share your, I don't know, indifference on term limits. I served two terms on the Utilities Commission, was term limited off which was fine uh, because I had something else to do. Uh, and so I'm doing that now. Uh, but there are, so I could see the benefit of, of some of the old timers that were continuing to come to meetings and still a valuable part of the conversation, even though they weren't technically on the board. Um, but at the same time, on the Utilities Commission, my experience there, we really you know, tried to diversify the uh, members on that committee and were somewhat successful, but uh, a lot more work needs to happen, not only in that committee, but across the board. Uh, so at this time, no one's asking to speak for a first or second time, so we go to Council Member Reed with uh, two minutes left. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, of course, I don't, I don't think that this is going to solve the issue. That's not why I'm, I'm raising this concern. I just do think that without some guardrails, we could make the issue worse. So does this solve it? The, my, the amendment that we're putting forward? No. Um, but could this potentially make it worse? I think so. And, and I think it's just worth, um, you know, addressing um, to make sure that we're, we're, we're continuing to make progress on this issue. Thank you. Will the clerk please take the roll on the item as amended by the Council Member Reed, friendly amendment. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Harris? No. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? No. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? No. Council Member Hedakaris? No. With three voting in favor and four voting against, the motion fails and the ordinance is not introduced. Uh, this brings us to call of the wards. Council Member Kelly?
Council Member Kelly. No, re this call the words. Yep. Um, office hours this Thursday from four to six at the library. First ward. Hope to see you there. Council Member Harris. Ooh, I had a lot to say, and I, I'm just gonna save it. Um, we we keep. No, I'm not gonna save it. <laughs> just go quickly. Um, America has a lot of things we need to work on here before we go overseas. Flint still doesn't have clean water. Uh, New Orleans, Katrina has still not been cleaned up. I can keep going. The Middle Passage, Evanston has been the only community to create reparations. So America has some work to do here. Evanston, we have work to do here. And yes, a ceasefire is right, but we have to do work here before we tell somebody else how to clean up. So I, I struggle with that and I hear, and I, um, I have a lot of compassion. Um, I, stopped watching TV, I stopped watching the news in 1994 when I was pregnant with my son because a white woman said a black man stole her car with her children and drowned them. And there was a massive crusade for black men when we found out she had murdered her own children. I, so I don't watch the news because it brings me to tears because I can't explain to my children why I brought them into a world where just by the color of their skin they are scrutinized and that they are still under attack in America. So I get it. I get it. I totally get it. Um, I'll stop there. Second, fifth, and eighth ward, um, we're joining forces in our ward meeting, which will be m March 28th at Robert Crown at 630. Hope to see second, fifth, and eighth ward there. Council Reducema. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, fourth ward residents and others are invited to the April ward meeting, which will be Tuesday, April 2nd at 7 p.m. This is fourth in a series of meetings at which we are taking one of our city council goals and exploring that in depth. Uh, the April meeting will be uh, focused on public safety. Uh, we'll have uh, Commander Sophia from Evanston Police Department and Audrey Thompson uh, from our Parks and Rec Department to talk about uh, our new uh, CARE program. Uh, office hours are going to be Saturday, April 13th, 10 to 12 uh, a.m., uh, or 10 a.m. to noon, I should say. Uh, we are going to meet at Tapestry Station. Uh, the former Vogue or the development on the former Vogue property, um, which uh, we will be uh, doing a ribbon cutting for that, I think, uh, the, the day before. Um, and then just a highlight of an Earth Day event in the Fourth Ward uh, or a preview on Sunday, April 21st. We are going to do a community event at Fitzsimmons Park. And with the collaboration of the Parks Department, the neighbors are getting together to replace the benches in that department. And thank you to Evanston Lumber for donating the supplies. Councilmember Burns. Um, so I mentioned that, uh, you know, I will use this uh, time during Call of the Wards to talk about... Um, to give up an update on Wesley, it's, it's the apartments on Wesley, especially when um, remarks are made that I feel put the residents at uh, greater risk. Um, those statements were made by, uh, I, I believe, our, the chair of our Equity and Empowerment Commission. And uh, I, I've said a few times that um, because I'm a gentleman, I, I, I don't say names um, because I understand that people's family watch you know, uh, some folks may watch this program, our council meetings, um, that people um, read the newspapers and they don't want to see a loved one of theirs called out. And so I never use names. But what I will say is the chair of our Equity Empowerment Commission made statements that are false. Um, she's lying. Right? She's not telling the truth. She said on the opposite end of a table with me the second time we met with the residents on Wesley to discuss what the city was prepared to do. And so she knows that in our first meeting with them, we committed to helping without even being asked to do so. So at the meeting where they were made aware of the condition of these buildings, we had already, staff, myself, et cetera, had discussed, had, had made a decision to put forth 
commitments to the residents. And the only thing that has changed between meetings are two things, primarily. We committed to a year of rental subsidy with an extension to two years on a case-by-case -case situation. And the residents at our last meeting said that they wanted us to consider three years. So for the Chair of Equity Empowerment Commission to say that the city has treated the residents unfairly, that we're not doing anything is a lie. Because without them asking, we had already committed to two years. It's a lie. It is a lie. Can we front page that? She's lying. The only other thing that changed is we said six months of storage. And that had, and now is, and which was more of an oversight. We didn't even push back on that. They said, well, if you're going to provide the subsidy longer, why are we not providing the stores longer? You're right. And so now that's until you find an apartment. Those are the only things that have changed. So I understand that the, that the media is there to report facts, but I believe that you're also there, yeah, to report facts. So dig into this stuff a little bit. And I'm not saying take sides, but if someone is not presenting the facts, right, which should be the news, the facts should be the news, then you can say that. She's lying. <laughs> I want to say that 10 times a row. It's a lie. It's a bold-faced lie. And she knows it because she sat right across the table from me and where I explain this in detail. I was accused in the meeting of being long-winded. I'll take that. The reason why I'm long-winded is because I like to go from A to Z. I want you to know what I know. And that takes time because I'm very careful in trying to make sure that I understand every uh, uh, kind of aspect of a situation. And so, yeah, take some time to get all that information out. That's why I'm long-winded. I want you to have the information I have. She's lying. So we await to see uh, a letter that the equity empowerment is, is, is going to present to us. And, uh, and, and we will very carefully respond to that letter. But in advance of them pre pre presenting this letter, I want to make it clear, she's lying. That's all. Council Member Ravel. Um, two things. Um, um, April 2nd, uh, here in the council chambers is going to be a joint 6th and 7th ward meeting to talk about uh, Envision Evanston uh, 2045. And we're also going to have a presentation about uh, sustainable landscaping as a way to minimize the amount of leaf blower action that needs to happen on your property. Um, so I encourage um, 6th and 7th ward residents, anybody who's interested to come to that meeting. Um, and then I'd like to just take uh, a moment to acknowledge the recent passing of a predecessor of mine as a seventh ward alderman and, and actually a dear friend, Jake Blevins, who was um, seventh ward alderman uh, in between 1981 and 1989. And he, um, you know, he did a great job as uh, alderman and um, be sorely missed. Council Member Reed. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Harris, uh, well, first, as uh, I, I always want to add my condolences to anyone who has served our city in any capacity, but um, certainly uh, someone who uh, served as a council member. Um, so I'll add that to, to their family. Um, I, I just quickly want to, um, my colleague in the second ward already announced that we we're going to have a joint fifth, eighth, and second ward meeting. Um, on the 28th at the Robert Crown Center in room D. Uh, so looking forward to that. And we're going to have a um, uh, couple of interesting things on the agenda, particularly the Evanston 2045 um, item. Um, I, I just also, I, to the folks who you know uh, continue to come to council asking for a ceasefire, I, it, it, I think, I don't know. I feel like something. I think we need to create some kind of process for an outlet for that. Um, but I, I will. I, I do want to note. You know, there's the there's the genocide in Darfur uh, in Sudan. There's the Rohingya genocide. There is the uh, Yazidi genocide by ISIS in Iraq. There's the Syrian civil war. There's the conflict in Ethiopia. Um, there's the Uyghurs in China, there's, and the Uyghurs isn't, hasn't been officially recognized as genocide by the uh, UN or international bodies, but 
there's uh, conflict in uh, Pakistan and Southern Cameroon and um, and the indigenous people in Brazil and there's the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's a whole host of terrible things that are happening all across the world and not even to mention the terrible things that are happening in our country. And, you know, and, and some of those, many of those, our country played a role in uh, the destab either funding uh, weapons to those uh, uh, to, to some bad parties or uh, the destabilization in, in those countries. Look at Venezuela and the migration that we're having here. America played a role in the destabilization there. And from my knowledge, I didn't go all the way back to 2003 with Darfur, but I don't think, and maybe Council Member Wynne, if she was here, could answer this, but I don't think the Evanston City Council has passed a resolution on any of those items. Um, and, you know, there may not have been, I, I'm not sure what is, I don't want to question anybody's motives. I'm not sure what is causing um, the particular um, focus on, on this issue um, in Gaza. It's, it's horrifying to me. And so I, I'm not blaming anyone for focusing on it. But the level of, I just, <laughs> I sometimes wish that, you know, a, a lot of these folks contribute a lot to our community, but I really wish that if we had this kind of organization and sustained effort around affordable housing, around, you know, a lot of things that we all care about, um, that we could see some transformation here in Evanston. Um, but I, but to, to close up with this, I, I do think there is something to 1,300 hopefully residents, it could be really anybody signing, but 1,300 residents signing a petition asking for this body to do something um, to represent the values of our community. Maybe there needs to be a process. I, I remember when Barack Obama was in the White House, there was a, a, he, his office, his administration created um, a process where originally if 20,000 people signed a petition, again, that's nationwide, that um, the White House would create an official response. I think they eventually raised the threshold because um, there were some funny things that uh, uh, got attention there. But I, I think similarly, there may be a process that we need, maybe it's the Evanston Voter Initiative, I don't know. There's a process that we need to create to allow residents on their own to create something. Um, and whether it's put before this body or it's just put directly to the residents, through an online vote, I don't know. Uh, we, we need to create an outlet for that energy that doesn't disrupt our meetings as much. Um, so I'll just leave, Adam, not, I don't have a special order of business that I'm gonna make, I don't have a particular plan now, but I, I, I do think we need to do um, just that. So I will end my comments. Thank Council you. Member Hadakades. Um April 9th, there will be an Envision um, Evanston 2045 um, ninth ward meeting um, at seven o'clock. Um, location to be announced um, that will be on the city calendar and um, more info and in the next newsletter. Seeing nothing further to come before us, the March 25th meeting of the city council stands adjourned. <laughs>